it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Ah, werewolves, also known as lycanthropes, played a role in many cultures and myths throughout history. In European folklore, werewolves were often portrayed as humans who could transform into wolves, either voluntarily or involuntarily, typically during the full moon. Way back in ancient Greece, the legend of the Lycoan, a man who was turned into a wolf by the god Zeus as punishment for his wickedness, was the inspiration for many such werewolf tales. Similarly, in Norse mythology, the berserkers were warriors who were said to take on the form of bears or wolves during battle. On into the Middle Ages, the belief in werewolves became widespread across Europe. Many people were accused of being werewolves and put on trial for it. This led to the persecution and execution of many innocent people, often based on little more than superstition and hearsay. Werewolves have also played a role in modern popular culture, with numerous books, movies, and TV shows featuring werewolf characters. In some cases, these depictions draw on the historical folklore and mythology surrounding werewolves, while in others, they offer a new interpretation of the creature. Overall, while werewolves are largely viewed as a mythological or fictional creature in contemporary society, they have played a significant role in the folklore and mythology of various cultures throughout history. Tonight, we see, in its entirety, what I consider to be an utterly new take on werewolves. I present to you, for the first time in full, Werewolves Are Assholes. Well guys, I've had a lot on my mind lately, but maybe typing all of it out will help me process everything that's happened. I recently came face to face with something that... Only until very recently, I thought to be entirely superstitious fiction. And when your perception of what is and isn't reality gets suddenly flipped so violently, it can really mess your proverbial shit up pretty bad. Now, I'm no author, but hopefully I can put all this together in a coherent enough fashion to be legible. So, here goes. So, everything was set into motion last Monday when my friends Dex and Trey invited... And by invited, I mean strongly insisted. Me to go camping way ass out in the middle of goddamn Deliveranceville nowhere. But with the stress and struggle of adult life kicking the shit out of me week after week, the simplicity of sitting on my ass next to a campfire for a few days well, sounded not so awful. And it might have been mentioned that Jasmine, a girl I'd been swooning over for almost a whole year now, would be coming along as she was tight with Dex's girlfriend Leslie. Trey's girlfriend, who I hadn't met yet, and whose name still escapes me, and one of her friends would also be tagging along. The entirety of the group pulled up outside my apartment early that morning. This stuck in my memory so well because I remember being mildly embarrassed for Jasmine to see me stumble clumsily down the stairs to the ground floor, my clothes and camping equipment scattering as I landed an almost picture-perfect scorpion Ship whipping my face into the patch of grass, luckily positioned just in front of the steps. Oh, shit, I mumbled under my breath as I clambered around, collecting my dispersed belongings back together as I heard my friends howl like baboons from the parked SUV. Holy hell, what a slam. Are you all right? Here, let me help. A voice called from their direction as, to my absolute horror and delight, I see no other than Jasmine coming to my aid. I, <clears throat> I stammered, trying to blow and remove the rogue strands of hair from my face. Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks. <laughs> my pride broke my fall. <laughs> I remember feeling pretty accomplished in how hard she laughed at my joke. Once we gathered up all of my things and we loaded them into the SUV and set sail towards the general area we'd be setting up camp, stopping only to stock up on the necessities like lethal amounts of various liquors and other alcoholic beverages, hamburger meat, hot dogs, small components, ice, and the like. The first reg flag popped up as we were driving down the back road to get to the trail we would have to hike for a few miles to get to the campsite. So, um, who owns this property? Leslie asked. Hell if I know, said Dex. 
My cousin said he's been coming out here for years and never ran into another soul the entire time. So you've never been here before? Trey's girlfriend interjected. Well, um, no, but if Trent says it's fine, it's fine. He's never steered me wrong before, Dex replied. <laughs> Isn't Trent the one that you told if you wore a cape and jumped off the roof, you'd be able to fly like Superman? Trey laughed from the seat behind me. I was young, Dex exclaimed defensively. Weren't you like 13? I asked jokingly and smiled as I heard Jasmine giggle next to me. <laughs> He was really persuasive in his argument. You know what? Fuck you guys, he said, placing the left half of his face in his hand in embarrassment as he continued to drive with the other. All right, shitheads, end of the road. We gotta hoof it from here, Dex said as he pulled to a stop in front of the mouth of the trail. Everyone limber up, grab your junk, and let's get going. It's about four miles till ripped off my ass o'clock, and I don't want to be late. So, we collected our various stuff and headed down the trail. The almost entirely uphill, barely even an actual trail trail. By the time we made it to the clearing, I just let everything drop to the ground with a defeated fud. I sat down on my sleeping bag as everyone else began to follow my example and plopped down around various locations in the small clearing that was to be our camp. Guys, guys... Dex wheezed as he brought up the rear out of the trail. I think I might be just a little out of shape. A little, Trey said, almost in unison with me, causing us both to laugh harder than we probably should have. You literally never exercised a day in your entire life, Trey continued. Dex, probably unable to summon enough air to speak a proper insult in response, settled for flipping us both the bird slunk down face first onto the ground next to the ruins of what was once a fire pit. We then spent the next hour setting up our tents and building a fire before things got too dark. The first night was pretty uneventful though. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, but it's not uncommon to feel that way so deep out in the woods surrounded by the darkness. I spent the bulk of the night trying to work up the courage to strike up an actual conversation with Jasmine, but with little success. Some of my efforts was, it was established that we both had a mild obsession with the TV shows Monk and The Mentalist. While we spent a good deal of time discussing them, the conversation never really went much deeper than that. But she did mention she was single in passing, which definitely encouraged my efforts in proceeding. After a while, we all retired to our respective tents. The feeling of being watched followed me even into the thin walls of my waterproof nylon shelter. So I killed time fantasizing about Jasmine sneaking into my tent to <coughs> continue the conversation, though with little hope of it coming true. The alcohol consumed the night before, and the late turn-in combined with the exhaustion from the hike ensured that we all managed to wake with just enough time to collect ample firewood to get us through the night. It was while gathering the wood that I noticed a large animal footprint in the bare dirt, just outside of the clearing of our camp. I mean, it was absolutely massive. I immediately called Dex and Trey over to investigate. Is it a bear? I asked, with a noticeable tremble in my voice. No, Dex answered. There aren't any wild bears down here. Looks like a dog. Trey bent down placing his hand over the track, the tips of his extended fingers falling just short of the edges of the would-be paw, and then looked up at Dex. <sighs> Big-ass dog, Dex added unsurely. Suddenly, a limb landed sharply on the ground behind us, causing us all to flinch at once. Oh, Joanna, shit! Oh, I just remembered Trey's girlfriend's name was Joanna. Oh, make some goddamn noise, Christ, Trey said angrily. Um, sorry, I guess. What's got you so jumpy? What were you all looking at? She asked. So we explained the print we found and then finished gathering firewood. But while staying within each other's sight, for safety's sake. Once the sun started to duck behind the trees, we made our way back to the camp where Jasmine and Leslie had begun to cook dinner on the fire. 
The smell of cooking food was a welcome scent to my nose at first, until thoughts of it attracting whatever made the print back towards our camp. Needless to say, this thought sent my mind straight into high alert, and had me constantly checking over my shoulder as we stacked the gathered limbs into the pile next to the fire. As we ate, I told Jasmine and Leslie what we'd found, after Jasmine asked what had me acting so nervous all of a sudden. Do you think it'll come into the camp? She asked in alarm. Oh, I'm sure the fire would scare it off if it gets too close. I answered, only half convinced of what I was saying was the truth. And even if it does, we can just feed it Dex as a distraction. Trey added to the conversation. He's so high in cholesterol, he'll probably feel too sick to come after the rest of us after it's done with him. He chuckled along with the rest of us as Dex shot us his signature spiteful look and middle finger and then joined in the laughter. But the fun was cut short as the deep, unmistakable snap of a large limb broke through our combined laughter, the culprit remaining just out of sight. Our eyes widened as we all looked from person to person to see if one of us was absent to account for the commotion. But as my eyes passed from Dex to Trey to Leslie to Jasmine to Joanna, I could see the same look of realization that none of us were responsible for the sound wash across their faces. Hello? Trey called out into the darkness. We all sat there in silence, hoping for a voice to reply from the edge of the fire's dim light. Trey began to get to his feet, and repeated himself by calling out again, a little louder. Help! But before he could get the word out, an ear-splitting howl drowned out his voice and assaulted our ears with such force that we all had to cover them with our hands just to ease the pain. As the noise from the howl died down, the group began to back away from the source of the sound, only to be met with a guttural growl from behind us on the opposite side of the camp. In a panic, we all huddled near the center of the camp near the fire, unsure of how to react as we followed the sound of two separate creatures stalking around the perimeter of the clearing, snapping limbs and rustling dead leaves as they moved through the brush. What the actual fuck? Dex exclaimed from my right. What are we supposed to do? Leslie cried, almost to herself from my left. I don't know, guys, I responded, mostly to myself as well, as I fumbled blindly at my feet, trying to grab the hatchet we'd been using to process the firewood. I knew it was quite sharp, but didn't know if it'd be much help against whatever was lurking at the edge of the dark woods. The growls continued, getting noticeably closer minute after agonizing minute. A horrific scream crackled from Trey's direction. I wheeled around and mirrored his scream with my own as the rest of the group followed suit, as we all watched two massive beasts step from the shadows into the soft orange glow. The overwhelming terror made it difficult to fully process what I was looking at. I knew, in the back of my mind, exactly what it was in front of me, but the word evaded my consciousness, as if my brain was unwilling to admit what it was witnessing was actually real. They stood on two legs, well over seven feet tall, though one was slightly larger, covered in thick and coarse black fur. Their legs were long and crooked, bent like the hind legs of a canine. Their bodies were wide and muscular, but still retained an almost slender form and their long arms were tipped in curved claws that looked more at home on a large bird of prey than on any kind of land mammal. But their faces were truly nightmarish. They were elongated, and their lips drew back to display rows of pearly white, jagged teeth and fangs. As they stepped closer, the reflective glow left their eyes to reveal the bright yellow of their irises, which seemed to emanate their own light as they turned into the back of my mind forever. Freaking werewolves! The words fell from my lips before I'd even had the presence of mind to realize it was me who was speaking. I found myself literally paralyzed with fear, 
unable to join the group who had begun to huddle together behind me for what was sure to be our last moments that we would share together. My knees began to tremble and quake as I felt a warm sensation on my leg, barely registering that I'd just piss myself in terror. One of them, the larger of the two, leaned forward towards me, and I dropped to the ground as its face lowered to meet mine. I closed my eyes tight in anticipation of whatever torturous end was undoubtedly about to befall me. But as I waited, nothing. I began to hear a strange, rasping sound in front of me, and as I peeked from one squinted eyelid, I saw that they were both now on the ground making strange coughing noises and convulsing. The full realization of what I was watching didn't hit me until the smaller of the two pointed at my now urine-soaked jeans and beat its fist against the ground as it continued to make the weird coughing sounds along with the larger one. As they did this, the larger one extended a hooked talon and began to scratch into the dried soil. P. U. N. K. E. D. Punked, I whispered to myself as I read the word out. They're... they're just fucking with us. I made an attempt to announce to the quivering group behind me as I watched the two monsters roll with what was apparently side-splitting laughter in absolute disbelief. What? Trey squeaked from behind me. They're pranking us, I think, I answered. I think this was all just them playing a prank, I continued, turning my head to address everyone directly. As I said this, they all drew back at once, and I whipped my head back towards the beasts to see that the larger one had risen back to its, or his, I could now make out that rather clearly, feet, and doubled over with one hand on his knee for support as he waved a clawed hand in a gesture as if to say, Calm down, calm down, and then pointed to me and nodded his head, which I assumed was in confirmation of what I had just said. Then, as if in exhaustion from laughing, plopped almost comically onto his rear. Are you freaking serious? I roared, storming towards the hulking creature and flailing wildly as I struck him feverishly on his shoulder and chest. Despite all my fury and rage, it seemed to be to no avail as he raised one of his satellite dish-sized hands to me and brushed me away like an angry kitten. He stood and wiped a tear of laughter away from his eye with the knuckle of his other hand. By the time what I determined to be the female one had joined him, standing by his side in the same looming but unthreatening way. What? It was just a prank? Dex spoke up from the back of the group. The smaller one nodded, a barely identifiable grin sneaking across her fur-covered face as she did. Holy shit, that's awesome, Dex squealed, running past the rest of us with a newfound mix of bravery and enthusiasm. That was the best prank scare literally in the history of scare pranks. You guys are great. How the hell do you get these to look so good? This is like big budget Hollywood. Oh, shit, oh my god, it's real. He trailed off as he pulled back the female's jowl, which she had been patiently allowing him to tug and pull at her hands and face in childish curiosity, coming to the realization I had already reached that they were the genuine article. Oh, um, oh shit, oh, sorry, Dex apologized as he hastily retreated back to the comfort of the group. My bad, he added, peeking out from behind the cover of my shoulder. They're real frickin' werewolves, he whispered loudly into my ear, though I can't imagine the words failed to reach either of the creature's ears. Slowly, the group got comfortable enough to begin inching slowly towards the beasts, but not without an ample amount of caution and care. 
By the time I'd grabbed a spare set of pants and underwear out of my tent, rinsed and toweled off, and changed clothes, everyone was gathered around the monsters like small children investigating a new dog, all caution and fear long gone, and replaced with almost giddy excitement. I, however, kept my distance, not so much out of fear or caution, though it played its part, but because I'd always been the one who got cranky whenever I was pranked or scared. But, as time passed, intrigue won out, in no small part, to my noticing that Jasmine was absolutely enamoured by them, and so I decided I had to take this opportunity to see a real mythical creature up close and in the flesh, and share a once-in-a-lifetime moment with my crush. They both obviously demonstrated human intelligence, but it seemed they were incapable of speaking in their present form. They would simply nod and gesture in response to our questions. After some time, they both made their way to the edge of the woods and waved goodbye as they disappeared into the dark once more. We all sat back down around the fire in silence once more, before any of us could think of something to say. Holy hell, Trey said with a laugh. I know, right? Joanna replied. And so we sat by the fire, fervently discussing the incredible experience we'd all just had. In some ways, to almost make sure we had all seen the same thing, and that it wasn't something that one of us had just hallucinated. As we sat there laughing and regaling, we heard footsteps coming towards the camp from the woods. But these steps were much lighter, and undoubtedly human. We all turned towards the direction of the sound, as two men emerged wearing filthy clothes. Apparently equally as filthy were they, as the stench of the body odour reached from them across the entire clearing. I noticed Jasmine cover her nose in disgust. One wore a ragged old red trucker's cap, with a faint outline of white letters that had long since been worn away. What y'all doing all the way out here, hooting and hollering and carrying on like that? The one without the hat asked. Yeah, someone might hear all that and think you're all up to something, the hatted one added. Oh, um, are you the owners? If you are, we're really sorry. We just wanted to go on a little trip to relax in the woods for a few days, Trey answered. Something like that, the hatless man said as he continued to march his way into the center of our camp. You see, this here is our place of business, he continued gesturing towards the woods around us with both hands. What kind of business would that be? Dex asked stupidly, as it was apparent that whatever it was, it wasn't legal. Hmm, the kind of business you don't want people running off and telling other people where you're doing it, the hatted man said, now standing uncomfortably close to Jasmine. But before she could move away, the man snatched up a handful of her hair, drawing a pistol from behind his back and placing it against her temple. Without thinking, I started to lunge towards the man, but before I could gain any momentum, I felt a sharp pain in my side and dropped to the ground, moaning in agony as I did. Apparently, the other man had made his way up to my side and punched me in the liver, forestalling any heroics. Jasmine and Leslie both screamed in fright as I rolled back and forth on the ground, clutching my side. The hatless man, pulling out a pistol of his own, dragged me to my feet as they both rounded us up into a tight group and told us to stay put and be quiet, and that if one of us tried anything, they would kill the person next to us. We sat for some time as they talked back and forth between themselves, I was only able to make out some of what they said. Well, I know we have to kill him, but that don't mean that's the first thing we gotta do to him, the hatted one said, leaning towards the other but keeping his eyes trained on us as he did. He continued. What I'm saying is, we sure all the ones with the peckers first, cause I ain't gonna be fooling around with none of that. Then we give the ladies a little romance before we take care of them. How about it? All right, the hatless one said. As long as I get the dark-haired one. He continued, 
pointing towards Jasmine with his pistol. As I saw her eyes widen in terror, I felt rage swell up from deep down in my gut and jumped to my feet only to have the hatless man press the muzzle of his gun against my forehead. Whoa now, someone sure is in a hurry to eat a bullet, ain't ya? He quipped with a rotten, toothy smile snaking across his dirty face. Without thinking, I spat right dead in the center of his eye in defiance. Flinching back, he chuckled angrily to himself. <laughs> well, if that's how you want it to be, he growled. The putrid reek of his chewing tobacco assaulted my nostrils as he made a disgusting snort, coughing up a ball of mucus and tobacco juice in his mouth. And there, in the moment, I caught myself genuinely wishing he would just blow my brains out and spare me the torture of having him spit that revolting bile in my face. I turned my head and closed my eyes tight in anticipation, ready to accept my fate for the second time that night. But just then, a familiar loud snapping of large limbs in the underbrush entered my ears. I opened my eyes to see the bewildered look now plastered on the face of the vile man in front of me as he began to peek behind him to determine the source of the commotion. As his head turned over his shoulder, his view fell on the massive silhouette of the male werewolf that had seemed like little more than a past lucid dream at this point. But he was really there, and the man really saw him. As the hulking beast entered completely into the light, the man wheeled around to train his pistol sights on it. But before he could, the thing wrapped a massive, clawed hand around the arm that held his gun, and in one fluid motion, ripped it clean from its shoulder. I can still hear the sound. I can only describe it as the crunching squelch of someone tearing a head of lettuce violently in half. The man's arm was removed so quickly and cleanly, it never disturbed the rest of his body. He only managed to respond with a whimpering, Oh! before the creature reached forward with his other hand, closing its fingers over the man's entire head before a sharp bend of his wrist snapped the man's head backwards and upside down, causing him to be face to face with me once again for a brief second, in which I unintentionally repeated his last word with a soft, Oh, through my covered mouth, before watching him collapse into a pile on the ground. Screams began to erupt from the man wearing the hat, his entire left side now covered in spattered blood from the severed arm of his accomplice. But before he could collect himself and raise his own pistol, the second werewolf bolted out of the woods and in one vicious swing brought her claws down on him leaving four open channels of blood and gore deep into his chest, and slamming him into the ground with a sickening thud. Jasmine and Leslie both cried out in shock and terror at what they had just witnessed. Still alive, but only just. The remaining man coughed and choked on his blood as he struggled to drag his broken body away from the monster staring down at him. After observing this for a few seconds, she reached down, grabbed him by his ankle, then snatched him off the ground, swinging him face first into a tree on which his head exploded against in a pink mist of skull fragments and brain matter, before tossing his now lifeless body atop the other. Jasmine screamed again. Leslie fainted, causing Dex to have to frantically struggle to keep her from hitting her head on one of the rocks that made up the fire pit. Leaning down, the larger one sniffed the bodies inquisitively. He then raised his head to look back in the direction the two men had emerged from. In only two steps, he made his way across the camp, reached into one of our bags to retrieve a towel, which he then instructed Dex to wrap around a branch and soak in kerosene from one of the lamps. What the hell are you doing? I asked, trying to make sense of his actions. Once again, he reached a long claw down towards the ground, and in the dry dirt, inscribed two words. Meth Lab. Once I acknowledged that I'd read and understood them, he wrote another two. Probably more. Probably. Probably. You have awful spelling. 
I said in judgmental tone. To the primal beast, I'd just watch rip a full-grown man's arm off, like a leaf off a twig. Oh, I'm um, sorry, I added, seeing him squint his glowing yellow eyes at me in agitation. It was then that he picked up the detached arm, wrapped branch, can of kerosene, and a lighter out of the pocket of one of the dead man's jeans, passing them off to me. Uh, what in the shit do I do with these? I asked in confusion. He bent down grabbing the corpses by their ankles, then gestured with his head towards the direction they'd come from. Oh, wait. No, I really don't want... I was interrupted by a low growl, encouraging me to follow the directions the seven-and-a-half-foot wolf monster was giving me. As it departed down the narrow opening in the woods, about five or so feet behind the creature, it was apparent that the female would be staying with everyone else at the camp. Upon returning, I was told this time consisted mostly of the female wolf letting Jasmine scratch her ears like some kind of grim house pet, while Dex sat in an almost catatonic state, and Joanna and Trey tended to Leslie's still unconscious body. Though I was told that at one point the female got up, walked over to the tree that she'd bashed the man's head to pieces on, and ripped the entire bloodstained patch off the trunk, tossing it into the fire to burn. As the beast walked ahead of me, I struggled to keep up with its abnormally long stride, but was too nervous to bother him with asking to slow down at this point. It wasn't until I tripped while trying to make up lost distance, and almost broke my face on a fallen tree, that he stopped and looked back to check on me. As I attempted to stand, I shrieked in pain. I must have hurt my ankle when I fell, and couldn't put any weight on it. Rolling his eyes in annoyance, he dropped the bodies he'd been dragging casually beside him the whole way, and then made his way back to where I'd fallen, turning his back to me, and knelt down. I didn't understand the gesture, until he pointed towards his upper back, instructing me to climb on. Once I got myself, the loose arm, the branch, and the cairn of kerosene situated, he grabbed the lifeless legs and continued down the path. It didn't take long, for me to identify a mysterious, fleshy object that kept bouncing off my legs, which I'd wrapped around his waist from time to time as he walked. Oh, dude, I said, thoroughly grossed out by the werewolf dong knocking against my exposed skin. I heard the cough-like laugh once again as he chuckled to himself. You know you're nasty, right? I said with a sternness and frustration in my voice, reflecting my displeasure at the situation. He let out an apologetic whine that sounded comically doggish, which I will admit helped me deal with the situation a little better for the remainder of the way. As we neared the end of the trail, lights from a dilapidated old shack began to peek through the trees. Once we reached the edge, he sat me down just out of reach of the light, placing his finger over his lip in an effort to tell me to remain quiet. Leaving the corpses beside me, he then made his way up to the front door of the cabin on all fours, so silently it caused a chill to crawl down my back, and I shivered as I realized that the noise they made at the camp really was entirely theatrical, and that if they really wanted to do us any harm, we would never have known they were there before it was already far too late. I was gazing upon an unstoppable apex predator, a creature that had been the very substance of nightmares since time immemorial, with a sense of humour of a college frat boy. My attention snapped back to current events as he reached the door. He then proceeded to just as quietly climb onto the room of the small structure. Then lowering his hand, he knocked three hard raps against the wooden door, then withdrew his hand back out of sight. I heard muffled speaking from inside, that became clear and legible, as the man inside swung the door open, exclaiming, ah, Well, I hope you pricks had fun. I told you just to shoot them and get rid of the bodies, but no, you always have to fuck around. As he spoke, the werewolf on the roof seemed to shake his head in disappointment at his words. The man began to speak again, after realizing his comrades were nowhere to be found. Hey... 
Where the hell are you, sons of bitch? His words were cut short as the werewolf brought a single clawed finger down into the top of the man's head, puncturing straight through the center and exiting through the bottom of his jaw. He lingered on his feet only for a moment before collapsing into a heap on the porch. The beast then stuck his head inside to check for any remaining signs of life, and once sure it was clear, he crawled back down off the roof, waving me towards the house. As I approached, he picked the man's cadaver up by the head, and, in a rather unceremonious fashion, tossed it through the cabin's doorway. He then took the arm and can of kerosene from me, and threw them in as well before retrieving the other bodies and doing the same. He then motioned with his thumb for me to light the towel wrapped around the branch, so I did, without hesitation or question this time. Taking it from me, he tossed it into the cabin, swept me up, and ran back toward the trail. Moments later, my ears were met with a resounding explosion, and I looked back to see a large ball of fire rising just above the tree line. What if that catches the forest on fire? I asked. Sliding to a stop, he looked at me, then back towards the cabin, then back at me before continuing back down the path again. I know an oh fuck look when I see one, regardless of the species, but luckily the forest seemed to remain unaffected by the fire. As we made it back to the camp, he sat me down on one of the logs we'd used as benches around the campfire. And to my extreme delight, I was greeted with Jasmine diving into my arms, practically ecstatic that I had made it back, until I yelped when she bumped into my injured ankle. Oh my god, did you get hurt? She exclaimed in alarm. Oh, I just tripped and sprained my ankle, I think. It's not too bad. I reassured her, trying to act tougher than I really am. Do you want some ice for it? Jasmine asked with genuine care in her voice. I would like some ice, I responded, but I would love some vodka. I think we can make that happen, she obliged, walking over to the cooler. Oh, I sighed, laying long ways across the log I'd been sitting on as I propped my leg up and rested my head in my hands. Well, I know you wanted vodka, but we've got water and coke, she called from next to the ice chest. Don't tell me. The werewolves took all the... Yeah, the werewolves took all the alcohol, she finished for me. But they left a note. I sat back up on the log, only to realize I'd laid my hands down on a small chunk of hillbilly brain that had been resting on the log next to where I'd sat. I looked down to confirm that both of them were in fact nowhere to be found. Walking up next to Jasmine in the cooler... I looked down at the message scrawled in the dirt in front of me and grimaced at the words. Thank you. <laughs> what? Did the werewolf just use an emo- Yeah, the werewolf used an emoticon. Jasmine finished for me once again. The rest of the time was spent mostly in silence as we packed our things and tried to process the events of the previous night along with gathering the energy to make the exit hike back to the SUV. And as we all filed out of the trail, to the welcome side of the vehicle, bringing up the rear I glanced back down the long, winding path. Resting against the improvised crutch Dex and Trey made for me, and thinking about the events that transpired, and what they'd taught me, I thought to myself, Werewolves might not be the mindless, savage baby-killing demons all the stories throughout the years have painted them to be. Hey, they even demonstrated empathy and concern for our well-being in a time of crisis. None of us would probably be alive right now, if not for them helping us the way they did. And I can even forgive them for scaring the literal piss out of me and traumatizing us probably all for life. Hell, people do that to each other every day and, admittedly, there are much worse things they could be doing to campers as seven and a half foot tall monsters. But boy, werewolves sure are assholes. I really wanted that vodka. Hi again, guys. <laughs> it's been a while. 
couple of months since the first post, and yeah, the response was crazy. But beyond that, the stuff that happened in the days, weeks, and months after that post was even crazier. But before I get started, I'm actually a chick. Well, apparently, a lot of you figured I was a guy, because my crush, now fully-fledged girlfriend, was a girl. Apologies. I should have been more descriptive about my groin region in the last post. Anyway, here we go again. All right. So a few days after the post, I saw a news report that unnerved the absolute hell out of me. As I was making my way through the neglected mountain of dirty dishes in the kitchen, I heard Jasmine call for me to come into the living room of my apartment. I started to ask her what she was carrying on about, but as I rounded the corner and the TV came into view, I stopped in my tracks as the image of a burnt shack in the middle of the woods glared at me from the screen. Isn't that the... Jasmine started to ask, but I cut her off before she could finish. Did they say anything about the bodies? No. Actually, they said there was no sign of human remains. They're apparently looking for the... She trailed off. I could tell she was thinking back to the men from that night. I might have made it seem like we just brushed it off in the first part, but... But it was pretty traumatizing for everyone involved. We had talked about it a little, as much as she could for as long as she could hold it together, at least. I took it upon myself to start taking a class to learn to protect myself. Not like those cheesy grab here while stepping here and striking here self-defense courses, though. No, I found a combat school run by this big Australian bastard that has a more take this point in knife thingy and stab the fucker in the eye till he lets go approach and that has some real appeal to me after everything that happened i'm not much more badass than i was at the time but i'm getting used to the idea of wrecking someone's shit at least i'm still trying to convince jasmine to come to a class with me but i think the whole ordeal has had a more introverting effect on her dex has decided to get into shape too and i quote to protect you lady folk like a real man. I don't think Dex understands that the community at large has never seen him as a towering monument to masculinity, but at least he's getting healthy. He's taken up cycling. Incidentally, the most noticeable change in his appearance so far is that every other day he shows up with a new patch of road rash somewhere on his body. You don't think there's anything there that'll lead him back to us, do you? She asked worriedly. No, no. Everything got burned. Besides, we didn't do anything wrong. Why would the police be looking for us? I asked back. I don't mean the police, she responded. I mean, there might be other people who have something to do with that lab. What if they move the bodies and they, well, they come looking for us? She continued. How would they even fight? I began, before being interrupted as if by some form of divine orchestration, by a loud and assertive knock on the door. The apartment fell into a ringing silence. I began to slowly drag my feet towards the door, inch by inch. Taking at least three times longer than it should have to finally get there, I began to reach out for the knob as another series of loud raps cracked through the quiet and caused me to convulse in shock. I turned to look back at Jasmine whose hands were now clutched in front of her mouth as she watched me reach for the knob one more time with wide eyes. Taking a deep breath, I twisted the doorknob and cracked the door just enough to peek out into the hallway. Yo, Grubhub, got your tacos and quesadillas? Yep, quesadillas. Jesus Christ, it's the goddamn taco guy, I called to Jasmine realizing we both had completely forgotten about ordering food earlier. It wasn't until a few days later, as I was closing the door to my room after coming home from work, that I heard a voice from behind me. We need to talk, the voice said, causing me to nearly choke on my tongue in surprise. I wheeled around to face the source of the noise, to see a young man close to my age with deeply tanned skin, dark black hair and stubble, and a red bandana tied around his head. His clothes were normal clothes, just put together weirdly. It was hard for me to place at the time. He had this old, tattered red t-shirt underneath an even older black vest. 
His pants were baggy and frayed at the ankles, where they'd been cut short to reveal his bare feet. <laughs> a pirate. <laughs> he looked like a fucking pirate. There was a pirate in my apartment. I had, well, apartment pirates. What the, why are you in my room? I screamed as I yanked out the knife I'd started keeping on me. Whoa, take a chill pill there, Gamora. After all, you've already had my, uh... The man paused as he produced a stack of papers from his back pocket and began to flip through them. Um, my werewolf dong knocking against your exposed skin, he finished. I... what? I asked in bewilderment. Yeah, he answered. I figured, after having my dork on your leg, that... That's a few steps past me seeing the granny panties and lightsaber you got stashed into your top drawer. Oh well, plus, you kind of pissed yourself right in front of me and... Well, everyone else, so? I stood there in silence for a few seconds, my jaw hanging open in absolute confusion before shrieking, You went through my stuff? It's weird the places your mind can go during situations like that. Well, yeah. You don't go through people's stuff when you break into their bedrooms? He chuckled. I don't break into people's rooms, I shouted back at him. Wait, the werewolves, you're one of the werewolves, I said as all the gears in my brain finally lined back up, allowing me to think like an actual rational person. <laughs> finally caught on, did you? He said. Ah, took long enough. And here I came all this way, and not even a hello. How you been? Thanks for saving me and all my friends from being booby-tripped and murdered in the middle of well, nowhere. Why are you here? I interrupted at the top of my lungs. Why are you dressed like a pirate? I added, the gold hoop in his ear accentuating his swashbuckling appearance and only adding to my frustration. First of all, and that's very offensive... We prefer the term privateer Americans. And second, I'm here about this, he said, waving around the stack of papers he'd produced a few moments ago. Your little story got pretty popular. The people that ran that drug operation are going to be looking for whoever fucked up all their shit. And this is going to lead them right back to you as soon as they find it. And you can bet your ass the ones that run the show are a lot worse than the creeps you ran into out there. How? I didn't even use my name in the entire post, I asked, the anger and energy starting to ebb a little with his last statement. <sighs> you used all of your friend's real names. Do you have any idea how easy it is to find out where someone is with just first names and social media? He scolded. It took me like three hours after I found the post to find out who you were, and another day to find out exactly where you live. <laughs> Look! He continued, pulling out his phone and swiping a few times before showing me the screen. You even accepted my friend request, jackass. I just stood there, stunned for a few seconds. A dramatically different feeling from only a few moments before. My shock, anger, and mild embarrassment had been swapped for a deep sinking in the pit of my gut. I might have just led some very bad people back to me and all my friends. And Jasmine. Taking a few more seconds to process everything, I finally began to speak. I liked you better when you couldn't talk, I mumbled, staring at the ground in shame. And I liked you better when you were more grateful for me saving your ass, he replied. After a few seconds of shooting each other foul looks, I broke the quiet with, So, where's the other one of you? She's uh, taking care of a few things and then she'll be headed this way. He replied with a shit-eating grin. Until then, we just chill here, he said as he started to open the door and walk into the living room. Oh, no, you are not camping out in the living room, I exclaimed, jumping between him and the open door. I am not explaining you to Stephen, my roommate. Okay, your room it is, he said, walking across the room and plopping down on my bed kicking his feet up as he did. Your feet are freaking filthy, I growled, noticing the blackened bottoms of his feet resting on my clean blanket. Huh? What? He mumbled to himself, 
grabbing his ankle and pulling it up to check. Oh, shit, you're right, he said as he wiped his nasty man paws on the blanket. There, how's that, he asked, proudly displaying his now slightly less dirty feet to me. I could tell he genuinely thought he'd just done something good by cleaning his feet on my blanket. He thought I was mad they were dirty, so he cleaned them to make me happy. I had more of an urge to scratch his ear than yell at him at that point. I looked at the sullied comforter and felt my eye twitch a little, and then just decided to sit down in my office chair. <sighs> exactly how long are we supposed to be waiting? I groaned several hours later, through the hands I'd been resting my face in for the past 90 minutes or so. <sighs> Not much longer, he said, checking a wristwatch that very obviously wasn't there. Well, thanks for yeah, helping out again, <laughs> junk, I said, with my chin still resting in my hands. Oh, don't get too excited. You got lucky last time. This one's going to cost you, he said, laying his head back on the pillow. That's cryptic, I replied suspiciously. So, what's your name? I added. Milo, he answered plainly. Oh, hmm. I huffed to myself, mildly disappointed that it wasn't some cliché underworld werewolf name like Lucian or Rahas or something. About ten more minutes passed before I heard Milo's phone chirp. He slid it out of his pocket and checked the screen. That's her, he said, clumsily climbing out of my bed. They're at the front door, he added. No, you stay, I'll go let her in, I said, hurriedly standing from my chair. Unfortunately, that didn't go down well at all. Several hours of sitting with my elbows on my legs had given me major toilet leg, and as I stood, both of my now completely numb legs tried to fold backwards in on themselves. This caused my whole body to crumble face first into the hardwood floor of my room with a dull thud. I heard a loud cackle as Milo pressed his face into my pillow, kicking his feet with manic laughter. Oh, God, I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. Are you okay? he asked, still chuckling as tears rolled down his cheeks. I shot him a hateful look as I wobbled to my feet. I somehow managed to baby dear walk across the apartment to the front door as the living hell of pins and needles began to set in. I cracked the door, just to make sure who was actually supposed to be there was. As she came into view, I caught myself looking at what could have been the most gorgeous creature to ever walk the face of the earth. I slowly swung the door the rest of the way open, revealing her and all her splendor. She had the thickest curly black hair that spun its way down past her shoulders and over her dark olive skin. Her eyes were a light blue and seemed to go on forever just like a clear sky on a sunny day at the peach. She was draped in clothes the same color and fashion as Milo, but infinitely more lavish and beautiful. She was about as inconspicuous as a Christmas Day parade. Hello, my name is Tegan. It's so nice to see you again. My love, are you not well? She spoke with the heaviest Eastern European accent I'd ever heard, and even that was beautiful to my ears. She must have taken my moment of total unresponsive silence, coupled with my erratically trembling legs, as some form of illness. Don't think I'd ever blush so hard in my life. Suddenly, Jasmine stepped between us with a scowl. She's fine, she said sharply. Come on, stud. Back so we can all get in. What? Who's we? Who's all here? I stuttered, trying to peek around the corner to no avail. Everyone, she answered. Dex, Trey, Joanna, and Leslie. Yeah, Tegan rounded us all up and brought us here. She told us who she was and that she'd explain everything once we got to your place. Not even attempting to resist at this point, I just put my finger over my mouth, gesturing for them to be quiet so they didn't disturb my roommate, then silently led the small crowd into my increasingly packed room. Coming in last, I managed to shove and elbow my way back to my chair and sit down as Milo began to explain the entirety and severity of the situation. So, uh, this wasn't just a social visit because you missed us so much, Trey said sarcastically 
breaking the silence that fell once Milo's exposition was over. Tegan quickly strolled over to him. Oh no, my love, we missed you so very much as well. You are all such wonderful people, she exclaimed, hugging him tightly when she reached him. Apparently she didn't catch the sarcasm as she was attempting to comfort him. We all knew she was just being nice. But I think we also chose to believe it on the grounds of the idea that the corporeal angel we were currently confined in my room with missed us and wanted to warm our hearts. This woman oozed mama bear energy like you can't even imagine. So we have a bunch of meth dealers about to go water white on our asses. And we're supposed to do what exactly? Call the police? Dex asked over Tegan's soothing hums as she rocked poor Trey in her arms and continued to hug him comfortingly. Oh, it's not really that simple, Milo answered back. They're not just meth dealers. They might kind of, sort of be uh, vampires. Vampires? Bullshit. No, you're just screwing with us again. Get out. I yelled, jumping up from my chair. I had had enough. I was tired and hungry and ill-tempered, and everyone was in my room and I was over it. All I could think of was the nerve it took for them to pull some shit like this after everything we'd already been through. Okay, calmed. Milo started before I picked up the nearest heavy object and got ready to chuck it at his head. Hey, hey, I was a seven-foot-tall murder puppet the first time you saw me. Would it really be going out on a limb to entertain the idea that vampires might just possibly be a thing? He added, his hands out in front of him, ready to repel my impending attack. Hearing him call himself a seven-foot murder papa made me crack a begrudging smile. Still holding the empty mug over my head, this gave me a second to actually remember that I had been considering the possibility of what other creatures like that might exist ever since that night. Well, I mean... I guess, maybe, I said, placing the mug back down on my desk. Well, so, how do uh, vampires tie into all this shit? I continued, choking slightly on the word as it made its way up. Okay, you know how we add things to our food to make it taste better? Like butter, salt and pepper. Well, they do that too. One of the ways they like to do that, one of their favorite ways is meth. They get some poor schmucks spun out on the stuff, and then, right after their last hit, as they're on their last breath of life, they suck them dry, like a meth head cocktail. The drug apparently affects the taste of the blood in just such a way that it, combined with the effects of the actual drug itself, is like a total delicacy for them. It's kind of like how people do veal, just slightly fucked up maybe, and selling the meth means they make hella cash while they take the snack packs to Flavortown. That's really messed up, Leslie spoke up. But what are we supposed to do? Can't you guys just, you know, turn back into wolves and get rid of them? (laughs) It is not so simple, my sweet darling, Tegan answered. Turning to a wolf is not so easy as in movies and takes time and preparation. What do you mean? Trey asked, having finally escaped Tegan's clutches. You know how in the movies you see some dude morph into a giant wolf that's like twice as massive as he was as a regular person? Well, did you ever stop to think where all that extra mass comes from? Milo answered. To get that big, we have to eat that much and more beforehand. That shit doesn't just come from nowhere. We have to collect it, eat it, store it, and then change. He continued to explain. So, me and Tegan need a place to, well, store. And before that, we have to figure out where we're operating so we can plan and get ready. Also, we're going to need a lot of food. We're going to get rid of them for you, but but we're also going to need your help this go-around. Tegan added, You also need somewhere to stay, not home. Regular homes aren't safe. They'll find you there, and us, if we stay too. All of a sudden, every eye was on me. In confusion, I looked over my shoulders, hoping there was someone with an actual idea standing behind me. There wasn't. So, 
I said the only thing I could think of. Oof. I could go call Gay Jake. About an hour later, we all had small travel bags packed with clothes, phone chargers, toothbrushes, and were on our way to Gay Jake's. Gay Jake lived on the outside of town in his own house, and thanks to his parents, had more money than God. It also happened that his best friend Lita was staying there while she was in town. This was super lucky because she liked hunts or used to hunt poachers or something. Anyway, she's supposed to have killed more men than malaria, and while Milo and Tegan are getting their shit together, I think we'd all be pretty safe around her should something go down at their house. Milo and Tegan ended up riding with me and Jasmine in the back seat. About halfway there, Tegan asked, So, you think you can trust this gay Jake with our secrets and keeping them safe? Jasmine answered, Oh yeah, totally. Gay Jake is keeping secrets about half of the people in the state from, well, the other half of them. He's one of the nicest people in the world, too. I don't think he's ever not helped someone when they needed it. But he does have a really fruity southern accent, so please don't make fun of him. Are you serious? Milo screeched from the back seat. He's rich, super nice, has dirt on everyone, has a super fruity southern accent, and his name is Gay Jake. He sounds like the coolest guy ever. I have yet to meet him. <laughs> I need to meet him. Jasmine and I both laughed at the idea that the actual mythical creature in the back of the car was so excited to meet Gay Jake. After that, it took about ten minutes to get to the house, going slow to keep from drawing attention or anything. We pulled in at close to eleven o'clock, only to see Gay Jake's body lying in the middle of the driveway. Holy shit, is he okay? Milo yelled from the back as Tegan gasped in shock. He's fine, I said. That's just how he waits for company sometimes. Hey, move, shithead, I yelled out of the window, laying on the car horn as I did. His arm popped up off the ground, middle finger proudly extended, a large grin cracking across his face. As he hoisted himself off the ground, I yelled again. I'll run your gay ass over. Well... Now isn't that the carpet muncher calling the kettle black? He said, walking over to the open window. Y'all all right? You get here okay? He asked, sticking his head through the window to check on everyone. Yeah, everyone else ought to be pulling up in a second. Oh, we really owe you for this one, Jake, I answered. Oh, honey, y'all don't owe me a damn thing. Now go on up there and get parked and head inside. I'll make sure everyone else gets in all right. He exclaimed. Oh, and help yourselves to anything in the kitchen. You all know where everything is. It hadn't changed none. <laughs> I love you. Milo whispered in my ear as we drove up the driveway to park. We all filed into the house, which was immaculate and well decorated as always. Although through no doing of Gay Jake himself. Just because I like men don't mean I know what lamb goes with those curtains. He would say when asked if he did the decorating himself. We spread out as we entered through the back door and all found a place to sit. All except for Milo, who made a beeline for the kitchen. So, uh, how do you all... How should I say, does one end up a werewolf? Jasmine asked to break the silence. Well, if it's okay to ask, she added. Tegan got up out of her seat and sat down next to Jasmine wrapping her arm around her shoulders and pulling her in closer. Oh, darling, you may ask me any questions you like. To be werewolf, you have to exchange the fluids with an already werewolf, she explained. Oh, so a bite? They do have to bite you, Jasmine asked. <clears throat> Milo exaggerated from the entrance to the kitchen to get our attention. He shook his head and then held up both hands making a circle with his thumb and index finger with one, and extended the index finger of the other before moving his extended index finger in and out of the circle a few times. Once he was satisfied with our disgust, he retreated once again into the kitchen. Oh, oh my, Jasmine said, turning back towards Tegan, who had an affirmingly blushed expression on her face. So, did you uh, know each other? She added. Yes. I met Milo when he came to my home of Romania on vacation. He had much more money back then. A gift from his grandfather when he died, I think. 
I made him werewolf then, and we came back here together, Tegan explained. That sounds like a beautiful story. Jasmine gushed. Oh darling, it is. I must tell you all of it sometime, Tegan said as Joanna, Trey, Leslie, and Dex walked in from the back door, shortly followed by Gay Jake. What happened to tall, dark, and manson you walked in here with? Gay Jake asked as he made his way in, looking around at everyone. He's in the kitchen, I answered. All right, I'm going to go get him in here. Then you're going to tell me all about whatever this shit is you all got yourselves into. Gay Jake said before heading into the kitchen. I just began to ask if they'd noticed anything unusual on their way over. But before I could get the words out, I heard a racket in the kitchen. Milo came whipping around the corner with his arms up over his head for cover. Gay Jake close behind, yelling and swatting at him with a paper plate. Go on now, shoo, get, scat. I was saving that for later, Jake screamed, continuing his paper plate barrage. He just ate damn near everything in my refrigerator. Still sniffed out the damn cheeseburger in the microwave. I just got out before y'all got here and hadn't got to eat yet. He complained with visible duress. Milo ran across the room in an attempt to seek shelter from Jake's fury. As he did, I noticed that, unlike before, his once fairly average body now had a pretty noticeable gut that jiggled as he ran. He really can put it away, I thought to myself. Uh, we'll go get you another cheeseburger, I reassured him in an attempt to rescue Milo, the werewolf. Once I got everything calmed down, and everyone got situated in the living room, I began to explain the entirety of the situation to him. Jake, never being the judgmental type, took the insanity of the story in stride, though he did have some well-founded disbelief. <laughs> Bullshit. I'm not going to sit here and have someone tell me that these two are some damn werewolves, he said, pointing in the direction of Milo and Tegan. And you all want me to believe that you're all in trouble with <laughs> drug-dealing vampires because Hamburglar over there burned down their meth lab? What the hell are you kids on? I know it sounds like the weirdest, craziest shit on earth, but it's true, Dre spoke up. Maybe if one of them could, like, turn into a wolf, um, would that convince you? He added. Oh, yeah. You get one of them to turn into a wolf in front of me, and I'll believe it, Jake answered. But didn't you hear them? Leslie interjected. They said they have to prepare, and it takes time. They can't just... <laughs> Yeah, I got this, Milo said, hopping up from his seat and rolling up his sleeve to the shoulder. He held out his arm and started to strain and grunt as the muscles in his arm began to tighten. Slowly, they began to grow as skin darkened. Before long, thick black hairs began to sprout and then suddenly, snap. His arm began to stretch, along with his fingers. Shit, he shouted on the first loud snap. He then clenched his jaw and grimaced as his right arm became unrecognizable to what it was moments ago. Oh, come on, you fuckers. Almost there, he said to himself through gritted teeth as he flexed and shook the tips of his elongated fingers as the nightmarish claws began to protrude and pop away the fingernails they were growing out from under. As this went on, I was the only one who noticed that this newly obtained belly was beginning to recede back to its normal size. Oh, my God, are you okay? That looks like it hurt like a bitch, Jake shouted as he ran to Milo's aid, whose face was now bright red and covered in sweat. His right arm now looked exactly as it had the night we'd met, and I mean exactly. It was way out of proportion to his body, the tips of his claws just short of touching the floor. Once Jake had had a chance to take everything in, we began to get on the same page. He'd always been one to stay calm and take things pretty well, but I don't think anyone expected him to just accept that a man grew a werewolf arm right in front of him. When I asked him how he managed to stay so cool in the situation, he replied with a sassy, Oh, sweetheart, if I look this good and I'm still single, then anything is possible. After that, we sat and talked for hours in an attempt to formulate a plan. But, like most people our age... He only managed to agree to put it off until later and focus on getting more food. 
It became apparent that we weren't going to get anywhere after Jake spoke out mid-conversation. All right, look, you're going to have to do something with that, he exclaimed, pointing at Milo's grossly oversized wolf appendage. <laughs> but you seemed so accepting of it earlier, Dex chimed in sarcastically. I was and I am, Jake argued back. But it still freaks me right the fuck out. I keep thinking it's going to try and crawl towards me or something. Look, just put this blanket over it. That morning I went to the grocery store, accompanied by Dex and Lita, who had been asleep upstairs the night before. They were also in the company of Jake's No Limit credit card and Leslie's van, so we could haul as much food as possible, not only to feed the troop of people currently camped out in the house, but to bulk up our two lycanthropic allies. It also turns out to everyone's surprise that Lita required absolutely no convincing that Milo and Tegan were werewolves, and that we're on a spun-out gang of vampires' shit list. As it would happen, Lita already knew about all that shit. According to her, she was a licensed member of the American United Association of Certified Vampire Control Technicians, or Uakuavikit for short. She'd become a member after meeting some guy during one of her usual anti-poaching assignments that suggested she had the right stuff and showed her how to apply. Apparently, it's a lot less hush-hush and ceremonious than you'd think. So that means she's not necessarily a full-time vampire hunter, but she is licensed by the government or something. I remember hearing a story about her one time. During one of her assignments, with a tiger preservation organization, she saw a poacher about to kill a wild tiger, and since he hadn't noticed her yet, she just shot him in the ass with her rifle and let the tiger maul him to death in the wild of the jungle. This chick is the matron saint of fucks ungiven. The fact that she ended up being an actual vampire hunter seriously made me wonder if we were all extremely lucky or extremely unlucky. She was a very fortunate billion-to-one-shot protection to a very unfortunate billion-to-one-shot problem. A fortune teller would lose their shit if they tried to read my palm at that point. As we pulled into the Walmart parking lot, I wondered to myself if this wasn't possibly too much. After all, we still didn't have any indication that the people who ran the operation out of that shed were even after us, and definitely nothing to suggest they were vampires. But my suspicions wouldn't last long past that. After we'd finished our shopping, and were headed back out to the van with two overloaded buggies apiece, the call of nature struck. Okay guys, I'm going to run back real quick. Just take a second, I said as I loaded my last bag into the vehicle. <laughs> a second my ass, Dex complained. You've got the biggest bladder of anyone on earth. You're going to be in there forever. Where do you even put it all? When I walked through the doors, I saw that the greeter had switched from the one who was there when we first arrived. Where the first greeter was an old man, this new one seemed to be a middle-aged woman whose hair and makeup could only be described as, I'd like to speak to your manager. It only got worse as she greeted me in the most energetic, peppy voice possible. A morning person. Oof. I'd rather have run right down the mouth of one of those bipedal meth mosquitoes than a morning person. Well... I managed to grimace a smile and a nod as I passed by and headed to the restrooms. On my way there, in one of the aisles, I passed a man in a hoodie who kept staring at me as I walked by. I decided that if he started to follow me, I'd call Lita and tell her to get her G.I. Jane ass in here. But he stayed where he was and I made it to the bathroom in one piece. I walked in and slipped into a stall to do my business. While I was in, I thought I might have heard the door to the restroom open, but it was so quiet I figured I must have been the door to the men's room instead. Once I'd finished, I popped the latch on the stall door and started to walk out, only to be impeded by the wide, smiling face of... the morning person from the front of the stall. <sighs> I thought. Excuse me, ma'am, I said, trying to step past her. But to my surprise, she put a hand against my chest and shoved me back into the stall. Hard. My head bounced off the tile wall and my vision dotted and speckled as I fought to stay conscious. I came to my senses just as she leaned down into my face. I thought that was you, 
You're staying right here, sugar. She hummed in that same insufferably cheerful voice. I'm just going to call for a little help, and then we're going to cut you off and torture you until you tell us where all your little friends are. I'm not going anywhere with you, I mumbled, still in a daze from the impact. You have to take me out of this bathroom, and the second you do, I'll pitch a bitch like you can't imagine. You'll never make it out the door with me. <laughs> no, no, sugar. You won't be doing a darn thing after I take just enough blood out of you not to kill you. Why, you won't even be able to stand on your own after I'm done. Now, let me just get comfortable first, and... Then she started to lift me off the floor and up against the stall partition. As fear and panic started to set in, I tried to scream, but she pressed her hand over my mouth so hard I could taste blood from my lip. I kicked and squirmed and punched, but nothing even seemed to bother her as I felt the hand on my mouth begin to push my head to one side and expose my neck. I watched in horror as her face aged forty years in front of me, and our bloodshot eyeballs seemed to bulge from their sockets as she opened her mouth and extended her tongue. At that point, her front teeth had begun to retract upwards to reveal just two large, sharp, triangular fangs that spanned the entirety of where all her original teeth should have been. After this, the top of her tongue began to split down the middle and blossom open to expose rows upon rows of tiny, cactus-like spines, making a revolting suction sound as it did. She started to lean in towards me, excitement gurgling from her open maw. I still couldn't pry myself from her grip, despite my frantic struggle. Just as I felt her hot breath on my face, I slammed the point of my knife straight into her exposed eye with every bit of strength I could muster. While she had been putting her game face on, I'd managed to get my hand underneath my shirt and free the knife from my waistband. I felt the tip hit bone and a grinding, scrapping sensation as the blade slid across the back of the socket. I took my other hand and hammered it into the butt of the handle, just to really sink it in. The knife was pulled from my grip as she snatched her head sideways, emitting a screech of agony as she hit the floor and began to flail. I didn't hesitate. I bolted from the stall and slammed into the locked door, frantically trying to turn the latch. I finally managed to get it open and take off through the store. By the time I got back to the van... Lita was in the driver's seat facing Dex in the back. I opened the passenger door and got in as fast as possible. See, I told you you'd take forever. <laughs> We've been in here for like 15 minutes, and Lita keeps doing that thing where she keeps saying, I must break you, in Dolph Lundgren's voice. She knows it freaks me out. Dex griped as I sat down. Hey, it's not my fault, he's a... Hey, are you Okay. Lita said once she turned to look at me and saw the sweat running down my face and the blood dripping out of my mouth. Before I could collect my thoughts and answer, broken glass exploded in the cab from the driver's side window. Morning bitch must have gone out a back door, circled round, and dived through the window after us. It took Lita a second to orient herself, but once she did, oh boy, oh boy. Operation Whole Hell No went into full effect. Lita grabbed the handle of my knife that was still sticking out of her eye sockets to hold her head in place and started raining down elbows on her temple like it was what all the cool kids were doing. Every blow, bouncing Morning Bitch's head off the steering wheel, causing the horn to bark out over the sounds of Dex freaking the absolute fuck out in the back. Lita continued the onslaught until the blade finally slipped loose from her head, allowing her to slide out of the window and onto the pavement. As soon as we heard the dull thud of her body crumple to the ground, Lita fried up the engine and peeled out of the parking lot as fast as she could. Are you okay? She asked once again, glancing back and forth from the road to me. Yeah, yeah, I'm good, I answered, looking down at my hand when I felt a warm, stinging sensation in my palm. A deep gash ran through the center of my hand. My hand must have slid down onto the edge when I stabbed her. As I looked, I noticed a few thin, black lines snaking their way around, peeking out from under the flowing blood as they headed down my wrist towards my arm. 
sliding my hand into my pocket. I reassured her. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Okay, so I know I left you guys on a cliffhanger last time. And I know it was a bit of a dick move. Yeah, my bad. Obviously I survived because I'm not writing this as a zombie. Or am I? <laughs> no. The answer's no. But what happened was we were on this trip. Well, me and Milo, I mean. We were on a trip to take care of something that happened in the course of this coming part. We kind of had to set it aside for the time being and deal with a bigger issue at hand. But I'll make a separate one about that later, or something, because, oof, holy shit. If what was happening already wasn't enough, we stumbled into an entirely different shit show, and you guys have to hear about it. And by bigger issue, I mean the blood-sucking tweakers trying to go Blade 2 on us, well, in case you aren't up to speed. I was trying to get this all typed out, but in the course of that, some fuckery ensued. I had to close up shop and, well, kind of bail out suddenly. Anyway, in case you guys haven't already figured it out, mixing vampire blood with your own doesn't exactly do the body good. I tried to panic and hide it. That worked for all of five minutes before my right arm was on fire and the black lines had made it up my entire right side to my shoulder. <laughs> Needless to say, Lita was <clears throat> upset with me afterwards. But at the time, once I started screaming in agony, she made it a point to violate pretty much every traffic law to get me back to Gay Jake's house as fast as possible. Actually, I'm almost positive that they're passing new local traffic laws right now because of what she did on the road that day. Oof, those poor safety cones. So, by the time we whipped into the driveway, things were getting pretty bad on my end. On the way there, she managed to explain to me, over the blare of Dex's frantic rambling, that I had mixed blood with morning bitch and that I was headed down Vampire Street pretty fast. And that, well, if we didn't take care of it soon, that would be that. Well, I couldn't get out of her what take care of it meant, well, until we made it in the house. Stop fucking arguing with me and hold her down, Lita commanded as she burst through the door, dragging my wailing body along as she did. Wait, hold me down? Why? I asked through gritted teeth. The rest following her orders, holding me in place as she ran upstairs in a flash. What's happening? What's she doing? I continued, trying to jerk myself free. My question answered itself because in only a moment Lita was already back on her way down, carrying a large machete and a medical kit. Hold up. You're not about to cut her out. Joanna started to question, but Lita spoke over her. This is the only thing we can do right now. Mightn't even work at this point. Best I can do is try to take it off as high as I can and still be able to tourniquet it. Now, hold her down and keep your hands clear, she said, drawing the blade and readying it. No, hell no, get away, I barked as I started kicking and flailing like all hell. Please hold still. It has to happen. It's for your own good. Jasmine pleaded with me through teary eyes. But nope. I pitched an absolute shit fit. Hey, don't judge me until you've had someone standing over you, ready for, well, to really amputate your whole arm. There were six people in that room positively struggling to hold me down because I was having none of it. But despite my savage thrashing, suddenly they all managed to find a way to get me still for just long enough to... Now... There are only a very few select sentences that could be spoken capable of bringing a total halt and absolute quiet to that room at that moment. As it just so happens, I'm back everyone. Sorry it took so long. Well, I had to poop out my werewolf arm. It was one of them, which Milo announced as he exited the bathroom with a pair of headphones on his ears. Silent as the grave, it's thrown around a lot, but... I'm pretty sure even the birds outside stopped chirping for that one. What the... What the hell's going on? He asked, pulling his headphones off and tossing them aside, allowing Sweet But Psycho to permeate through the room. Her blood. A vampire. We need to hurry, Lita said, trying to take aim once again. Oh, shit. Why didn't anyone say anything? Here, 
Give me that, Milo said, holding out his now completely human arm. Lita extended the machete's handle for him to take. Oh, not that, you goddamn Amazon. Her hand. Give, he demanded. Walking over to the crowd of people holding me down, still completely motionless from the lingering disgust, but still very much in pain. He reached down and took my wrist in his hand and gave my cut palm a large, wet lick. There, he said, as I felt a cool relief washed up my arm and across my chest and neck, and then down the rest of my body. Where's Tegan? She could have done that a lot sooner without, well, whatever all this was, he added. She's in the shower, Leslie spoke up. She let everyone else take a shower first last night, so there wasn't any hot water left. So she decided to take one in the morning instead. Suddenly, a faint look of alarm flashed across Milo's face. Oh, oh no, he said in a quiet tone, a slight quiver to his voice. Oh no what? Gage 8 asked, still breathing hard and patting his chest from all the excitement. Oh, just wait. Shouldn't be much longer, Milo answered. A few seconds after that, we heard the loud slam of a door from upstairs, closely accompanied by deliberately stomping footsteps. Upon hearing this, Milo began trudging toward the stairs, taking the blanket off the back of the couch as he went. He reached the steps with just enough time to unfold the blanket and hold it high up in front of the stairway as Tegan began marching down to the tune of Who flushed the toilet? Ah, the water became so hot so fast. As she descended, Milo wrapped the blanket around what was obviously a dripping wet and stark naked Tegan. She continued her tirade as he struggled to get the blanket securely on her soaked body and calm her down enough to explain the situation. Did you do it? She asked loudly, to which he nodded shamefully a few times. Why would you do that? Damn, it was so hot I think it was burning my... She stopped suddenly as she noticed the situation in the living room. What's going on? Why are you holding that poor girl down like that? Tegan asked when she noticed that Leslie, Dex, Trey, Gay Jake, and Joanna all still had me pinned to the ottoman in the center of the room. She got attacked by a vampire at the grocery store. Some of his blood got mixed with hers. I was about to take her arm off and try and stop it, but well, that's when my... Lita attempted to explain, but she never got the chance to finish as Tegan lunged towards me like a bullet, causing the blanket to flop to the floor. Oh, my dear, I'm sorry, are you okay? You poor girl, she exclaimed as she dove onto my still immobilized body, wrapping her arms around me as she did. Now, I'm not one to blush, but right then you could have fried an egg on my face as I felt the water on her soak through my clothes as she constricted me in her comforting hug. As I looked around the room at everyone, my eyes wide with surprise, I could see they were all doing their dampest to revert their gaze. Then I heard Jasmine whisper in my ear. I'm going to let this one slide, since you almost died. Thank you, I whispered back. You're welcome, <laughs> she giggled, wrapping her arms around my shoulders as she joined the hug. I noticed over Tegan's shoulder that Dex was tiptoeing his way in to get his hug on too, but Leslie grabbed him by the ear. Yeah, no. Nice try, Slick, she said, yanking him back to the chair next to the fireplace. After about a minute or so of the soaking wet cuddle puddle, Gay Jake spoke up. All right, that's enough. Too much more of that and you're going to start getting checks in the mail from Brazzers, he said, throwing the blanket back over Tegan. Now, you take your naked ass back upstairs and dry off. Oh, and get dressed, he continued as she started towards the stairs. Soon after, Tegan descended the stairs once again and as soon as she was back, Gay Jake caused us all to convulse with fright as his voice shattered the uneasy silence. So, what the hell just happened? That was when Lita and I explained to everyone everything that had gone down at the grocery store, all the way up to discovering the injury on my hand which Jasmine and Joanna were now working together to bandage. Then Milo and Tegan explained that their saliva basically has some kind of well, super antibody they produce in their own bodies. Anything from Ebola to the common cold just wipes out pretty much instantly. Yeah, 
think it has something to do with our crazy healing, Milo said. Like, when we change, it's basically our bones breaking and our muscles tearing and filling in the gaps. It's what makes the whole thing possible, really. Curious, I asked. So, um, you have a real-life healing factor. Like D Yes, like the Deadpool character. Deegan interrupted loudly, causing everyone in the room to look in her direction. Milo said the same thing when I tried to explain the healing to him. Oh, I got all the comics, Milo whispered, leaning down next to my ear. How fast do you guys heal? Trey asked from his place next to Joanna. <laughs> Watch this, Milo exclaimed, taking the machete from beside Lita's chair and, before any of us could actually process what he was doing, put his hand on the coffee table and lopped his index finger off. As he did, the expression on his face flashed briefly from one of confidence to one of shock, as if he suddenly remembered that hacking a whole finger off actually hurts a whole goddamn lot. Gay Jake shrieked as Milo picked the severed digit off the table and tossed it his way as he chuckled. Here, hold that for me, would you? Our alarm didn't even have time to die down before he held up his hand so everyone could watch his new finger sprout from his stump, every now and then giving a soft pop or crack as it did. Oh, God, Dex said as he began to gag behind me. Don't you puke on my couch. Gay Jake shouted at Dex, but started sympathy gagging along with Dex soon after. Oh, please, stop or I'm gonna... He said, covering his mouth as he spoke. About a minute later, Milo had all fingers back exactly as they were. Everyone gathered around to inspect his freshly healed hand, pulling and poking and prodding as they did. It brought me back to that first night when everyone gathered around to marvel at the two towering beasts that they were at the time. At that point it seemed like a near-death experience. The blood loss, the struggle to keep my arm, the almost amputation, the free-growing finger, and Dex and Gay Jake's retching all seemed to hit me at once. I'm not feeling so hot, guys. I'm just going to run to the can for a minute in case I hurl. I mumble as I stood and made my way to the bathroom at the far end of the house away from all the noise and excitement. All right, sugar, you take your time, Gay Jake said softly. We're going to go get those groceries in before the cold stuff starts to turn. I wanted to offer to stay and help, but I could feel my stomach start to do flips and decided it was probably better to get to the bathroom before I dyed Gray Jake's carpet whatever color ended up coming out of me. I only just made it to the toilet before everything that was inside of me was out about 45 minutes or so of enjoying the cool, cold, dark of the bathroom, I finally motivated myself to stand up off the floor and rejoin the group. As I walked down the hallway, I began to hear Milo and Gay Jake talking to one another, and then I heard my name come up. Lightening my steps, I stopped just around the corner. Yeah, I know, eavesdropping is wrong. Shame on me. Anyway, I started to be able to make out what they were saying by then. Oh, baby, you can't let that get you. She might have the attitude of a honey badger with a hemorrhoid, but, but the poor girl's had a hell of a hard time, Gay Jake said to Milo. I was about to whip round the corner and stop him right there, but that nagging sensation to know what other people say about us when we're not there, well, it got the best of me, so I bit my lip and stayed hidden. What kind of hard time? Milo asked. Well, in case you hadn't noticed yet, she tends to lean towards people with the same hardware as her in the uh, romance department, Gay Jake began, and after Milo nodded his head, he continued. Well, things can get pretty tough for people like her and me, and little old Jasmine, anywhere in the world, but especially so down here in the South. And that poor girl has got some of the worst of it. When she told her parents what she was all about, they sent her straight off to a conversion center, and that ain't no place for anyone, never mind a 15-year-old girl. What? That's the place they try to make gay people straight, with Jesus and prayer and shit, right? Milo interjected. You got it, sugar, Gay Jake answered. But they can get a lot worse than that. And when the Bible Belt couldn't beat it out of her, well, her parents just tried a regular belt instead, among other household objects. I, oh, jeez, Milo said under his breath. 
Oh, we don't end there, Gajek said. That's just where they started. After a few months of having new welts whipped on top of the old ones, didn't make that teenage dealer any more interested in good old-fashioned penis. Well, they threw her out on her ass. That's about the moment she fell out of the frying pan, bounced off the concrete, and landed straight into the fire. What? It gets worse, Milo said in disbelief. Well, there's definitely more after that, Gay Jake continued. Now, if you're a scared and hungry teenage girl on the street with nowhere to go, any part in a storm, like they say. She eventually met a woman in her twenties who offered to take her in after they started as well, getting close. That might sound a bit creepy by itself, but it don't end there. After a while, that woman started making her pay her way while she was staying in her house. Pay her way? Why does that not sound like she just did the dishes and took out the trash? Milo asked nervously. Because that ain't what she did, honey. Gay Jake answered sadly. I don't want to go into detail, but there's probably a lot of pictures and videos on that dog internet thing that she wouldn't be happy about. Gay Jake went on as I heard Milo take a slow, deep breath in response. And that's about the time I found her. Not too awful far from here. Trying to trade a stolen EBT card for cash. Lip busted, one eye swollen, almost shut. Gosh, she looked a damn mess. What'd you do? Milo interjected again with a bit more enthusiasm this time. I told her I'd give her a choice. If she wanted, to, I'd give her whatever she was asking for that card, as long as she promised to give it back to the owner instead of me. Or she still gives the car back and I take her back home with me, where she would be allowed to stay as long as she needed, under the condition that she goes back to school and don't steal shit anymore, Gay Jake said. What happened then? Milo asked, shifting noisily around in his seat. <laughs> she told me to go fuck myself and threw a stick at me. I don't know what I was expecting to hear, said Milo. But that somehow sounds about right. So what'd you do after that? He asked. Oh, I had that little shit arrested. That stick split my head wide open, Gay Jake replied. But then after she sat in the tank to cool down for a while, I explained what the situation was to my cousin in the PD, then told her I'd get her out with the same conditions still applied. She wasn't happy about it, but I did a damn fine job of convincing her that she was about to go to actual prison. <laughs> I'm very persuasive, he added. And she just went along with it? No fuss? No attitude? Milo asked. Oh, God no, child. That bitch was feral. She must have tore half this house apart before she calmed down. Bless her little heart, Gay Jake laughed. But, long story short, this is where she stayed all the way through college. Well, I didn't have a... Milo began to say, but was cut short after the trip down memory lane had finally got me bawling like a kid. Oh, dear. Get in here, you nosy little heathen. Come on, Gay Jake said, inviting me into the room with them. Now you know better. He scolded. I know. I'm sorry. I blathered between sobs. Then Milo started to stand up and walk towards me. Don't you laugh, I sniffled, trying to calm myself down. And then Milo did the most out-of-character thing imaginable. He hugged me. What are you doing? I said, squirming around in the awkward embrace. You better not be trying to put a kick-me sign on my back. And never do that. God, so immature, even for me, he said as I heard the sound of crinkling paper behind me. I'm just proud of you, he continued, stepping back and holding something in his hand. When I asked him what it was, he opened it to reveal my knife, but with half the blade missing. It must have broke when Lita was bashing morning skank's brains in. Wow, you stabbed an actual vampire in the freaking face. That's pretty epic, he added. Thanks, I said, wiping the snot and tears from my face on my sleeve. Honey, tissues right here on the table, where they've always been, Gay Jake said in mild disgust. So, um, the lick that cured me, right? I'm back to normal? I finally asked, having brought my sniffling down to a reasonable level. Well, um, sorta. 
It stopped it, but whatever it did do while it was doing what it did is going to stay well, done. Yeah, it'll stay done, Milo answered. So I... I started, but he cut me off. Probably going to have one hell of a handshake from now on, he said, pointing at the wooden arm of the chair next to where I was being held down. It had been squeezed into splinters that jutted out in all directions. I looked down at my right hand and noticed for the first time that my fingernails had all turned that color of off-black you see in, like, buffalo horn and junk. Yeah, those are probably going to grow to a point from now on, so you're going to want to keep those trimmed, and you'll probably also have found a new appreciation for blur steak. Well, blur steak's one step less cooked than rare, to where it's actually basically cold and raw in the center. Yeah, he was right, it is pretty great. Gay Jake then sent me back up to my old room and told me to get cleaned up. Then he'd cook us all dinner and we'd figure out what to do next. As he left, he grabbed Milo by the arm and said, Come with me, Jack Sparrow. I'm going to need a strong man to help in the kitchen. Oh, why does everyone keep saying that? I'm supposed to look like a gypsy, not a pirate. He complained as Gay Jake dragged him along. As I turned around and started to head up the stairs to my old room, I noticed the bored up piece of paper and decided to see what kind of stupid shit Milo was about to tape to my back. Once I began to uncrinkle it, the words written in black permanent marker lined themselves back up. I kick a vampire ass, it said in terrible handwriting. Smiling, I neatly folded it back up and stuffed it into my pocket as I made my way up the stairs. That evening, as we all sat around the dining room table eating the pot roast that Gay Jake and Milo had worked on all day, much to Milo's chagrin, we discussed what we'd do next. We didn't have our first break for until someone made an off-handed remark about how Joanna's friend was lucky he ended up not coming. The breakthrough was when she responded. <laughs> yeah, dodged the bullet on that one. Just by the skin of his teeth, too. Yeah, he waited until I showed him the spot we were going to on Google Maps to... She trailed off, as we all began to stare at her intently. I mean, no, you guys don't think... How long had you known him before that? Leslie asked. Oh, a couple of months. He works in the same store at Opry Mills, and he mentioned he spent a lot of time in the, the woods, she said, trailing off once more as the realization began to set in. Our backward-ass yin-yang luck had struck again. We began to formulate our plan. The first thing that came up was how the vampires would be dealt with. Milo and Tegan explained that one-on-one, -on -one, or even a lot-on-one, well, vampires couldn't do a hell of a lot to stop a fully hulked-out werewolf. They were basically just massive engines of destruction and carnage with fur. The problem lay in that the blood-sucking bastards could heal faster than they could, and could only be killed by a very specific and extremely rare metal. You mean silver? Dex asked upon hearing this. Nope, Lita answered, pulling what appeared to be a large Rambo-looking knife from under her chair and stamming it into the table, causing Gay Jake to wince and rub his temple. Did you have to stick it in the table? Gay Jake complained. Or a calcium, Lita continued. Everyone from the American United Association of Certified Vampire Control Technicians has some kind of weapon with that metal laminated into it. It's the only thing that hurts them permanently. There's only one place to get it, and only a few people who can work with it. As we all examined it, we could see the perfectly straight, gold-colored lines that crisscross randomly over the steel surface. Lisa then went on to explain that each member of the American United... Oh, each member of the thing has a weapon made especially for them once they join. Yeah, so what it looks like what has to happen is if we can get all of them into one place at one time somehow, me and Tegan can maul them to pieces. You guys can run behind us and put the kibosh on the left of us. We'll have to keep moving to make sure none get away, so we can't do it all ourselves, Milo explained. So, Lita, how do we get more of those things? go to see the man that made this one, she answered, flicking the handle of the comically large piece of cutlery. I'm going to warn you, though. He's a real mean one. He's not someone you'd like to bump into on a cold, wet, rainy night, 
well, not any other time, to be honest. He's about the best there is at what he does, so we're going to have to deal with it and take one for the cause, she cautioned. So, we need to figure out who's going to go. What do you mean, who's going to go? Trey spoke up. Can we just call or email him? Or text him, even? No. You have to request these in person. No correspondence of any kind that leaves a record. You go. Make your request. He makes it while you wait, and then you leave, Lita explained. What about paying the dude? Dex asked. Yeah, I can't imagine he does the shit for the warm feeling it gives him to help his fellow man. The association and the place they get the medal from takes care of that. No idea what the specifics are, though. All I know is the medal comes from this weird building full of monsters. It calls itself a hotel. Never been, don't want to go. Can't make me. Lita said. Oh, not after the shit I've heard about that place. I'll go. Her voice spoke loudly over the conversation. Looking around to see who the idiot was who just volunteered to visit Freddy Krueger on his home turf, and after a second of following everyone else's wide eyes to the source, it hit me. I sat my fourth Captain Morgan and V8 strawberry banana smoothie down on the table and thought to myself, Oh fuck, that's my voice. Unfortunately, by the next morning, neither I nor anyone else had managed to talk me out of my decision. Either their arguments weren't strong enough, or my stubbornness was too much. But regardless, I had made up my mind to stick to it. Most of this was my own fault, after all, so it was the least I could do. The plan was that Milo would stay and buddy up to Joanna's co-worker to try and get a lead on where those throat-sucking crank ticks were camped out. And while he was bromancing, that guy... Tegan and I would go see the cantankerous weapon making. It was brought up that it might be better for Tegan to stay and flirt the information out of our mark, but Milo seemed a little less than enthused about Tegan pressing herself seductively up against another man, and so we didn't press the issue. Apparently he thought it wiser to send her off on a who-knows-where and how-long trip with the chick that he's been drooling over for the past few days. Not that I had any plans to actually try anything, just an observation. Words I would have to repeat to myself over and over as Tegan came down the stairs to join us in the living room that morning. Curves in all the right places don't begin to cover it. The clothes that once fit with just a little room to spare were now straining to hold themselves together. In her words, I ain't much to change a little in case we find trouble. Apparently, unlike going straight to the gut like Milo, when she packs it into turn, it goes, well, exactly where you'd want it to. How can I put this? To any of the other degenerates like myself in attendance? You know Sonny Leo? That. And to all those that don't, you clearly aren't living your best life. Shaking myself out of my stupor as Jasmine coughed into her hand from across the room, I asked Lita where this guy was supposed to be. Bessemer, she answered walking into the kitchen as she spoke. Where the hell is that exactly? I asked again. Sweet Home Alabama started blaring from someone's phone speaker behind me. I turned to see Milo holding his up, an accomplished smirk plastered across his face. <laughs> Real cute, dude, I said as I looked closer at his screen, noticing a map with a red pin towards the middle of the state, along with some text underneath that read, Bessemer, Alabama, founded 1887. Name for the Englishman Henry Bessemer, inventor of the Bessemer process, which revolutionized steel production. <sighs> Seems oddly appropriate, I said, reading the screen. So how are we going to get there? They'll probably be looking for our cars and have their eyes on bus stations and junk. You mean the vampires? Dex asked. No, I mean the Harlem Globetrotters. Yes, of course I mean the freaking vampires. I barked back. Then we started to figure out the next step, getting there without using a vehicle with our license plates or a compromised form of public transportation. What about something like Uber? Gay Jake suggested, peeking his head out from around the entrance to the kitchen. I mean, that might work, but wouldn't it be really expensive, especially both ways? I asked. As soon as I did, Lita came from around the corner and took the phone from Milo's hand. Messed with the screen for a second, 
and then gave it back and walked back into the kitchen without a word. We don't been over this. I can cover it. About the only thing I can't swing is a private jet. Besides, that just sounds like a setup for a vampires versus werewolves on a plane movie. That just sounds like a horrible plot. Not even Samuel L. Jackson could save that one. He chuckled. What Cerber? I heard Milo say next to me as he scrolled through his phone. What? I asked, gathering around with everyone else. What are you talking about? Milo answered, holding his phone up to my face. Here, look. It's an app, but I've never heard of it. Well, open it, Trey said, tapping on the screen. As he did, the screen turned black and words began to fade into view that read, Cerber is a dedicated ride-sharing service company that ensures anonymity and safe transportation of the paranormal. Are you a paranormal being or entity in need of a reliable and discreet ride-sharing service? Well then, do we have the app for you? Welcome to Cerber, the number one paranormal ride-sharing app in the world. What the f... I whispered to myself. At this point we all began to look around and check outside, suspicious that someone was screwing with us. Wait, come back. There's more, Joanna and Leslie said together. Walking back over, I began to inspect the screen again. We here at Server offer top-notch service at a fair price. And so on it went. Basically, it said that it worked almost identically to any other rideshare service, with the exception that the rates for each ride were based on the threat the passenger posed to the driver. Then we spent a few minutes running through reviews of the company and some of the drivers. There seemed to be one guy named Jim that stirs up all matter of hell. His reviews were actually pretty hilarious most of the time. Well, that's perfect, Milo finally announced. If it's calculated by risk to the driver, then Tegan is harmless. <laughs> it ought to be practically free for you guys. Half of us scoffed, as we'd all apparently remember Tegan turning a man's head into a meaty water balloon not long ago. But she downloaded the app onto her phone and signed up all the same. Once we both had packed our bags, she asked. Okay, so, I just press this button and a person comes to give us a ride? Yeah, just hit the thingy right there and we wait for someone to accept and show up, I said, looking over her shoulder as we stood in a group in the driveway. Should be a little while before anyone comes, though. Okay, here goes something, she said, pressing the button that calls the ride. About that time, a passing car slammed on its brakes, squealing to a halt before slowly beginning to back up towards us. No, there's no freaking way. I spoke under my breath as the car approached and the window began to roll down. Hey, y'all know how to get to a cowboy town from here? The man in the driver's seat called out. I... What? I asked stupidly. A cowboy town? It's somewhere around here, right? He replied. Um, oh, right, you mean the rinky-dink Wild West place? Uh, yeah, closed down. Kid Rock bought the place a few years ago. Sorry, dude, I answered after coming to my senses. Oh, shit, the man exclaimed before speeding off. After a few seconds, we all turned to look at each other and burst out laughing. About five minutes later, Tegan got a notification that her request had been accepted and the driver was on their way. Another ten or so minutes passed before the driver arrived in a black SUV, which pulled into the driveway. Once the door began to open, we saw their feet hit the ground behind the definitely too dark to be legal tinted window. The first thing we noticed was that one of the driver's legs was prosthetic. As the driver closed the door to reveal a woman who looked to be in her mid-thirties, she greeted us with a cheerful, Hello, everyone. And who's my lucky passenger today? She exclaimed as she began to walk towards us. I hope it's you, cutie, she said, winking at me. I, um, um, I said, taken aback. What? No, I mean, yes, I know. Um, she made the request, but I'm coming too, I added, pointing towards Tegan as I did, and hearing Jasmine groan in the background. Oh, well, lucky me she chirped. Well, actually, you're the lucky ones. 
Lucky I was passing through already to help open a new centre down here. Otherwise there wouldn't have been another driver for over 200 miles. <laughs> so, where are we going? Bessemer, I said quietly, attempting not to garner any more of her attention than necessary at this point. Ah, oh, excellent. That's pretty close to where I was headed. Everyone ready? She said in the same enthusiastic tone. So, after we all said our goodbyes, Tegan and I loaded our bags into the back and hopped into the SUV for the three and a half hour ride. And for those of you who have never driven from Middle Tennessee to Middle Alabama, it's not a scenic trip. You get to pass through Pulaski, birthplace of the good old KKK, Lynchburg, home of the Jack Daniels Distillery, and more than a few Confederate monuments. Sorry, I meant uh, Southern Heritage monuments. And if that isn't bad enough, you have to suffer through that long-ass trip down the oh, Civil War wasn't about slavery avenue just to end up in, yep, Alabama. Bama. My uncle used to say that the best thing to ever come out of Alabama was the I-65. Boy, he wasn't kidding. But before we even got started, Miss Daisy started getting real fresh with me, which was weird to say the least. I'm not really used to being flirted with, like, at all. And needless to say, that sent my bitch gland into overdrive. Oh, I like the hipster look, the driver said, glancing into the mirror. It suits you. I am... Oh, hipster? You know there's a fighting worse down here, right? I retorted. Well, I just mean that the glasses and the baggy shirt and the gym shorts oh, and the Chuck Taylors. She trailed off. This is how I dress to sit in the car for three and a half hours. People actually dress like this on purpose and go out where you're from, I said, my tone getting more agitated. Well, yes. A lot of people in California go through a lot of trouble and spend a lot of money to look like they bought everything they're wearing from a thrift store. <laughs> oh, uh, you bought everything you're wearing at a thrift store, she mumbled regretfully. Yes, I did, I answered. A scowl on my face, harshening. I could tell Tegan was struggling desperately to stay out of it. Oh, I'm sorry, she apologized, glancing into the mirror again. Still in a mood, I brushed off the apology. <sighs> Whatever. I shrunk Terminator. Dang, girl, she mumbled, focusing fully on the road again. About an hour and a half later of riding in silence, it given me time to think that Maybe I'd been unnecessarily mean to the driver. I started to say I was sorry, but before I could, she suddenly whipped the car off the freeway and into a rest stop. Holy shit! It's a spaceship! She yelled. Well, I'd forgotten about the monolithic decommissioned rocket that was set up along the way. I guess it would be pretty cool if you'd never seen it before. Especially just happening across it when you didn't know it was there. Then Tegan looked out the window and flipped her shit right along with the driver. So, after taking like 50 pictures of them under the burners and with a shuttle in the distance, we took a pee break and were back on the road. About the only stop after that was when we ate at a Waffle House on one of the exits. We'd collectively decided that she had to experience one while she was in the South. Not long after that, we were approaching our destination. As we rounded the last turn, we noticed a U-Haul rental truck parked outside of the place that was supposed to be where we were going. Hmm. Do you want me to wait for a minute? You know, just in case. The driver who we knew now as Charisse asked. Yeah, maybe that's probably the best, I said, and Tegan agreed. As we pulled up and began to approach the door, a man in all black, wearing a pair of those old-timey round sunglasses, exited the house carrying with him a box of what looked like random computer and surveillance equipment as he made his way to the truck. Before we could even speak, he said, Awfully sorry, but I'm terribly busy. You'll have to come back some other time, he said in a slow, heavy voice. Then he began to make his way past me to the U-Haul. Hey, wait a goddamn minute, I exclaimed as I reached out and grabbed his arm in an attempt to put my newly acquired kung fu grip to use admittedly squeezing harder than I probably should have. As I latched on and clenched my fingers together, it caused the contents of his box to shift and clatter. We came all the way down here because you're the only one that can make the shit we need. Now... I stopped. The man wasn't even phased. 
I was originally worried I might be in danger of breaking the man's arm after gripping so tightly, but now I just felt well, in danger. As he stared down at me through the deep void of the round, infinitely black lenses of his glasses, he spoke in a viscous, acidic tone. Well, that's a mighty strong grip you have there, little girl. Now, off, oh, he commanded, and before I had time to make any kind of choice in the matter, my hand was already retracting as fast as it could. I'm sorry, I squeaked, clasping my hands together behind my back. We really need your help. I added, averting my eyes down towards the cobblestone sidewalk and squeezing my hands even tighter in an effort to hold the tremors of fear that had begun to streak up and down my spine at bay. The last time I was that afraid was in the woods when I thought I was seconds away from being torn apart and eaten alive, and the last time I felt such an icy chill down my back was that same night, as I watched a seven and a half foot tall monster with murder in its eyes stalk up to a shack in total silence. I'd had it. I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't want to be there. I wanted to go home. I wanted to be as far away from that man and this place as possible. But before I could turn and tell Tegan to follow me back to the SUV, the man had begun to move. Hmm, <clears throat> he huffed, taking off his glasses to reveal his impossibly pale blue eyes, and then placed them into his shirt pocket, from which he also withdrew a small notepad and pen. Turn he commanded once again, causing my legs to obey before consulting the rest of me. He placed the pad on my back, which caused me to jerk slightly in mild panic, and then began to scribble something. Here, he growled, placing the notepad back into his pocket, save for the one sheet he'd written on, which he then tore from the rest. This man can make what you need. He takes the requests when I can't be bothered with them. He's young, but he's competent in his craft. Now, I have much more important things that need my attention. So if you'll be so kind as to leave me to my affairs, he said, before placing his glasses back over his face and making his way back towards the truck. Me and Tegan both waited until we'd got in the truck and drove off before even attempting to move. Once he was out of sight, I looked down at the paper which displayed only an address but I was distracted by Tegan, who was now bent down, inspecting something in the grass. Who, uh, I wonder, is Jerry? That was not the man's name we were given, no? She asked. What are you talking about? I asked as I walked towards her. I find this in the grass, she said, holding up a small white object with something written across it. As I looked more closely, I could tell it was a flash drive. Someone had written Jerry's journal across the top in permanent marker. Judging from the writing on the paper, it was likely the same guy. And yeah, I know. I should have just dropped it right there and gone back to the car. But I just had to know what a man like that was doing with someone else's journal. So I crammed it into my pocket, grabbed Tegan's hand, and with an, All right, let's get out of here. I ran back to the SUV with her in tow. What the hell was all that about? Charisse asked, obviously concerned. I had all kinds of monsters and demons and mythological beings in my back seat, but none of them gave me the bad vibes that fellow did just walking past my window, she continued, shaking off the willies as she finished. I'm not sure. He gave us an address, though. We're supposed to go see this guy instead, I guess, I said, handing her the piece of paper. Hmm. <sighs> He's got very nice penmanship, she mentioned as she inspected the note. And she wasn't kidding. Even his hurried handwriting was borderline calligraphy. Do, um, do you want us to go ahead and set a new destination in the app? I asked sheepishly, slowly realizing what a pen in the ass we were probably being to her at this point. No, oh, no, it's fine. This isn't too far away. Only a few miles, actually. She said, holding up the map on her phone. See? We're here, and this is Makala. Right next to each other. So this one's on me, okay? What? Really? Oh, thank you. I shrieked, along with Tegan. Ten minutes later, we were climbing out of the SUV at our new destination, and saying our goodbyes to Cherise. Oh, I'm sorry 
about the Terminator thing. That was too much. I apologized. Ah, oh, don't worry. I've been caught worse. And I should have a friend, Jim, back home, who's going to love to hear that one, she replied. Wait. The Jim with all the crazy reviews, Jim? I asked. Yep, that Jim, she answered. Oh my God, that guy's great. I want to meet him so bad. I cried out in excitement. <laughs> Maybe you will sometime. I'm sure he'd get a kick out of the two of you. She chuckled, looking back at Tegan as she attempted to wrestle her bag from the back. Well then, I'll see you on my way back. Week and a half, right? She asked. Yeah, that's supposed to be how long it's going to take. See you then, I answered, walking around to retrieve my bag as well. Roger that, Cherie said before driving away, kicking up dust from the long dirt road as she went. When she was gone, Tegan and I turned to face the house. Aside from it being, well, an absolute dump, the first thing that stuck out was an older man out front. A gangly man. His skin was several shades more tan than even Milo's, and his hair was just as black but long and matted. Even from a distance, it was easy to tell that this man worked outside a lot. He seemed to be welding on a mess of steel bars. Is... Um, is that him? I asked, turning towards Tegan, who just shrugged her shoulders in response. As we walked up to him, it became painfully obvious what he was making. Two stick people with their heads between each other's legs. Tegan and I both stopped and looked at each other, exchanging winces for a second before approaching. Um, hello, I stammered, shielding my eyes from the bright electric arm. Startled, the man lifted up his welding hood. Oh, shit. You snuck up on me. Hey, wanna buy two stick people 69? Um, no, thanks. I'm trying to quit, I replied. Are you the guy we're supposed to see about? I was interrupted by yelling coming from around the corner of the dilapidated house. Tony, God damn it! I swear to God if you're going to use my good steel again for those damn stick figures... You're going to owe me a pair of sandals, too, because cause these are going to be so far up your ass, you're going to be picking gravel out of your... T a much younger man rounded the corner and stopped as he noticed me and Tegan standing there. Looks of alarm and confusion plastered across our faces. Oh, hey, what can I get for you ladies? Um, we're here about these, I said, holding out the sketches everyone had made for their future vampire slaying devices. Taking a second to flip through the papers, he replied, Well, I think we should be able to help you all. He cut himself short. Son of a bitch, he yelled, grabbing a long piece of steel from the lewd sculpture and breaking it off at the weld. M390, Tony. Oh, this was a 36-inch bar of M390. You know how much this shit costs? He scolded. <sighs> You all two come inside with me. And Tony, I'm going to make back out here. And if I find another piece of my steel on this... <sighs> That's your ass, he warned. As we made our way into the house, we heard the whir of an angle grinder fire up as the man began to cut something off the welded monstrosity. When we entered the home, we weren't greeted by roaches scurrying under the furniture, as I originally anticipated, but rather by a very well-maintained living room. I mean... Aside from it being adorned wall to wall with various weapons, armor, and other curios from just about every culture you could imagine. Oh, uh, make yourselves at home, our host said, propping the piece of metal up against the wall next to the door before plopping down in a recliner. So, uh, sounds like you guys got some vampire killing to do, he said, holding up the sealed note from Lita explaining the situation. Also looks like your buddy here isn't going to be there when you get back. Bummer. Wait. What? I shrieked, practically launching myself off the couch where I'd been sitting and snatching the note from his hand. As I poured through her words, I learned that she'd known that she was leaving the country again in a few days on assignment and wouldn't be back for several months. God, that bitch. I growled to myself, then handed the paper to Tegan for her to read. 
Why would she do this? Tegan asked with an air of genuine disappointment in her voice. Ah, I'm sure you'll be fine. You got two werewolves and, uh, well, whatever you are on your side, he said, gesturing towards me and my fingernails, which were already starting to become pointed again, despite having clipped them before we left that morning. Still fuming, I dropped back down onto the couch, my arms and legs tightly crossed in protest. The man then started to flip back through the drawings. As he got to the back, he suddenly stopped. Well, most of these seem pretty doable. I just have one question. Who's Dex? He asked, a look of disappointment on his face as he spoke. Oh, dear God, what did he draw? I asked, not entirely wanting to hear the answer. Well, he seemed to have just printed out this, he said, turning the paper around to reveal a photograph of a glock. Tegan and I both groaned as we leaned our faces down into our hands. Oh, that boy ain't never gonna be right, I thought to myself. Well, just use your best judgement, I told him, at a loss for anything better to say. Can do, he said, balling the paper up and chucking it into the nearest trash can. And, um, well, now that's out of the way. The name's Hephaestus. You all can call me Hep. Follow me. He went on as he stood and started to walk around the corner. Hephaestus. Why does that sound familiar? And Greek? I asked as we caught up. Oh, I get that a lot. Old family name. He caught back over his shoulder. Here we go. This is where you can stay while you're waiting. He said as he opened a door at the center of an unusually long hallway for the size of the house. Help yourselves to anything you need. Kitchen's always full on account of I like to eat. <laughs> but if you spot something you want best, go ahead and get it before that long gutted bastard sneaks in here and absconds with it. He cautioned, pointing to the Tony guy outside who was still loudly hacking away on the metal atrocity he was trying to pass his art. There's a little area about four or five miles down the road that's got restaurants and stores. Oh, and a movie theater and shit if you get bored or need anything. Well, um, feminine, yeah, that I ain't got here. If you can't get Tony to drive you, there's a few bicycles around here you can use, he explained. Oh, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Hephaestus, Tegan said once she was done. We so much appreciate all your kindness and hospitality. Uh, hospitality. Uh, hospitality. Ah, oh, you can just call me Hep, man. Mr. Hephaestus was my father. Oh, well, not really. I don't think you'd actually believe who my daddy was, <laughs> he said with a smile. Well, I'm going to leave you all to it. I've got to go put a foot in Tony's ass, then get started on this, he said, brandishing the stack of papers. And, just like that, he was gone, and it was just the two of us standing in the room. It took both of us sitting in awkward silence for about 30 minutes on the one and only bed in the room to acknowledge that there was only one bed in the room. So, um, I think there might only be one bed, I mentioned. I have noticed this, yes, she responded. I am raised in a caravan in Romania, so I am used to sharing a bed. But I'm um, what you call a, uh, snuggler. Oh, dear God, I thought to myself feeling my face flush with blood. I um, don't think Jasmine and Milo are going to be any more thrilled about our sleeping situation than we are, I said, feeling my face near egg-frying temperature again. Yes, I think this a um, situation for, how you say, never leaves this room, she said. Yeah, that's probably best, I said back as we both laughed the most uneasy of laughs. After getting settled, it took approximately 8 minutes and 21 seconds for total boredom to set in. Oh, I am bored as shit, I screamed, flopping into the bed and planting my face into the pillow. Oh, let's go raid the fridge, I said, immediately catapulting myself back off the bed and out the door. Well, the guy wasn't kidding. The fridge was like the cave of wonders, but with food. We ended up just snagging a few cheese sticks to snack on and decided to explore the place. 
not finding anything of particular interest out front. Aside from the progress Tony had made on the stick figure abomination, we made our way around back. Holy shit! I said in astonishment at what was just on the other side of the house. The guy didn't have a shop. He had a stack shipping container after shipping container on top of each other and side by side, cutting the front off of some to create a giant wall of metal and machinery. Yo! A call echoed out from somewhere on the wall. We looked around for a second to finally head in on one of the open face containers up top. Decided to snoop around a little, he asked. Um, yeah, we uh, got cheese sticks, I answered back, holding up the bundle of dairy rods I clenched in my fist. Oh, for real? Bring me one, he yelled down at us, pointing towards an opening in the far corner. It took us a minute to get to where he was after figuring out the weird doors and ladder scheme he'd set up, but before long we made our way up. Hep met us at the entrance of the container we'd seen him in from the ground, taking one of the pilfered cheese sticks from the bunch in my hand. As he butchered the wrapper to get the snack inside, I took the broken knife out of my pocket, presenting it to him. Hey, I was wondering, is there any chance you could fix this? I asked. Well, that's broken. Generally, you don't want to fix broken blades. It's more trouble than it's worth, and it still ain't going to be the same. He explained. Oh, well, um, thanks, anyway. I started to say in disappointment before he burst out into laughter. <laughs> Wait, is this a plowman? Wow, I can't believe that con man is still in business. Oh, no wonder it broke. No heat-treating son of a bitch, <laughs> he exclaimed, throwing the broken blade into the garbage bin next to me. Wait here. <laughs> he said with a chuckle, as he walked into the next container. Me and Tegan exchanged confused glances as we heard him clattering and stirring in the next room. Here, he said as he returned, holding a small cardboard box in his outstretched hand. I took the box and started to open it, revealing the contents. It was, well, a new knife, about the same size as my old one, but it just seemed nicer. I... This looks really expensive, I stammered. Damn right it is, he said excitedly. That's 3V steel, and the hand's marbled carbon fiber. Even you and your crazy weird gorilla strength won't be able to break that one. I don't think I'll be able to afford this, I sighed. Woman, just shut up and take the damn thing, he laughed. I'm about to make a literal shitload of cash off this order you're putting in. I can spare this little guy he added, pushing the box in my hand closer to me, before continuing. Oh, um, which reminds me, help keep a lookout for the people that's supposed to be delivering the Auric Carlson. They should be here in the next day or two. You'll know them when you see them. Tegan and I both nodded in agreement before he gave a tour of the shop, well, the castle <laughs> wall thing, explaining the various tools, machines, and processes as he went. He had a lot of very expensive looking modern equipment, but some of the tools look really old. And I don't mean antique store old, like ancient Bronze Age shit. I couldn't imagine why anyone would keep these things like that just lying around a shop. After he was done explaining the mind-numbing complexities of how he'd been making our anti-clod sucker weapons, as he called them, we decided to go back inside and let everyone know we'd made it there in one piece. Well, since we'd kind of let it slip our mind when we arrived, after our encounter with Mr. Grim Death and all that. After calling and telling everyone about the events of the day, me and Tegan just messed around on the interwebs for the rest of it. That is, until Tegan blurted out from behind the screen of her laptop. Oh look, they have the statue of Roman God not so far from here. What about it? I asked, scooting across the bed to see the screen. It is for the god Vulcan. It is supposed to be the largest cast iron statue in the world, she said excitedly. Hmm. Then I guess we'll have to go check that out while we're here, I responded, scrolling down the page she'd been reading. Yeah, you're right, it's really close. I'll see about getting us a ride tomorrow so we can go see it, 
I added, giggling at her visible excitement. After that, we both went to bed. Turns out Tegan is one of those lucky instant sleepers. As soon as her head hit the pillow, out. Took me a lot longer, however. What with the thoughts of our impending turf war with a gang of vampires and all. But before long, I finally began to feel my eyes get heavy. When, much to my surprise and mild panic, Tegan rolled over and put her arm around me. And there went the blushing, which got worse and worse as her arms slowly began to move up my body towards my chest. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. I repeated to myself over and over, biting my lip in frustration. Further and further her arm kept going, over my chest all the way to my neck. I squeezed my eyes shut, not knowing if she was doing this in her sleep or was awake and doing this on purpose. That was until I heard a loud snort as she shifted in her sleep, tightening her arm around my neck like a python as she did. Before I knew it, both her arms and legs were around me, pinning my arms in place and shutting off any chance oxygen had of reaching my lungs. Oh, I started to freak out. He can, uh, can't breathe, I wheezed in anguish, but to no avail. I tried thrashing around to wake her up. That didn't work either. T you're killing me, you crazy bitch, <laughs> I coughed in a barely audible voice once again. As I clenched my fist, I felt my fingernails were already pointed again, so I did the only thing I could think of. Knowing she could heal almost instantly, I dug several of them stiffly into her leg. Ouch! She shrieked, springing awake from the pain of me basically shanking her in the leg. What did you do that for? She yelled at me. You were going anaconda on my ass. I was about to die, you freaking psycho. I yelled back through my now extremely hoarse voice. That's when the door swung open, and Tony poked his head in, saying, Hey, everything okay? Whoa, oh, freaky, he said upon seeing the blood running down Tegan's exposed leg, and me coughing as I massaged my neck. Oh, my bad. Sorry to interrupt. I'll let you get back to it, he said as he began to close the door. Hey, wait. I shouted after him. Yep, he said, sticking his head back through the door. Can you give us a ride to the Vulcan statue tomorrow? I asked. Yeah, can do, he answered, without a fuss. Oh, um, thanks, I guess, I said, still trying to catch my breath. No problem. Just remember to use a safe word, he laughed, closing the door behind himself. What does this mean? Safe word? Tegan asked. Oh, God. I think he thinks we were... I'll be right back. I screamed, running out the door after him. We got dressed and headed to the statue the following afternoon. Rumbling and clanking along in Tony's worn-out work truck, I'm pretty sure I could actually hear it tearing a hole in the ozone layer as we went. Once we got there... Tegan took her time exploring and admiring the Colossus until her attention reserves ran dry and she decided she was hungry and nothing but Chinese would do. Lucky for us, there was a Chinese joint on our way back. Probably what put the idea in her head to begin with. So we stopped there and brought back food for everyone, including Hep, who was more than gracious. Oh, is this China King? he exclaimed, pillaging the small cardboard box of its contents. Where'd you guys go? He asked, slurping a long, low main noodle directly out of the container. Tony took us to see the Vulcan statue, I answered, trying to locate my own food in the box and handing Tegan hers as I did. Really? What'd you think? He prodded inquisitively. Well, it was cool and all, but I still can't figure out why they'd erect a huge idol of a Roman god right in the middle of the Bible Belt. I answered. Ah, this place was a center for the iron industry pool, he explained. And Vulcan is the god of iron and metal and fire and craftsmanship. If it weren't for the iron industry, and then later the steel industry, Alabama would never have thrived like this. He trailed off, seeing my look of skepticism at the word thrived. Okay, like it did. Well, 
It was doing okay for a little while. We were trying all right. Some of us are trying. Okay. This place sucks. He finished. Defeated. Well, what do you think of the actual statue, though? He added. Well, it was neat, but... But I wonder what it would have really looked like. I replied. Yeah, they never do get the face right. He said, taking his food and walking back to his shop as he spoke. What do you think he meant by that? I asked Tegan, who just shrugged her shoulders, her mouth full of rice and pepper steak. As we sat on the front porch eating our food, a black windowless van turned into the dirt road leading to the house. As it rolled toward us, Tony stood, picking up a rock that had been sitting on the porch next to him before throwing it over the house. After a couple of seconds, we heard a loud clang echo from the back as it struck the metal wall of one of the shipping containers, followed closely by... What the hell was that? Hep shouted over the subsiding ring of the impact. Tony, you little shit! Metal's here! Tony yelled back. A few moments of silence filled only by the approaching van passed before Hep came jogging around the corner of the house, shooting daggers at Tony. As he ran to meet the van where it stopped... Tegan and I both made our way off the porch to join them. Once we were there, the driver and passenger doors both opened, and two people stepped out. The passenger was a man with brown hair who looked to be in his late twenties or early thirties. The driver was a woman who looked to be about the same age, but was impossibly pale with equally stark white hair. They both wore the same black t-shirt and cargo pants with very out-of-place gold trim. Also. They both had a leather pouch on their side with what looked like a small gold bar inside. How you doing, Hep? The man from the van asked, in what sounded like a New York accent. Staying busy? He added. Ah, oh, just helping some poor unfortunate souls deal with some clot suckers, Hep said with a chuckle. Yeah, I heard. Kind of surprised the hotel approved this, especially as weird as they are about this medal, the man replied looking in our direction as he did. Guess they don't think it's a big deal to send one of us, he added. At least I didn't have to deal with that creepy bastard again. He keeps coming to the hotel to use the library, and I always end up having to escort him out. I had all I can take of this shit. What do you mean by hotel? I asked, walking around Hep to get closer to the man. Do you mean the guy we came to see before Hep? <laughs> all right. He began with a laugh. Most of you guys only ever meet the Makers. You might have heard of us as the, um, whatever that long name for the vampire control thing is. I can never remember what the damn thing's called. But, really, well, there's no such thing. Anytime someone learns about the vampire problem and gets a mind to do it, one of the existing members sees if they got what it takes to square up on one. Then they send them to the nearest person who can make them a weapon to kill them with. Give them this goofy certification card that don't actually mean shit. Well, turn them loose. The whole association is just a bunch of people running around hacking up vampires. It don't really get any deeper than that. Oh, so, um, so they're like the hunters in Supernatural. <laughs> That's epic, I exclaimed in excitement. You and Leslie will get along great. Oh, freaking nerds, he mumbled. But, yeah. Basically, and this is just one of the many services the hotel provides. And yeah, that ghoulish fuck is the primary weapon maker for this area. And he has access to our library, and it's the biggest in existence by well, a lot. Books from the places you don't even know exists, as far as you can see. It takes weeks to cross if you keep moving. And that weirdo has been spending a lot of time there the past year. Taking him through the library was one of my first jobs at the hotel, actually. The man went on. What means services? Tegan asked. Jeez, lady, where the hell are you from? The man teased. Services, you know, like all kinds of stuff. Mostly stuff to do with shit you call paranormal or supernatural, or in that general area. Usually anything worse than vampires, well, we take care of it. If it starts feeling froggy and decides to leave, he explained. But yeah, look... 
Could you guys get this shit out of the back? We got like ten rooms each to swap the sheets and vacuum and everything. So we gotta get moving. He added, checking his watch. About that time, his phone started to ring, and he removed it from his pocket and tapped the screen to answer. A loud, snide voice cracked out from the speaker. Yeah, yeah, they're here now. They're about to get it. Well, we're almost done, he yelled into the receiver. Greasy prick, he growled after ending the call. After removing several smaller than expected boxes from the back of the van, the man and his driver left, and Hep took to the shop to get back to work. The next few days consisted mostly of me and Tegan alternating between going on occasional refrigerator raids, watching Hep at work, dicking around on the internet, and going to the local movie theatre. It wasn't until during one of our check-in calls around the sixth day that I noticed everyone had started acting really weird. Like a kid that broke something and was hoping their parents didn't find out. They kept assuring me that nothing was wrong, but I could smell the bullshit through the phone. They didn't sound like they were in danger, but there was definitely some manner of fuckery afoot at the house. From that day on, every time I called to see how the finessing of Mark the Mark was going, they all still had the same evasive attitude, especially Milo. Like, the less I knew, the better. As you can imagine, this didn't make me the happiest of campers, and at that point I was getting more and more anxious to get back and solve the mystery of the lying ass werewolf and his band of merry shitheads. As the final day approached, the night before, Tegan and I were laying in bed. Tegan was dead to the world already, but I was still awake, anxious about what shenanigans we'd be returning to. We'd both agreed to sleep foot to face after the semi-erotic asphyxiation incident, so she was on the opposite end, squeezing the life out of her poor pillow and cutting off the circulation to one of my feet. While I was lying there, scrolling through my phone, taking brief intermissions to gush at the Esmeralda-esque monster that was now attempting to gnaw on my ankle, over the whirs and clangs of machinery from the shop, I heard something tapping on the window to our room. Thinking it was just Tony messing with us again, like he had been the last week and a half every chance he got, I stood up from the bed to tell him to fuck off. By the time I reached the window, the tapping had already stopped, and I wasn't able to see anyone through the blinds. Cursing Tony under my breath, I turned to go back to bed. But before I could take so much as a step, the door was broken clean off its hinges, crashing against me as it flew across the room. As I stumbled back into the window, I could only just see, illuminated by the dim light of the table lamp, the vampire walk into the room with us. Before I could take any kind of move, the glass behind me erupted into a million pieces as two arms from outside wrapped around my neck, attempting to drag me out through the window. I kicked and swatted at the bed, trying to get Tegan's attention and alert her to the approaching danger as the thing in the room stalked towards her softly stirring body, game face on and open for business. As my vision began to darken from the lack of oxygen, I reached up and grabbed the creature's arms in an attempt to free my airway, at least a little. As I grabbed on and squeezed, I could hear bones beginning to pop and break. Oh God! It's going to break my neck, I cried inside my head. But then I realized the noise wasn't coming from me. As I squeezed harder, I heard the retort of more bones breaking and beginning to splinter beneath the skin. Holy shit, I forgot. Vampire strength, bitches. I suddenly remembered out loud. Then I realized that my fingernails had grown back to points, and since I'd been using the heavy-duty wire cutters to clip them, they had to be sturdy enough to... Well. Pulling down hard with both hands, I yanked the monster's arms free from my neck, and as I turned to face it, swatted across its face as hard as I could. Well, it took me a second to process that half the thing's face was now missing, but it took me even longer to realize where it had gone. Hearing a familiar sucking, slurping sound, 
I looked down at my hand to confirm what the warm, wet, wriggling sensation had been. As I lowered my eyes, I found myself looking down at an eyeball still attached to half a face, darting around in all directions as the tongue, which was hanging off the body mass by a thin strip of flesh, was giving its best effort to suck in anything that got too close. It wasn't until the eye made contact with mine and made what I assumed to be a scowl did the whole thing sink in. Oof. Oof. I started to yell, shaking the hand that contained the disgusting mess as fast as I could in a desperate attempt to shake it loose. It was about that time that the other vampire had taken notice and stopped to observe the confusion. What the fuck? It said, looking from me, who was slinging blood, small chunks of face meat and teeth across the room, to its critically injured accomplice. Noticing the lull in activity, I kicked the frame for the bed as hard as I could manage, jostling Tegan fully awake. Wake up! Vampires! I screamed at her as she sprang up. But that's all I had time to do before the one in the room grabbed me by the hair and threw me into the hallway. As soon as I hit the wall, I only had time to yell, Teague, look out, before two more rushed into the room after her. I tried to run in behind them, but the goddamn thing had already pinned me to the floor, trying to sink its teeth into my throat. Luckily, this time, I was at least strong enough to hold it back. Suddenly, I heard Teague shriek from inside the room. I tried to see over the snapping, snarling ghoul's shoulder, was only able to hear more screams and tearing noises coming from the room. The distraction allowed the vampire to gain the upper hand, and it was now only inches from my skin. And just in that moment, the room went silent. A body burst through the wall, crumpling into a broken heap on the floor. A split second later, what looked like a rabid beast rushed from the cavity, clamping its jaws down over the stunned intruder's head. It was Tegan. She'd managed to change just in time, but she was barely comparable to what she'd looked like as a wolf the first time I'd seen her. She was around her normal human height, but that's the only thing remotely recognizable. Thin and ragged like a stray dog on the verge of starvation, the once brilliant thick black fur was now matted and grey. As she bit down even harder, I could hear the thing's skull fracture and begin to crumble under the pressure before she started to shake the creature like some wretched chew toy. As she thrashed, snatching the thing back and forth, I could still hear her vicious snarls over the sound of the body's pulverized limbs pounding over and over against the floor. And the horrible shrieking and squealing cries of pure agony before its neck finally gave way. The rest of its body bounced off the wall, the face's muscles still convulsing under the crushing weight of Tegan's maw. It was here when I realized that my own struggle had stopped altogether, as both me and the vampire had stopped and were watching the carnage, paralyzed by terror. As she let the severed head fall to the debris and gore-covered floor and lowered her gaze on us, I heard the vampire whisper to itself. No, 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 it said as it abandoned its hold on me and sprinted full speed down the hall. As it reached the end, before Tegan could even begin her pursuit, the fleeing monster's head exploded into chunks of brain and bone. Whoa, did you guys see that? Hep said, stepping from round the corner, a large medieval-looking mace resting on his shoulder. Sorry, I got here as soon as I heard all the rip-roaring. Oh, this is yours, by the way, he added, tossing the bloodied weapon at my feet. You might want to go ahead and whack the rest of them before they start pulling themselves back together, he finished, gesturing towards the mangled, twitching bodies. Head or heart works best. Grabbing the mace, I staggered to my feet. Then, working up every ounce of courage in my body, I turned to face Tegan. I know now, 
and I knew then that she was on my side. But this wasn't like the time in the woods, not even a little. I couldn't not be terrified of her like this. We're deeply programmed as a species to be deathly afraid of desperate, savage predators, and at that moment she was the living embodiment of a dread more primal and ancient than even the worst of our fears. More than drowning, more than burning, something about having a thing like that do what it just did, then looking you in the eyes, that just makes them all pale in comparison. You... You good, tea? I asked, to the point of nearly whimpering, as I inched closer and closer. Suddenly, the body she'd thrown through the wall jerked, and no sooner than it did, than Tegan snapped down on its arm and slammed its head, which had already begun to reattach itself, into the floor before slinging the eviscerated mass at my feet. Instinctually, I lifted the mace and brought it down on its head. The hall, so saturated with blood already that bludgeoning the vampire's head into oblivion hardly made a noticeable difference. I could hear Tegan's heavy breath behind me as her footsteps grew closer and closer till I could feel the hot air crawling across my neck. I closed my eyes as my legs trembled. Then I heard her turn and walk back into the bedroom, returning soon after dragging the bodies of the remaining two vampires with her. Understanding the gesture, I bashed in their heads as well, before letting the heavy club drop to the floor with a loud clang and slid my back down the wall, resting on the least gore-strewn spot in the hallway. Oh, must have fired you all back here, Hep said, breaking the silence and causing my body to convulse in fright. Eh, I figured that might happen at some point. He continued, as he made his way back out of the hall, kicking a skull fragment out of the way as he went. Forcing myself back onto my feet, I grabbed my newly acquired vampire whacking stick and began to follow him, hearing the clatter of Tegan's claws on the tile as she walked on all fours behind me. Yeah, guess they knew what this place was, because they sure as hell called in the reserves on this one, Hep spoke to us as he went. What the shit does that even mean? I asked, finally catching up to him at the door. But he didn't answer. He just grinned as he opened the front door and stepped through it. The front yard was in every sense of the phrase an absolute war zone. Bodies littered the grass and everything else in sight. Large swathes of visceral spatter stained the entire area. Disembodied arms and legs were found far from any cadaver they might have belonged to. Smaller patches of grey chunks and crimson fluid were, what I assumed must have once been the heads. Bloody corpses hung from the tree limbs, and off the side of the porch, and even one that had been impaled on the arm of one of Tony's perverse stick figures. Oh, what the f... I began to say, but was cut off. No, oh, shh. Hep said, putting a single finger over my lips, which, for some reason, I reflexively snapped at. Look, he said more sternly, everything's fine now. That was likely every bloodsucker except the liars for a hundred miles or so. And using that Dracula strength kicked your ass a lot more than you think. You don't got the metabolism or the physiology to handle that kind of horsepower, so you're going to be hurting for a while once the adrenaline wears off. He explained, in his usual calm, patient voice. Now you and Ginger Snaps, go get yourselves cleaned up and get some rest. Me and Tony are going to take care of all this. But, how did you... I tried to ask again, but was shooed back into the house before he closed the door behind us. Then I realized that I was alone in the house with Tegan in what I figured to be some half or semi-formed version of her full wolf self still hadn't lost much of its terrifying potency. So, I said, turning to face her. You gonna change back now, War? I asked in as gentle a tone as I could muster. But she just huffed and shook her head in response. Um, okay then. 
I guess maybe we should get all this vampire juice off of you. And me, well, us. I suggested, looking down at my own blood-spattered shirt, arms and legs. To this she nodded and started to make her way to the shower. Following behind her, I only made a few attempts to tiptoe around the gore caked up and down the hall before giving up and trudging through it. I retrieved some clean clothes from my bag and joined Tegan in the bathroom. Luckily, the shower was commodious enough to fit us both and Hep had great water pressure so it didn't take too long to clean the funk out of Tegan's fur and my hair. After we dried off, I began to contemplate how we were going to get back through the carnage in the hallway. But as I opened the bathroom door, nothing. The hall was spotless, minus the gaping hole in the wall and the craters caused by the heavy blows from the mace being swung onto the floor as I played vampire whack-a-mole. But other than that, it was completely clean. Not a speck of blood or a piece of bone to be found. <sighs> you know what? I don't even care anymore, I said, throwing my hands up in defeat as I looked at Tegan, who seemed equally bewildered with her head cocked to the side. Goddamn weird-ass place, I mumbled, as I picked up mine and Tegan's bags that had been left in the hall under a note that said, Didn't have time to fix the holes. Use my room. It's the one at the end. Tegan and I both looked at each other for a second, and with a shrug, both headed to the door at the far end of the abnormally long hall. As I opened the door, it made an obnoxious creak that echoed on for what seemed like forever into the darkness. Perplexed, I tried feeling around the wall for a light switch, but couldn't seem to find one. So, I took a step in to see if it was a little further down the side of the wall, but as I did, the room blazed to life as actual fire torches began to light themselves as I entered. A dull glow, revealing a massive stone chamber, full to the brim with art from every period, similar to the living room, but a hundred times so. There were life-size bronze statues and masterpiece paintings and furniture carved from fine marble alongside open chests filled with gold and jewels. Fine fabrics and furs were draped everywhere. Barrels filled with spears and racks cluttered with ancient saws and axes sat on top of huge, intricate Persian rugs. All of this surrounded the centerpiece of the room, which was the most beautiful canopy bed I'd ever laid eyes on. Tegan and I both stood in total stillness for several minutes with our mouths hanging wide open in awe before I just gave up. <laughs> Fuck it. I said, strolling into the massive room, tossing mine and Tegan's bags on the bed before flopping down onto it myself. About the time I decided to shut my eyes and attempt to sleep, I heard Tegan's low, guttural growl, followed by a series of metallic sounds. Tink, tink, scree. Tink, tink, scree. The noises went as they got closer and closer. Opening my eyes, I saw what looked to be a metal tripod. Two of its legs would take a step before dragging what I realized to be my mace up behind it with its third leg. Tink, tink, scree. Tink, tink, scree. The noise stopped as it finally reached me, dropping the heavy metal handle at my side. Uh, how about that? Thanks, I said, patting the autonomous metal structure where its head might possibly be before flopping back down into the pile of pillows. Tink, 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 tink. I heard as the thing scuttled its way back into some dark corridor. Well, I guess this is just my life now, I thought to myself as I felt Tegan crawl her way up onto the huge, extravagant bed beside me. After what only seemed like a few minutes, I was being shaken awake by Hep's voice. Hey-ho, Dracula. Yours and Ginger Snaps is right as here, he said, increasing the ferocity of the shaking. Oh, yeah, I'm awake. Oh, shit, I exclaimed, trying to pull the blanket up over my face. Ah, oh, hard way it is. Get her, boys, he said, snapping his fingers. 
And at that signal, a chorus of ting, 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 from all directions surrounded the bed as I began to feel myself being lifted off the soft mattress. As the blanket slid off my face, I realized I was being carried out by a troop of the metal tripods. I looked back to see an equally confused Tegan and our bags close behind. As I cleared the door, which another tripod had scuttled her head to open, I heard Tony call out from the roof. Fly, my pretties, fly, fly, he yelled, looking down at us and waving his arms around comically, wearing an old black costume witch hat. Oh, did he really have that hat ready? I asked myself as I was hauled off the porch to the thuds of metal legs, which dampened to soft patter as they made their way across the grass. My eyes finally met Cherise's, who was leaning out of the window of her SUV, glasses pulled down and mouth agape, but with a hint of a grin on her cheeks as she watched the spectacle in amusement. It wasn't until Tegan passed through the doorway that her expression flipped like a switch. Whoa! What the hell's that? she exclaimed, pointing at the mass of fur, teeth and claws being carted along by the metallic minions. Oh, that would be Tegan, I explained as the tripods dumped me onto the grass in front of her vehicle. Well, good thing my windows are illegal level tinted, she chuckled. It wasn't until I finally tried to stand that I realized my whole body ached like someone had tried to double down on beating me half to death with a sack of oranges. As I managed to hoist myself up by propping my arm against Cherise's SUV, she asked, Something happened? You look like hell. Oh, do I? Because, oh, I feel great, I responded as my legs tried to give out underneath me. Uh, yeah, we had a bit of um, vampire drama last night. Oh, the bodies. I frantically began to search the yard for any sign of the chaos from the previous night. About the time I heard a pong sound as Tony, still wearing the witch hat, pulled the decapitated body down that had been impaled on his inappropriate architecture. He then gave us a wave as he proceeded to drag the body behind the house. Um, yeah, some vampire drama last night. It got pretty rough and Tegan had to hulk up to get us out of trouble, I finished. Oh my god, are you okay? You're not hurt, are you? Cherise cried, jumping out of her vehicle and looking me over. I'm fine, I'm fine, I groaned, swatting her away. Just saw, that's all. About that time, patter, 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 thud before a sharp pain shot up my leg. One of the tripods had dropped my heavy, solid metal mace right onto my foot. Ah, oh, you... I screamed as I reared back and kicked it away with my bare foot, causing a loud clang to ring across the yard. Ah, oh, goddammit, I wailed, dropping to my knees and clutching my foot in agony. The metal tripod bounced a few times before righting itself and it scurried around in a circle before making its final dash towards the house. It was then that I noticed a few more of them were marching our way with a wooden crate, accompanied by Hep. Ah, Hepatitis! Cherise yelled as she noticed him coming our way, causing him to slide to a stop. Oh, no, no. What the hell are you doing here? Hep screamed back at her. Does she know where I am? Ah, don't be silly, Therese answered back. Adeline doesn't even know I'm making this stop. She's looking for you, though, Hep. You old softy. Oh, is that why she's going by now? Well, she can keep looking. Don't you dare tell her where I am, or I swear on everything you love. I'll oh, make sure you wake up every morning to that prosthetic leg kicking its way up your ass, he scolded. Um... What are you not telling us? I asked Hep quietly. He leaned into my ear and whispered, You need to treat people nice. Stop calling me that. I don't even like it when she does it. He yelled at Cherise right next to my head, causing me to flinch. Everything you need is in that crate. Have fun. 
He finished before shooting Clarice a sharp look and making his way back towards his shop, his metal tripods following close behind in single file. Now, it's worth saying right now that I had every intention of asking Clarice about how they knew each other and what Hep's story really was, but embarrassingly enough, I have to admit that I passed out just about as soon as me and Tegan both managed to crawl into the back seat. I didn't wait back up until she was pushing my shoulder in Gage Egg's driveway. Hey, hey, your friends all just ran back into the house when they saw me pull in. I think something might be up, she said. Oh, God. What do you mean something? Oh, those sons of bitches. I knew they were hiding something. I yelled, snapping up into an upright position, causing both Charisse and Tegan to jump as I did. We'd all forgotten to tell them we were on our way back, so they didn't know when we'd be getting here. We caught them by surprise. Pushing the SUV's door open, I jumped out and started to make a mad dash for the front door. Tegan, grab the bags and shit. I was about to tell her before I remembered that she was in somewhat of a hairy situation. Okay, wait. Maybe you might want to pull up a bit closer so she can get inside a bit quicker. I yelled back at Cherise, still in the driver's seat. Blasting through the front door, everyone seemed to be almost picturesque in their stillness. Not even allowing the commotion of me virtually kicking the door off its hinges to draw their attention. Alright, I want to know what you fuckers are up to, and I want to know now. I exclaimed at the painfully guilty group. Oh, you're back. We didn't know you were on your way. Um, did you get everything you... Uh... Jasmine started, but I cut her off. No, someone's going to tell me what's going on. I screamed across the room. I want to know why every single one of you looks like you just shit the bed. Um, yeah, let's... let me, um, explain... Trey began to speak, but stopped as the side entrance opened up and Cherise stepped in, followed by a very haggard-looking Wolf Tegan. Oh, what the hell, baby? Milo cried out as he ran across the room to hug her. What happened? You know that's bad for you. He went on as he held her canine face in his hands, placing his forehead against hers. Oh, come on. Let's get you somewhere where you can rest. No. I exclaimed, grabbing the collar of his shirt and lifting him off the ground as he tried to walk away. Unshitting the bed first. Then that, I said to the rest of the room, as the tips of his shoes barely brushed the floor. Um, okay, but promise you won't get mad, Dex said sheepishly. I'm already mad, dumbass, I yelled, turned to face Dex, which caused Milo to swing softly like a coat on anger. Is someone there? Oh, please, God, if someone's there, get help! A voice cried from the garage. Oh, God. Did you assholes kidnap Mark? I said it again even louder when the room remained silent. Who's Mark? Therese asked, currently struggling to help Wolf Tegan find somewhere to rest. The Mark, I answered, Milo still dangling from my hand. The who? What are you saying to me? She asked again. Well, it's funny you should ask. You see these fuckwits? I exclaimed, using Milo as a pointer as I gestured to the rest of the room's occupants. We're supposed to be running a con on this guy, Mark, while me and Tegan were shacked up with that mad scientist getting the weapons made, I explained as I shot pissy looks at everyone in the room. For fuck's sake, if someone is out there, please help me, the voice pleaded again. Oh my god, did you guys really kidnap somebody? Cherise asked with audible concern now in her voice. Ah, it's starting to look that way, I growled making my way towards the garage, dragging Milo along the floor behind me. I could hear everyone else begin to scurry to follow me as I stomped through the house and snatched open the garage door to reveal a man bound to one of the steel support beams by a bike lock looped around his neck. Oh, 
now, what in the goddamn Breaking Bad hell is this shit? I screamed at everyone. Oh, thank God. You, girl, please get me out of this. I won't tell anyone anything, I swear. Just let me go. Ma begged as soon as he saw me. Oh, wow. You guys really kidnapped someone. Jerry spoke up from the back of the group, attempting to help Tegan get close enough to witness the spectacle herself. All right, look, Milo shouted, standing up off the floor and straightening his shirt. I tried it the way we planned, okay? He was just smarter than we all thought. My facade was seamless, but uh, he saw through it. No, it wasn't, Mark said from his pole in the garage. I was on to him after like a day. God, he's the worst actor I've ever seen. Shut your liar mouth, Milo shouted, trying to make his way around me to get to Mark. Just admit that I had you fooled. You literally asked me where the vampires hide out like six hours after we met. How stupid can you be? Mark snickered. If you were smart, you'd have tried to befriend me slowly and, and gradually hint at wanting to get in on something more profitable and off the books. <laughs> Dipshit. Oh, dear God. I sighed, rubbing my temples to calm the building migraine. None of you here were watching him or giving him advice or anything? Well... None of us have exactly run a con before, Dex responded. Hey, don't look at me, Gay Jake said once I turned to him. I'm just the sugar daddy here. I ain't these little hooligans babysitter. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, well, have you at least got anything out of him yet? I asked. Not exactly, Leslie answered. He hasn't been very cooperative since he got here. Well, I suggested we don't feed him. And when he gets hungry enough, he'll tell us something. But, um, what's her face? The short one, Milo said, pointing at Joanna. She said, oh, we can't do that, it's torture. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. Because it is torture, you unbearable ass. Jonah yelled back at Milo, swatting his hand away. Oh, dear Lord, child, I have been dealing with this ever since you left. Gay Jake complained to me. They've been at each other's throats 24-7. My anxiety medication is running way too low for any more of their shit, he said, pulling Joanna away from Milo and positioning her at the other side of the room, where we'd gathered and were now staring into the garage. So we don't know anything, I started, but was interrupted by Mark yelling over me. So you going to let me out or what? He screamed desperately. Hey, shut it. One more word and I feed you to Tegan, I replied. I... who's... what's a Tegan? He asked nervously. Tegan managed to raise her head up over the crowd to investigate the mention of her name. Mark took one look and hit full till panic. Oh, oh what the fuck is that? What the... Uh, he gagged as he temporarily forgot he was attached at the neck to the support pole and snatched his feet out from under him as he made an attempt at fleeing the sight of Tegan. Everyone took a moment to giggle a bit as Mark sat resting against the pole, trying to catch his breath. Yeah, he hasn't said a word that wasn't him complaining about something, Milo said. Every single one of us took turns questioning him, but he'd just belch in our face or pull his pants down and sit on the floor while we were talking, he added, and everyone murmured in agreement, sharing their own personal Mark interrogation horror story. Well, um, maybe if I give it a try, help, I began to suggest. But Mark interrupted me again. I'm not telling you shit about shit, so, so you might as well let me go, you dumb cunt. Now, I think we're all aware that some people have that one word, that one particular word that, when you call them that, all bets are off. It misses the skin entirely and goes straight for your very last nerve. Well, Mark had managed to springboard off of my good graces directly onto my last nerve with that one. So just keep that in mind before you judge me for what I'm about to tell you, okay? You, um, you uh, want to run that by me again there, Chief? I said, after taking as deep a breath as possible. I said, you might as well turn me loose, you dumb cunt. I ain't telling you, dick, he spat at me. Hmm, okay guys, I'm uh, just going to need a minute here with our guest, I hummed to the group, 
Now all quiet as church mice. Just one minute. I assured them, stepping into the garage and closing the door behind me as gingerly as possible. Oh, so scary. I still ain't telling you shit. Anyway, you know what those suckers would do if they found out I talked? Mark said, sniping. Oh, you like Mother Goose? I asked him, still facing the door. Mother what? Mark asked back. Mother Goose, you know, the nursery rhymes, I asked again, now turning to face him, grinning my biggest grin and licking the points of my teeth that I noticed had been getting longer and sharper over the last few seconds. And on that, all the colour and snideness left Mark's face as his eyes widened. I didn't have to take more than about half a step in his direction before the information superhighway was open for business. His eyes were wide as dinner plates, and he started singing like a bird. What do you want to know? I'll tell you where they are. I'll tell you where they go, where they live, where they deal. Where my girlfriend lives, where my mama lives, her social security number. She's got great credit. Anything. I'll tell you anything. But you haven't answered my first question. Do you like Mother Goose? The rage autopilot that had taken over me asked once more. I don't know what you're talking about, lady. He cried. Oh, everyone knows Mother Goose. My parents, before they started beating me raw every day, used to tell me the rhyme every night before I went to sleep. I cooed softly, still slowly making my way towards him. What, you some kind of dyke or something? He said, apparently deciding to roll off one exposed nerve and onto another. After closing my eyes and taking another deep breath, I walked up to him and took his right hand in mine. They'd hold my hand just like this. Then they'd count my fingers. This little piggy went to market, I sang. What the hell are you doing? He whined, trying to pull his hand away without success. I continued squeezing his hand tighter. This little piggy stayed home. This little piggy got roast beef. And this little piggy here. Well, this little piggy right here... Snap! I snatched his hand up to my mouth and bit his pinky off before he had time to flinch. As he rolled around and screamed, clutching his bleeding hand, I took the time to chew the detached digit up, savouring every crunchy sensation, surprised that it wasn't anywhere near as unpleasant as I'd expected. The crowd in the house had begun to beat on the door and tried to twist the lock knob to get in and examine the commotion, but as that went on, I leaned down next to the now sobbing Mark. I spoke into his ear. Nine little piggies left, Mark. Now here's a situation. I ask you something, you give me an answer. If it checks out, I come back and make your time here a little more comfortable after every question. If it doesn't, well, I've recently acquired a taste for little piggy. Understand. I unlocked the door and made my way out of the garage as everyone else poured in behind me. I told Charisse that she could leave right after I got our bags and the box out of her SUV. So we helped Tegan to hers and Milo's room upstairs, and then went out to get our things from the car. He said you ate his finger! Joanna shrieked in my face as I walked back through the back door. Slanderous lies! I lied, grinning a dishonest grin now that I felt my teeth seemingly back to normal. He said you ate his finger? Milo said retrieving a first aid kit from the kitchen cabinet. Oh, nice, he added, giving me a thumbs up, causing him to fumble the kit across the living room floor. I used the distraction to sidestep Joanna and search for a place to set the heavy pine battle box. No engage egg would bury me alive if I broke his favorite table again. <laughs> Long story. I just plopped it down on the couch and watched gravity slowly pull it deep down into the plush cushions. Okay, you can hit the road now if you want. I'll well, stay and rest for a while if you prefer, I told Charisse as she came in with mine and Tegan's bags. Oh, I appreciate that, but I think I might want to make my way out of the hostage situation as soon as possible, she said with a laugh. But maybe I can say goodbye to Tegan before I go, she asked. I think she'd like that very much, I answered with a smile as I turned to lead her back up to the room. Milo was already on the bed next to her, both arms around her hairy shoulders comforting her as she breathed heavily, 
as if she were exhausted and trying to catch her breath. I stood at the door as Charisse walked over to the bed and put her arms around her shoulders with Milo. It was so nice to meet you, she whispered. I hope to see you again sometime, when you feel better. As I walked her to her car, we stopped next to Gage Ake on the way out. Well, Tegan's phone got the fair notification, but, but it should pop up on your email in your recent charges, Cherie said, waving her phone with the Cerber app open on the screen. Oh, the return trip was on me, so that should help with the cost a lot. Oh, honey, that shouldn't be a problem. You just go on and get yourself home safe now, you hear? He said as he pulled out his own phone and started checking his mails. Cherise had already told me by and was out the door when he found the email. What? Are you kidding me? How much? Oh God, I think I'm gonna throw up. Girl, hold on to me. My legs are going numb. He cried to me as he looked at the charge to his account. Things finally settled down after they patched up Mark's hand and Gage Ake managed to recover from the six-digit Cerber fare charge. We all agreed that we'd all discuss everything and get caught up, but first we'd open our lethal Christmas presents to take the edge off. Who doesn't like opening stuff, right? So we all gathered around the couch where the pine box rested. As I opened the lid, my mace was sitting on top, so I removed it and handed it to Trey, who almost dropped it from the sudden unexpected weight. Oh, shit! That looked a lot lighter when you were holding it, he grunted, setting it off to the side with a dull thud. The rest of the weapons were all wrapped in thick brown paper, woven in amongst a web of old-fashioned packing straw. Each had a small white card with the owner's name written on it, except one which came with what looked like an entire note wrapped around it. Knowing that could only belong to Dex, I decided to avoid that one as long as possible. First I picked up trays and handed it to him to unwrap. As I matched the names to the owners and handed them out, Milo finally came downstairs to join the rest of us. Hey, where's mine? He complained. You're a werewolf, remember? Your part in the plan is to maim and cause chaos as a giant wolf monster, and then we use the weapons, I replied. Yes, yeah, stupid, Joanna quipped. Okay, seriously, what is it with you two? I asked as they both cut their eye at one another. Oh, here's yours, Dex, with a paper around it, I said, finally handing Dex his as he tore off the note and began to read it. As he did, you could see the expression on his face change to one of a child being scolded by his parents. What's it say? Jasmine asked from beside me. Nothing, Dex responded, trying to ball the paper up and stuff it in his pocket. But Trey managed to wrestle it away and read it out loud. Dear Dex, I have no idea what you expected me to do with the picture you sent, so I made a judgment call. I hope it's to your liking. Also, I can tell you you're not the sharpest knife in the drawer, so please try to refrain from doing anything too stupid that might get your friends hurt during this uh, little endeavor of yours. Signed, your good buddy, Hep. Wow, that was pretty spot on, Trey giggled tossing the piece of paper over his shoulder. Now look, y'all gonna have to clean all this up, Gay Jake said, walking into the living room and retrieving the note off the floor. He gestured to the packing straw scattered everywhere. I mean it, not a single one left on the floor. Anyway, how's Tegan doing? I asked Milo. Oh, she's gonna be okay, he sighed. It's just gonna take her a few days to get back to her normal self. She just needs to get enough food and water and have some peace and quiet. Oh, and uh, she's probably going to need a bathroom to herself while her body metabolizes all the extra werewolf mass, he added. Oh, good. I was worried about her, I said as everyone started unwrapping their packages. Dex managed to get into his first, revealing a dagger of sorts, but shaped like a pistol. Ah, close enough, I guess, he said, examining the curious object. Trey opened his next. His contained a small axe, or a tomahawk, I think it's called. Then Leslie, who unwrapped what I immediately recognized as something that looked starkly similar to the demon killing knife from Supernatural. Everyone else apparently noticed too, as that show was one of the things we all shared a bond over. We always get together on Thursdays to catch new episodes. Really? I asked, sarcastically. 
I um, couldn't think of anything else. Plus, well, I always wanted one, she said as her face turned red. Joanna went after her. The package she opened contained a very plain-looking object. It seemed to be a spike with three sides and two large discs on the top and bottom of the handle. What the hell is that? Trey asked her. It's a rondel, Joanna answered. Well, I was watching History Channel the day before they left and I saw one on there, so I decided that's what I wanted. Fair enough, Trey said, turning to Jasmine, who was the only one who hadn't opened hers yet. As she tore through the paper, it sounded like something was clanging together inside the wrapping. When she finally moved the last shreds of paper out of the way, we could all see that there was, in fact, two separate pieces. It looked like a spear that you could take apart, but there were also symbols that seemed familiar as well. What are those engravings? Dex spoke up. Oh, well, you guys know my dad was a Polynesian, right? Well, they're the same as my tattoo, Jasmine said, pulling the collar of her t-shirt to the side to show us the traditional Polynesian tattoo on her shoulder. The spear is supposed to look like a Polynesian one, too, she added proudly. How did that guy make all of this so fast? Trey asked. It seems like a lot for such a short time. This doesn't look like he just half-assed it. Well, this stuff is really nice, he added, closely inspecting his new axe. Well, I don't think he's your run-of-the-mill guy, I said to Trey, remembering all the strange events from my time at his home. It was as I remembered that I noticed another piece of paper sticking out from the packing straw. So I reached down and slid it out. It was another note that read, Thank you two for the company. I like Tony just fine, but he's, well, Tony. I haven't had visitors in a while, so it was nice to have you guys around. So, to thank you, please accept this small token of my gratitude. Just remember to oil it up every now and then, and that they like to rest in dark spaces like corners and attics. They make a hell of a security system and automatically know who is and ain't supposed to be somewhere. They can lift and support about 4,000 pounds, so don't be afraid to push it. I feel like it'll be helpful sooner than you might think. Thanks again. Don't be a stranger. Hep. What the hell is he talking about? Milo asked. It didn't occur to me at first, but by the time it did, before I could form the words to explain, one of the metal tripods from Hep's house erupted from the box, scattering packing straw everywhere as it did. It hit the floor with a loud metallic clang. Everyone in the room came about three inches off the ground all at once, and then stood in shock, staring at the thing as it shifted in place, seemingly taking in its new environment. Seconds later, it bolted, scurrying around the room like lightning, its metal legs pounding on the carpet floor as it went. Dum, 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 we heard as it bounced off walls and furniture, trying to make its way around the room. Dex climbed up on the back of the couch like a cat when it started to get too close to him. Suddenly, it stopped in the centre of the room for a moment. Then it took off over the couch, causing Dex to squeal and dive to the floor. And down the hall it went before ricocheting off the back wall and cutting a hard left into the open garage door. Ah, oh, what the fuck is that? What the fuck's going on in this house? We heard Mark shriek. We all paused for a moment before cackling in laughter. <laughs> oh, God. I'll explain later, I giggled. And you guys might want to all keep these things close, I added, as they all inspected their new toys. Look, uh, me and Tegan had a serious run-in last night before we came back. That's why she is like she is right now, so we need to keep ready just in case. Oh, I hope they kick the doors in and eat every last one of you freaks, Mark yelled from the garage, followed by the ting 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 whoop ting 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 noise of the tripod smacking Mark quiet on our behalf and then retreating back into its corner. Okay, I'm already starting to light that thing, Milo said with a smile. You would, Joanna barked at him. Eat me, he responded. Look, shut up or I'm locking you both in there with Mark, I warned. Now, like I said, we have to be careful because those vampires are looking for us hard and it's real easy to not pay attention and lead them back here. After that, we all spent several hours discussing what happened at Hep's house, what to do with Mark, and what to do once we figured out where the vampires were. 
Once we reached the end of the conversation, we all decided to depart to our own rooms for the night. As I started to make my way up the stairs, Kate Jake stopped me. Not you, sugar tits. You stay down here with me for a second, he ordered. So I kissed Jasmine on the forehead and told her I'd be up soon, before walking back over to Gay Jake. Hey, you too, American werewolf in my guest room, Gay Jake added. Get your ass back down here. Oh, Milo's in trouble, Joanna quipped before Milo chucked one of the pillows off the couch directly at her head. All right, Gay Jake began. You said that you fixed her, he said, jamming a finger into Milo's sternum. So why is she getting Wonder Woman strong and eating people's fingers in my garage? Well, um, I thought I did, Milo explained. But I never actually tried it before. Never heard of anyone trying it really, just <laughs> kind of took a shot in the dark. Are you serious? You weren't even sure that it would work? I yelled, stomping towards him. Well, I, uh, I mean, I think it worked. It kind of did, at least, he stuttered. Well, if it worked, then why is her shitty attitude getting even shittier and monstery? Gay Jake asked him. Um, not really sure. I guess it's possible that the vampire virus might have mingled with my werewolf antibodies while it was still in its infectious phase, and, and that changed the pathology of both of them, and... Maybe she ended up getting Michael Corvin somehow, Milo guessed. Who is Michael Corvin? Gay Jake asked. Oh yeah, the um, blue guy from Underworld. Milo and I answered simultaneously. So, you think I might be um, part werewolf now? I asked Milo. Well, you might be. Can't say for sure. There hasn't really been a whole lot of in-depth scientific studies on the interaction between vampire and werewolf DNA, well, as you might imagine. But your eyebrows have got pretty thick since you left, and you don't exactly look as frail as when we first met. But, well, that might be because I was seven foot tall and you had pee running down your leg, he teased. Jesus, okay, look, you don't eat people, and you, you be nice, Gay Jake said pointing to me and Milo. Now I'm tired and I just want to go to bed. You get that little metal thing to keep watch down here if you want, but it better be hey, he continued. Why the hell am I telling the werewolf to be nice and her not to eat people? What is happening to my home? He said to himself as he walked away. He mumbled more to himself, but I couldn't make it out once he'd reached the stairs. Then me and Milo both made our own walks up the stairs together. Once we made sure the tripod was making its rounds and the garage door was shut and locked. Oh god, I can't believe you actually ate that guy's finger. Milo whispered to me as we climbed the staircase. That was pretty epic. Oh, please stop talk about it. I don't want to think about having a dude's chewed up finger sitting in my stomach. I begged. Yeah, well, it's still got the fingernail and everything too. Ooh, that's pretty gross. He joked with a grin knowing exactly what he was doing. What if that was his favorite nose-picking finger? Ugh, oh, God, I said, covering my mouth and bolting for the bathroom. I made it just in time to explode the contents of my belly into the toilet yet again. I made sure my eyes were closed tight to keep from seeing the mangled digit. That's payback for throwing me around like an action figure, Milo said, leaning against the doorway. Yeah, fair enough, I sighed resting my head in my hands. Then I heard the sink run as Milo dampened a towel with cold water and gave it to me to put on my head. I thanked him as I took it and pressed it against my forehead. I remember thinking at the time that he was starting to grow on me. He might be an idiot and clown, but he was like the big brother I'd always wanted. Okay, get yourself cleaned up, then go see Jasmine. She's been missing you ever since you left. It's just about all she's talked about, he told me before making his way out of the bathroom. Hey, do you believe in werewolves, Doctor? I asked as he started to leave. He paused for a second. Well, I believe a man, lost in the maze of his own mind, may imagine that he's anything. He finished the quote before glancing over his shoulder and smiling back at me. 
There's something about that moment, in the realization that a real-life werewolf had seen the Wolfman so many times that he could quote it, brought me all kinds of joy. He then made his way around the corner and out of my sight. Ugh, I burped loudly, almost puking again. <sighs> Listen to them, I heard Milo call from down the hall. Children of the night, what a music are they made? He said in his best Dracula impression, which was surprisingly good. Once I got my shit together, I finally made it to the bedroom. I barely had time to open the door before Jasmine lunged at me, wrapping her arms and legs around me and burying her face in my chest as she did. Oh my god, finally, she exclaimed. Oh, I missed you so much. Well, I'm back now, I said, blushing as I returned her embrace. We laid on the bed for hours, talking about everything that had happened while we were apart. But it's at this point that I've decided to let Gay Jake take over this section of the story. For reasons you'll understand soon. Oh, hi y'all. This is Gay Jake, and I'm going to be telling you this stuff on account of the ornery bitch that's been telling it don't actually remember this part. Oh, I'm not exactly thrilled about it and suggested she knew enough about what happened to write it down, but, well, she insisted that this way preserved the integrity of the story as it happened. And begged me to do it, but personally, I think she just didn't want to have to tell this part of the story for reasons you'll understand before long. You see, it all started once she got back, and we thought everything had finally settled down a bit. Last I knew, she was up in her room with that Jasmine girl doing God knows what, and I was trying to get a little bit of rest for the first time since she left. But no. Just as I start to get good and settled, I hear this goddamn awful scream from downstairs. So naturally, after I peeled my little biscuit hooks out of the ceiling, I took off downstairs. At that point, the rest of the ghoul school was dashing out of their rooms too. What the hell was that? Dick said after almost breaking his leg on the bottom step. Oh, I love that boy, but bless his heart, I do not know how he made it this far, as clumsy as he is. Sounded like it came from the garage, Milo adds. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Joanna spat at Milo, which apparently motivated Milo to trip her as she tried to run past him. Oh, those two being ready to fight each other for the past week and a half. At that point, and, well, I was about ready to kill both of them. I looked around and noticed that... Aside from Tegan, who was still trying to recover in bed, we were missing someone. Hey, Jasmine, where's... But before I was able to finish, that question answered itself. By the time I got to the garage, I saw what caused all the ruckus. That rabid little shit was basically on top of Mark, with one leg that looks to have had a large bite taken out of his calf. Well, that boy was shrieking and hollering as she had every finger on her left hand sunk deep into his thigh, was pulling herself closer and closer to his face, snapping her blood-stained teeth all the while. Right about here was a whole lot of commotion, and I don't think any of us got a real vivid memory of what happened next, but the gist of it is that we collectively managed to get her off in a very traumatized mark. We went through two bike locks and several different types of ropes before Trey remembered he had some kind of special Kevlar rope in his car. I think he's a climber or something. Well, we had Jasmine run to get it while each of us wrapped ourselves around a limb and held on for our dear little lives. While we were waiting, she took this time to reinvent profanity as an art form all its own. Oh boy, does that woman have a mouth on her that would make Linda Blair cringe. She had the most crazed look I'd ever seen. I could barely recognize the girl in front of me. Well, finally, Trey got her tied up good enough with that rope to a steel support beam that she wouldn't be able to wiggle herself free. Well, about five seconds later, we realized we'd tied her to the same beam as Mark, and had to get him off that one and onto another one before she bit another plug out of him. Well, lucky for us, the blood loss made him a lot more cooperative than usual. Ooh, that super special Kevlar rope lasted all of about 30 seconds before her strong for no reason ass managed to break through it. And we were all sure that was our asses right there, but about that time, I had a loud, tinkly, scuttling sound heading our way. Before I knew what was going on, that creepy metal thing from the box jumped across the room, wrapped two of its legs around her arms and one around the support beam. 
Now this time the thing wasn't budging at all, and we finally felt a little safe. As we patched the holes in Mark's leg, we all moved back into the den and tried to commiserate on our newest pile of horse shit that we had to deal with. Now naturally we were all looking at our resident wolfman pirate. Oh, I got nothing, he confessed once he realized all eyes were on him. Like I already said, best guess is that my werewolf cells mixed with the vampire cells in the blood and settled on something in the middle, he said, with his hands raised defensively. Just thought that my saliva would stop the infection. It by itself wasn't supposed to turn people, so I'm not exactly sure what happened. Great! Well, the sharp sound of a fire had been smashed across Milo's head rang across the room. Oh, fuck. Damn it, Joanna! Milo yelled, turning to face the person who struck him. Just to see, it wasn't Joanna, but instead Jasmine, who was very distraught with tears running down her face as she clutched the end of the fire poker. Oh, Jasmine, I'm sorry. I didn't know this would... He tried to say. I don't want you to apologize. I want you to fix her right now, Jasmine cried, rearing the fire iron back getting ready to swap Milo again before Leslie was able to snatch it out of her hands. Oh, we're going to figure this out, she said, tossing the poker down and wrapping her arms around Jasmine. Well, at this point, I think we was all starting to get a bit emotional, so I just had to open my big mouth. All right, everyone, I said. Maybe we're just blowing this whole thing out of proportion. Maybe she just had a little episode and she'll be back to normal once she's had a second to calm down, I went on scooting my way to the garage as I talked. Hey, sweetie, you okay in there? I asked, sticking my head through the door. To which the little darling replied, and I believe this is verbatim. Aunt Tommy, I'm gonna suck your eyeballs out of your fucking skull. Oof, once my ears stopped ringing, I walked back over to everyone. Okay, so we might have a little bit of a problem, I said. A problem we surely did have. Right then, we had one werewolf down. Hannibal Lecter in the garage next to our hostage. She just tried to eat for a midnight snack. Lita was half the world away with nothing close to a signal, and a gang of vampires running around looking for us. What, what are we supposed to do now? Jasmine whispered while she was trying to pull herself together. After a little thinking, all I could come up with was the honest answer. I don't know, sugar. I do not know. So, as you can imagine, at this point things weren't looking too hot for us. We had little Missy locked up with some kind of supernatural furniture next to Mark in my garage. One of our werewolves is, uh, well, not bet, <laughs> toilet ridden. We have a literal hostage situation. Our seasoned vampire hunter was nowhere to be found. And I'll definitely be having a talk with that secret keeping bitch about that now I see her again. And yeah, we have uh, the vampires. I was definitely in way over my head. I mean, I ain't gonna leave the little hoodlums to fan for themselves, but you can bet your ass I'll never have to wash a dish or dust a shelf for the rest of my life after this. Oh, and for the people asking about our cannibalistic princess and her name, well, she said something about it when she asked me to write this part. She said she wants to do something like in that Brad Pitt movie where the guy telling the story never mentions their name. That girl sure likes her movies, <laughs> bless her heart. So at this point, we were still all huddled in the living room trying to figure out what we were going to do next. Making our best effort to talk over the dual barrage of obscenity spilling out from the garage. Finally, we agreed to close the door for a minute and let them tucker themselves out. Okay, wolf boy, ideas, I said once I closed the door and walked back into the room with everyone else. I am... Um, we might be screwed, Milo says in response. That was followed by a mild uproar from everyone in attendance. Likely not what they wanted to hear from the only one in the room, even half familiar with all this nonsense. I managed to get everyone quieted down about the same time that Jasmine started to pick up another heavy object to bash Milo with again. All right, all right, everyone just calm the hell down. I hollered over the ruckus. Listen, sugar, you gotta chill it. It ain't that boy's fault he's simple. 
I said to Jasmine while I took the marble elephant statue out of her hands. Oh, this was expansive. Try to go for something cheap next time. About that time, Trey spoke up. Okay, so yeah, we have to do something. We damn sure can't leave her in there like that, he said, pointing towards the garage where some muffled commotion could still be heard. And what the hell is it we're supposed to do? Joanna commented back. Trey started to answer, but Dex beat him to it. Whatever we can, he shouted. Not to mention that guy's still in there with plugs missing from him all over the place. I don't know about you, but if I have to clean up one more pile of Mark shit, him or me, well, one's gonna die. About this time, the sun was already up. And about mid-argument, we all stopped and turned when we heard the stairs creak as Tegan came down. What is all this noise and screams? She said in that darling broken English of hers. She looked an absolute mess. Poor girl looked like death eating a cracker. Oh, sweetie, you don't need to worry about all that right now. I said about the same time Milo said, What are you doing down here? You should go rest some more. I'll come up and tell you everything in a little... But she cut him off. No, you will tell me now she demanded. Somebody dropped the peas. Beans, Dex said. It's, um, spill the beans. What? Tegan asked. Who has spilled beans? No, no, I was just... The, look, the expression is to spill the beans, he tried to explain. Why did you spill beans? Have you cleaned them? Why would you leave such a mess? She scolded. No, you, go, clean these beans. Milo was off in a corner with his face buried in his palms in embarrassment. Dex made his way into the kitchen long enough to fake clean imaginary beans and return to the living room with everyone else. Okay, fuck all of you for not helping me out with that, he said. Then we got Tegan up to speed on everything that had happened since she went upstairs, down to the little metal thing that just saved all our asses. As you might imagine, she was a tad uh, distraught. What? You have her locked up like some kind of animal? She screamed before turning to make for the garage. No, no, Milo stopped her. We're trying to let her wear herself out for a while to see if that calms her down a little. No, I must go help her. She stopped as a long, low growl roared across the room from Tegan's stomach. Oh no. She groaned before grabbing her gut and dashing up the stairs like lightning. A few seconds later, we all heard the bathroom door slam shut. We all turned to look at Milo again. Um, uh, werewolf uh, stuff, he said quietly, suddenly forcing us to recall the phrase that near traumatized us all about a week ago. I had to poop out of my werewolf arm. Yeah, um, what goes up must come down. What goes in must come out, he explained in his own kind of way. It's hard on the body to do what she did. Didn't have enough food stored for mass, so when she changed, it took till there wasn't anything left to take. Now our body's trying to get rid of everything that isn't mostly human, which doesn't leave her with much. That's why she's so bad off right now. Oh, the poor girl, Leslie murmured softly. Ah, she's made it through the worst of it, Milo reassured her. So does the, um, out part get worse too when you change all the way, Dex asked. That's disgusting, Joanna exclaimed. Why would you ask that? And, uh, as you can all imagine, Joanna's revulsion and the question only served to excite Milo's enthusiasm to answer. Um, define worse, Milo said with a grin. What do you mean? Dex questioned. Well, I mean, worse for you. The one doing it, or whoever has to deal with the aftermath. He smiled even bigger in Joanna's direction, causing her to wince. When we're fully transformed, we're also in a better shape when we change back. But what comes out, well... You guys ever seen Jurassic Park? It took us a second before we collectively groaned. Oh my god. I mean, now Tegan, she's a proper lady about it. Usually brings some toilet paper and finds her 
a secluded spot away from civilization and innocent human beings and takes care of it there, he went on. And uh, what do you do? To ask a question I don't really think I want answered, Trey said. Ah, oh, well, you see, I had to find the nearest construction site and just unleash hell on some poor, unsuspecting porter John. Then I like to hide and wait around for the first person to open up the door. One guy actually started crying. <laughs> it was great, Milo bragged. And there we were, in the middle of my house, having an in-depth conversation about werewolf shit. Somebody stop the merry-go-round, because I want off. Nobody went back to sleep. We all stayed up and discussed what we were going to do, to little success. After a while, me, Trey, and Milo went to the kitchen to start making some food for the recovering Tegan upstairs, who Leslie, Dex, Jasmine, and Joanna were with. We'd finish making something, and one of them would come down long enough to snatch it up and take it to her. After a while, Trey and Milo got to chatting. So, uh, how'd you and her meet? Milo asked Trey, inquiring about the rabid shithead on lockdown in the garage. I met in college, he answered. Same economics class. Actually, the first conversation we had was her asking me out. Milo slammed his hand down hard on the table. What? he yelled. Yeah, we uh, even went on a couple of dates way back, Trey laughed. Once we even um, held hands. You dated her? Milo asked, pointing towards the garage. Well, um, yeah, I mean... She's not so bad all the time, and she's cute in an, uh, well, I might stab you in your sleep kind of way, Trey replied. Oh my god, Milo said, leaning back in his chair to look around the corner. Oh, you're right, she's, uh, cute. What the hell? But, well, um, I thought she was, um, Milo started. A lesbian? I interrupted. Well, I get how you might think that. She does mostly bat for the away team, but I catch her looking at the fellas every now and then. I try not to label them kinds of things. That way, nobody feels pressured to stay inside a box. Let people hump whoever they want. That's what I say. But, um, you let people call you Gay Jake, Milo says. Well, that's because I'm queer as a three-dollar bill, sweetie. Don't want nothing to do with any vagina. Well, they creep me right out. They look like them face things from the Alien movie. You ever make eye contact with one? Oof, looks like something's gonna try and jump out and get you, I explain. Likely a little more vividly than entirely necessary. Hmm, okay, Milo says slowly, somewhat cringing. What about the others? How'd they all meet? Well, Joanna's kind of new to all this. I met her at the mall where she worked, and we'd only been dating for a week before we, uh... We met you, Trey answered. Yeah, and uh, Dex was already living here when I brought Shithead in, I added. Wait, Dex lived here too? Why? Milo asked. Oh, that boy had his problems too. Had a lot of trouble kids through here over the years. Dex had him a fondness for opioids, which led him to a fondness for um heroin. So he ended up here in a similar way. He was cleaned up and getting back on his feet about the time that little hellion came, I said. Uh, then what? Milo asked, scooting forward in his seat. Oh, she bullied the piss out of the poor boy, I told him. But that boy stayed and took it all and never complained, not even the first time. And I'd tell him, I'd say, why'd you let her do that? He'd just smile and say that he could see how much pent-up anger she had that she was dealing with it the only way she knew how. <sighs> Bless that boy's heart. He hung in there till the bitter end, to where one day, well, she just snapped, and all the guilt of every time she smack him or push him or call him some horrible name or break something of his lit her all at once. And then what? Milo asked, almost standing up off his chair. Ah, oh, she did something I hadn't ever seen her do up to that point. She apologized. Hell, after that you'd hardly see them apart, really. I don't think she'd have recovered as well if he wasn't around like he was. I 
think they've been best friends ever since then, I explained. I've been catching him peeking into the garage on his way back upstairs every time he comes down to get Tegan's food. After that conversation, I catch Milo and Dex making their way from the kitchen to the garage to Tegan's room side by side. I mean, most of the time it was just long enough to let a pressure wave of obscenities burst through the opening, but they were making the effort just the same. Now, let me tell y'all, this next part just about broke my little heart. Later that night, I went to poke my head in the garage real quick, and oh my goodness, I found Milo and Dex both sitting on the cold concrete floor. Dex was out like a light, lined up against the wall, but Milo had brought a laptop downstairs and had it open, playing her favorite movies for her. Every now and then he'd catch Mark trying to watch, so he'd pick up something random off the floor and throw it at him, saying, No, you don't get to watch, which would cause our predatory princess to crack an evil little giggle each time. Now, don't get me wrong, I still wasn't going to get in the range of her chompers, but this was the calmest she'd been so far. I stuck my head in just a little and asked Milo if he needed anything. Ah, Tegan passed out from the itis a while ago, so I figured I'd hang out down here with Jaws and the fecal phantom over there and keep her company, he answered. Hey, is that her laptop? I asked. How'd you get into that? She keeps it locked like Fort Knox. Well, at first she said she'd open it for me. When I tried to hand it to her, oh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. He turned to show me a mouth-sized section of his right sleeve missing with what was apparently dry blood around the edges. So I had to figure it out myself. Ah, it wasn't too hard. Turns out it was Bobby's idiots. All one word. Boy, you gotta tell me. You an idiot or a genius? I gotta know. I finally broke down and asked him what we were all thinking. Exactly, he answered with a wink and turned back to the screen. Oh, that boy makes me tired, I swear to God. He's lucky he's cute. We all gathered back up in the kitchen later the next day to resume our figuring. Like you might expect, we didn't get too awful far at all. That is, not until Tegan finally made her way downstairs in relatively better condition. And that's because when he saw her, Dex went to say hi and wave to her, which made him drop that gun-shaped knife thing of his, which then thunked, tipped first right into my hardwood floor. Oh, damn it, boy. Y'all are steady fucking my whole house up, my bar. But about that time, Milo got this strange look on his face. Hey, Tegan. Hey, hey, he yelled. Tegan. That guy who made these things, he said, yanking the cutlery from my hardwood floor. Maybe he knows something about what we can do to help him. Holy shit, sounded from over near the fridge where Jasmine had been pilfering around for food. Oh, God. Oh, God. She groaned, holding her head as she slowly shuffled over to the table. Oh, honey, your poor head. Are you all right? I tried to ask, but she just held a finger up at me. Mm-hmm, she mumbled, trying to hold still as much as possible until she was able to take a deep breath and talk again. Do you, do you think that would work? She asked Milo. Hmm, it's worth a shot. We should at least try. Teague, do you have any contact info from him or anything? What was his name? He said. No, oh, I am sorry, but we did not get it before we leave, she said. But I am thinking his name was Hephaestus. He says to call him Hep also. Well, I'll do. Uh, spare you some boring dialogue. In about 30 seconds, that idiot savant had found him on fucking Facebook. Turns out he's pretty easy to get in touch with through his day job not making vampire fighting equipment. Well, about another 30 seconds later, we all gathered around the phone, set to speaker as it rang. The other end clicked, and someone on the other side answered. Hello, if this is the IRS, I already told you to suck my ass. That is the strange Tony person? Deegan whispered. Yeah, I'm, uh, hi. I think I'll take a rain check on the ass-sucking, Milo replied, causing everyone else to chuckle. 
Uh, any chance we get to chat with Hep real quick? Oh, shit. Oh, right, right, the Tony man said. Uh, give me a second. We then heard him say something with the phone away from his face that sounded like, Here, run this out here. Followed by the familiar sound of metal tinking and the sound of some kind of power tool getting louder in the distance. Hello, you got Hep? Another voice answered. Yeah, hello, Milo said loudly. Hi, uh, yeah, my friend and my wife just left your place a few days ago, remember? Wait, you two are married? Leslie shrieked. Really? Milo and Tegan both held up their left hands, showing off a small black band tattooed around both of their ring fingers that apparently none of us had noticed before. Oh, that's adorable. Jasmine and Leslie both cooed in unison, causing Joanna to groan in disgust. Yeah, we got married in Romania, in Vlad's castle. It's the last thing I used my inheritance money on other than the plane tickets back here, he said with a big, proud grin. That is just beautiful, the voice in the phone spoke up, causing us all to jump a little. Yeah, still here, guys, the man said. Oh, um, right, Milo said back into the phone. Uh, so we uh, kind of have a situation. Your body went psycho and tried to eat someone, the voice interjected. I, um, yeah, how'd you know, Milo asked him. I had a hunch that things might go tits up with your girl in the garage over there. Guess my little friend was helpful after all, the man said, making us all lean back away from the phone. How, um, how do you know she's in the garage? Milo said, joining the rest of us in looking around the room suspiciously. Well, don't worry about it, the man said, increasing our worry. Now, what do you need from me? Well... Milo answered. We were hoping you'd know how to fix her or something. I do not. But, he continued, I think if there is a way, I know the people who would know. I'm going to give you their number. Just tell them Hephaestus told you to call. That should get them talking. Then he gave us the number to call, wished us luck and hung up. Well, we didn't waste a second dialing the new number. We set the phone back down on the table and circled around again, listening for the ring. Click. Worst hotel, front desk. Who the fuck is this? A voice shouted through the speaker. We all looked around at each other, all seemingly collectively thinking that the art of answering the phone was really taking a dive. Uh, yeah, my name's Milo, and I was told to call by Hephaestus. Uh, who the fuck is this? Milo shouted back. Oh, God damn it. I hate taking these. Oh, jeez, what a day. Uh, hello, my name is Leslie. How can I help you today? The man says. Oh my God, my name's Leslie too. Leslie chirped up excitedly. Oh, like OMG. Do you like totally want to be BFFs and like have sleepovers and talk all about the cute boys on the football team and like do each other's nails and stuff? The man on the phone said in the most heavily condescending tone I think any of us had ever heard. Tch, asshole. Leslie whispered to herself before walking away from the table. What the hell do you people want? The man asked. Our friend is a uh, half vampire world thing. Well, I think, and well, she's trying to eat us. Milo says into the phone. We need to know how to fix her. Then, or it has some infused weapon to the head or to the heart or to fix her, the man replies, sending Jasmine into a fit. Uh, no, can do, buddy. We're going to need to take her alive, Milo said once we got Jasmine settled back down. Ugh, okay. God. You said she's trying to eat people, yeah? He asks. Yeah, that's right. Um, she bit a chunk out of our host, uh, out of Mark. Ate his finger too. Milo answered. Jesus, have any of you ever watched a vampire movie? What do vampires need? The man asked in a condescending tone again. Blood. Milo half answers back. 
Yes, blood, dumbass. And what happens when they don't get what they need for a while? They flip the fuck out. So, how about... Oh, and hear me out here. You get her some goddamn blood. The man yells at us. So, um... What, we just go in there and give her some blood? Dex asks. Oh, that's easy enough. No, you jackass. The man barks at him. Not unless you want her to bite a chunk out of your stupid neck. Okay, look. You idiots obviously can't be trusted to think this through yourself, so here it is. Right now, you need to find a way to slide her a big bucket of fresh and completely human blood. If she's only half vampire, however the fuck that happened, then she'll probably only eat a small amount every now and then. Regular food should work most of the time. Pure vampires get their nutrition from liquefying the entire body and sucking that up. If she doesn't have that osteal dentition as you see on regular ones, and her tongue isn't partially bifurcated, then well, she's probably going to get most of her nutrition from regular sources. And once she's calmed down, you'll be able to donate to her directly, but unless you want her to tear you a new asshole, right now you need to find some way to get her the blood while she's all bitey and shit. It's just how it is now. You don't fix werewolf, and you don't fix vampire. <laughs> Deal with it. God, I feel like I'm just here to explain shit to people all the goddamn time. <coughs> and with that, the guy hung up, leaving us all looking at the blank screen in silence. After about 30 seconds of gazing into the touchscreen void, Jasmine finally broke the quiet. I, um... Guess we need human blood, she said. I guess we need human blood, she said. Milo responded. Oh, what a coincidence, I know someone who has some to spare. Grabbing a metal turkey baster syringe and a large Tupperware bowl before starting for the garage with a spring in his step. What the fuck, you psychopath? Joanna shrieked at the top of her lungs, stepping in front of Milo with her arms spread, blocking his way. What? Milo questioned with the most bullshit faint innocent tone possible. Now, as you all can imagine, that didn't go well and the rest of us damn near had to break up a fistfight. After we got them to cool down, about 30 minutes later, we started figuring on how we were supposed to come by a heap of fresh human blood. Oh, long story short, it's pretty obvious a blood bank would have something to do with our solution. But we sat around for hours trying to come up with a heist game plan before that lovable moron Milo said something I still ain't sure was smart or dumb. But I gotta admit, didn't none of us think of it. Why don't we just run in, grab it, and run back out? He asked us all, sitting up from where he'd been laying down on the floor. What are you talking about? Trey asked him. I was just thinking, uh, how many people try and steal blood from a blood bank? It's not like they keep that shit in a vault with a bunch of armed guards and stuff, right? Milo explained, which actually started making some kind of sense. So we uh, all decided we was going to smash and grab a blood bank. Well, we found one a respectable ways away online first, and then we had to decide who was going. I'm thinking Milo, Trey said. I mean, if something goes to shit and he has to get shot, he can heal. We can't. Well, everyone seemed to agree. Then Tegan spoke up. Then someone will have to also go with him, she said. Why is that, honey? I asked her. Tegan. Milo started, but Tegan said it before he could stop her. Because uh, Milo does not know how to uh, do the driving, she said. Oh, thank you, Tegan. Thank you, Milo says loudly. <laughs> oh my god, you don't know how to drive? Joanna cackled mockingly at the poor boy, whose head was now hidden down in his arms. Hey, you behave, you little shit, I scolded her. It's okay, sugar, we ain't gonna judge you none here. I comforted him, secretly taking out my little notepad and putting a check under the stupid section of the smart, stupid tally I'd been keeping on him through the day. 
Well, anyway, I ended up volunteering to drive the little hoodlum because I had a dummy plate for my Wrangler that weren't nobody looking for, and that don't trace back to my house. And once the next day rolled around, we were ready to get wild. We figured sooner was better than later to get our situation somewhat stabilized again. Plus, well, we figured the more time we had to think about it, the more likely we were to come to our senses and chicken out. That morning, we got off to an early start, making sure we had everything set. We went ahead and put a spare set of clothes in the garage and a can of, well, we figured she wouldn't be too thrilled about her shirt being ripped almost all the way down the middle like it was from where we was trying to hold her down when she freaked out that first night. Dex said he was going to stay in there while we were gone and try and keep her company with Jasmine. We waited until later in the day when it was turning dark again to finally head out. That way it'd be night by the time we made the 45 minute drive there. Hoping there'd be less people working by then. The only conversation we had on the way there was about exactly what we were going to do when we got there. The idea being, and this one earned him a smart check in my notepad, that he would walk in with a disguise consisting of temporary blonde hair colouring, a ball cap and thick glasses, and pretend to be working on a research paper of some kind. Ask a few questions to figure out which room the blood was kept in before he'd make a run for it and bolt back to the Wrangler with as much of it as he could carry. Now I know what you're all probably thinking. But the whole thing where he single-handedly demolished the Mark Con didn't actually occur to any of us at the time. He was saying all kind of smart stuff, and I guess we just didn't put two and two stupid together. By the time we pulled into the parking lot, we had everything worked out, so I just left the car running as he hopped out and strolled up to the front door and <laughs> walked in. Now that I at the time thought was according to plan. Well, he comes basting full speed back out the door about ten minutes later holding a bunch of plastic bags in one arm. From what I could tell, it looked like a bag might have busted and got all over him because his light blue shirt was all wet and dark on one side. Well, shortly before he gets to the car, a gaggle of people in scrubs, which were also stained dark, came stampeding out behind him. As he got closer, I started to see the panic on his face and realized that boy was missing his whole right arm. That was his blood all over everything and everyone. He didn't even slow down. Now, kids, I shit you not, he jumped headfirst straight through my back passenger windshield. I screamed, folks, I ain't gonna lie. I screamed a lot right about here. Go. Go, go, he yelled as he made contact with the rear seat, which made me floor the pedal right as I started to hear bodies pound against the side of the Wrangler, almost knocking it up on its side. What the shit is going on, boy? I squealed as we tore out of the parking lot and into the traffic. And where the goddamn hell is your arm? Oh, oh he groaned dropping the bags of blood onto the seat and working his way up into the front. Vampires. The whole place was lousy with vampires. I guess they recognized me or something. As soon as I darted into the back room, where they store the blood, there were like three of them in there. What about your arm? I asked with loud panic still in my voice. Oh, uh, right. I had to kind of um, lizard it off. Once one of them got a hold of my arm, real high up, and broke it. But, well, they weren't letting go, so I grabbed onto one of those corners of the brick walls and transformed a few muscles in my other arm, just enough to where I could pull it off and get away, he said, holding up his remaining hand, showing the deep purple of internal bleeding fade away as broken fingers and dislocated joints started to situate themselves back where they went. Well, <laughs> I grabbed all I could with it like this. Oh, oh, I gagged. Oh, honey, put that down to I'm trying to drive you and you're going to make me sick. By the time we got back, his arm was already half grown back down to the elbow and had finally stopped gushing blood all over my vehicle. Thank God we didn't get pulled over because there's just no explaining any of that. 
I literally slid into my driveway as we both piled out in a hurry, scooping up plastic sacks as we did. Not even taking time to shut the car doors, we took off into the back door and called out to everyone to let them know we was back. Hey y'all, we got it, we actually got it, I hollered to everyone. Dex made it to us before anyone else as he shot out of the garage and ran full speed into the living room where me and Milo was. Shortly after, everyone else started to congregate around us too, examining the stolen plasma closely, and then Milo's missing limb. What the hell happened? Jasmine cried out when she saw Milo's stump and blood all over his shirt. As he tried to explain the ruckus that surrounded it, I heard Dex notice the Wrangler's disheveled state as he said, Did I just hear something fall in the driveway? Oh my god, your car has parts hanging off of it. What happened to it? Peering out through the living room window. About the second he asked, we all turned to face. Not the driveway of the car, but the opposite direction, where a commotion had started coming from. A split second later, that metal legs thing came rocketing out through a hole in the door before embedding deep into the far wall. Then the rest of the door burst into splinters. Before we even had time to gather our thoughts, a cold chill ran down my back as we all heard the voice. Ha <laughs> ha, oh yeah. The voice said as a hand with long, black talons wrapped itself around the corner before allowing the rest of our, only until recently, captured monster girl to follow behind it. We all slowly turned to face her. Her bones cracked down the hall as she stretched and twisted her arms and back, getting comfortable with her new freedom. As she slowly walked towards us with an evil smirk, raking deep canyons into the wall with her claws, she hissed. I'm gonna twist each and every one of your goddamn heads off like fucking bottle caps. But before she could reach us, the metal thing finally wrenched itself free of the wall and made a wild sprint for us. We all screamed and covered our faces as the contraption sprinted full speed and leapt from the ground towards us with one leg extended like a spear in front of it. Thousands of shards of broken glass cascaded from behind us and into the room as the tripod flew past us into the silhouette of a person exploding through the window, hitting it in the center of the chest and sending it flying back out into the darkness with a wet, crunchy thud. Holy fucking god, what was that? Leslie screamed as everyone all at once ran to look out the shattered window to see none other than an actual vampire kicking and flailing pinned deeply into the massive oak tree between the house and driveway. I kept hearing about them, but this was my first time getting a good look at one in the light. Then, all at once, we seemed to remember that the threat hadn't ended. We spun on our heels, expecting her to pounce at any second. But she didn't move. She just stood there, staring wild-eyed at something on the floor. She must have noticed the bags of blood we dropped, I thought to myself in the moment, before a horrible, wet, gargling and ear-splitting shriek forced my eyes to the ground. Dex was lying on the floor, with a large piece of his neck missing as a dark red pool flowed steadily from the massive hole. In the few seconds before any of us could come to our senses and drop down to try and help him, he was gone. His open unblinking eyes peering off into nothing as he died right there in the middle of my home, as every friend he had in this world couldn't do a thing but look on in terror. Ha ha ha, got one, I got one, we're gonna get the rest of you before long. The creature nailed to my tree taunted gleefully from outside. Oh, you didn't like him did you? Oh shit, my bad. I can get that plug I bit out of him back to you. But he was a pretty big one, so it might take a few hours or so to pass. <laughs> I jumped as someone passed by me, snatching something heavy off the mantle over the fireplace. Our freshly unleashed beast didn't say a word as she stepped over the window seal, dragging that big metal club of hers along the ground beside her. 
She marched right up to the creature on the tree, and we all watched on silently. She yanked the tripod's leg free from the trunk of the oak, and before anyone knew what had happened, she took that club of hers and swung it with both hands like a baseball player right into its face so hard that it took a chunk of the tree with it. Listening to the sound of thousands of red-eyed, sticky splinters falling gingerly to the concrete, we all watched without a word as she walked back around through the back door and into the living room, all except for Leslie who was now on the ground beside Dex, sobbing uncontrollably and covered in his blood. She dropped, sitting down next to her, picking up one of the plastic bags before emptying its contents into her mouth, then laying back on the floor into the still expanding red stain as we all circled around, not knowing what to say or do anymore beyond this point. We were really lost this time. Looking down into Dexy's empty eyes, I realized the desperation and mortality of our situation for the first time. I was brought back from my thoughts as I heard Leslie begin to beg and plead for Milo and Tegan to do something to try and save him. But we all knew they couldn't do anything for that poor boy. We were all in tears by then. Hell, crying was about all any of us could think to do. Even our hard-ass vampire slayer. I got a single tear roll out of her eye before she suddenly got to her feet and walked upstairs to her room without a word. None of us saw her again for several days after that. If she'd sneak out to the bathroom or kitchen, she was there and back before any of us could catch her at it. Seeing as we really couldn't report his death because that would expose who and where we all were, and that we were Dex's only family, we held a funeral and cremated him out back up in the woods but only just far enough to where we knew she could still see from her bedroom window. Now, luckily, I live far enough out that people almost never pass by, and even if they did, the house is big enough to hide what was actually going on and seem like just an average bonfire. We understood she didn't want to come out, but we also know she wouldn't ever want to miss Dex's final send-off. I did manage to catch a glimpse of her every now and then in the corner of the window while we were out there. We spent most of the time after that with me and Milo tearing up the old carpet and laying a new one and Trey putting new glass in the window. We piled the vampire carcass in the garage with Mark for the time being. Partly because we might as well, because we already had a hostage in there, and partly to soften him up over a few days of looking at and smelling the rotting corpse of one of his vampire buddies. But after about a day, its body had dissolved into a pool of some weird, yellow, shimmering liquid. On the fourth day, Milo had finally had enough of all of us carefully knocking on Princess's door, asking if she needed anything or wanted to talk, just being ignored. No, I've had it. Everyone's had it, he barked as he climbed the stairs. She ain't gonna be the only one dealing with that shit by herself. And then he kicked my door to her room in. I peeked my head around the corner just enough to see in. She was sitting on her bed in the dark, surrounded by empty plastic blood bags and food wrappings. Her laptop was on and some video was playing. She still had on the same raggedy torn shirt she'd been locked up with too. Hey champ, how are you holding up? Milo asked her. Huh? I said, just noticing that it looked like my door was kicked off the hinges finally loosened enough again for my memory to function properly and not seem like a dream sequence of some events. How am I... what? Oh yeah, I'm just... YouTube, I mumbled, pointing to the screen and noticing Gajek's eyes poking out from around the corner. Hey, uh, did you know this guy actually narrated that story about when we first met? We're like famous now. Oh boy, you are ripe. Jesus... Fuck, Milo coughed. <laughs> That's the same damn t-shirt, goddammit, woman. You still have dry blood all over your... You know what. Come on, let's get your rotten ass into the bathroom so you can shout. Then he wrapped his arms around me and practically dragged me into the bathroom. I was lucid, just not compliant. 
He sat me down on the edge of the counter, left and came right back with a change of clothes. Okay, here you go. Fresh threads. Get you a shower, calm down, rejoin society, he said, tossing the clothes on the counter next to me and closing the door behind him as he left. He came back about 40 minutes later and reopened the door to find me sitting on the closed lid of the toilet, still dry and crusty as ever. Oh, fuck, really? He scolded. Then he stuck his head out into the hall and yelled, Hey, Jasmine, Teague, Leslie, Gay Jake. Oh, that mean bitch. Look, anyone come here and help her take a shower. I know you fuckers can hear me. God damn it. Cursing to himself again, he pulled his head back into the bathroom and turned to face me once more, as best he could with me staring into the void like I was. He hesitated for a second and then closed the door. Fuck it, I... God damn, I already had my dick on your leg and you've been half naked for most of the week anyway, but... This stays between us, understand? Look, I don't need everyone thinking I'm some kind of creep, but goddamn, you are gross, he said with a finger in my face. I nodded slowly and he turned the faucet on and started letting the tub fill with water. Okay, arms up, he said, pulling my nasty shredded t-shirt off. Ah, at least there's no bra. Those things are <laughs> confusing as hell, he joked which almost made me laugh. Okay, it's about to get weird. Legs straight, he said, taking off my equally dirty bottoms. He actually turned his head and looked away the whole time. Well, the guy never stopped surprising me, and he actually kept that up for a surprisingly long time, but eventually he got frustrated. Ah, oh, look, this ain't working for shit. If I'm going to get all this funk and grime off you, I need to see you. We're just going to both have to pretend to forget I saw anything, okay? He said, and I nodded once more. Yeah, it was awkward, but it didn't reach peak awkward until the door flew open. We think we hear someone call for us, but we are not sure, Tegan said, accompanied by Jasmine as the bathroom door opened at the exact moment Milo finally worked up the courage to scrub my inner thighs. Yeah... Admittedly, as bad as it looked, Milo doubled down as only he could have. Oh, I see. Now you two want to show up. The hell were you when I was begging for someone else to come and do this? What the actual fuck? He yelled. No, nope, I'm too far in now. You missed your chance to help. Get out. He yelled again, but this time grabbed one of the stuck sponges and heaving it at them. Well, they jumped back and slammed the door behind them. Everything was silent for a second before I heard a few small giggles from both of them. I'm glad you finally came out, Jasmine said softly through the door. We were worried about you, especially me. How's Leslie? I managed to ask, still gazing mindlessly into the rippling bathwater. Oh well, um, yeah, she's had a pretty rough few days, Jasmine answered. But we've been taking care of her and helping her through it. As she turned to leave, she informed me and Milo that they'd all be waiting in the kitchen. After he dried me off and helped me get dressed, we went downstairs. He didn't have to drag me, but I don't think I would have found my way down there without him nudging me that direction. We walked into the kitchen where everyone was gathered at the table waiting for us. Or almost everyone. The brief second it took me to mistakenly look for Dex in the crowd was all it took. I managed to fit four days' worth of crying into a solid hour of bawling my eyes out. After we all had a good cry and a long conversation, the question finally got asked. So, what do we do now? I stood up and placed both my hands on the table, speaking as matter-of-factly as possible. Kill them. Kill them all. This little piggy went to market, I yelled, slamming open the garage door, scaring the absolute piss out of Mark, making him squeal like a five-year-old at a Chuck E. Cheese. Holy fuck, the abandoned hospital, he frantically cried. They, <laughs> they sell all their shit out on the streets, but they cook it up and keep it there in the old hospital. I think most of them sleep there during the day too. 
See how easy that was? I said, turning to walk back to the group and relay the information. Looks like they set up shop at the rundown hospital, I said. Well, fuck. Milo swore under his breath. This is going to be harder than I thought then. There's all kind of places they can escape once me and Tegan are in there with them. He pulled out his phone and started swiping around from it. Okay, cool, cool. They actually have a lot of pictures and blueprints for this place online. So we have to find a way to get them as grouped together as possible in a place with only one exit. As Milo was talking, I noticed Gay Jake pull out some kind of notepad. Make a check or something and put it back in. There might be an explanation for it in the section I let him write, but I told myself I wouldn't go back and read it to keep from being tempted to alter anything that he'd written. How the hell we do that, then? Trey asked. We, uh, we're going to need a way to lure them down there somehow, Milo answered. It's something they want bad enough to all pile in after it at once. Um, what about me? I asked. About the time I'd said anything cell phone started to ring. I looked at the screen that read Stephen. Oh shit, oh, f oh god. Oh shit, Stephen. Oh, we forgot about Stephen. I screamed, looking up at Jasmine as I felt myself start to hyperventilate. I tapped the accept button on the phone and raised it, shaking my hand up to my ear, not fully knowing whose voice to expect. Hello? I said. Hey, uh, you know Ren's due in like four days, right? Stephen's agitated voice spoke through the speaker. What? Oh, right, yeah, Ren, sorry. Uh, I'll make you some cash or something. My bad, I answered. Oh, hey, uh, you okay? What are you talking about? Of course I am. You're in some kind of trouble. Some really energetic lady came by asking about you a few weeks ago with a group of really shady-looking people with her, he said. I swear to God, she acted like she was on speed or something. <sighs> what do you tell her? I asked, louder than I'd intended. Well, I figured you were probably at that Jake guy's place, he said, causing my stomach to lurch. Oh, but she was a bitch, so I said I didn't know. That we don't communicate that much about where you're going or what we're doing to each other. I saw her and those sketchy guys snooping around here a few times after that, though. Thank God, Stephen. I owe you one. I'll send you half my rent as soon as I can. Look, you're literally a lifesaver. And this might not make any sense, but I'm so fucking sorry I left you there. After running out and putting an envelope with a rent and a fake return address into the mailbox, I ran back into the house and got back to business. So, um, yeah. I'll do it. I'll be the bait. What do I have to do? Are oh, you stupid? Half the room shouted when they realized I was serious. Yeah, dumbass. You're strong, but it wears you out in like a few seconds and you don't even heal fast. What the hell makes you think you can get away with that? Milo yelled at me as he leaned across the table. At that point, everyone in the room was looking at me, waiting for my answer. Well, I, um, I guess I hadn't got that far, actually. Oh, you hadn't got that far. Well, okay then. Go ahead and think it over for a second there, Xena. Milo shouted again, now leaning so far over. We were almost nose to nose. Do it. Well, Milo does kind of have a point, Jasmine said from the other end of the kitchen table. But since Milo's nose was still nearly pressed against mine, I didn't turn to look at her. Yeah, Milo kind of has a point, he said, still way too close. A few hours later, I was still wandering around Gay Jake's house, trying to think about how to pull off what I was planning to do. There's some kind of solution I'm missing here, I know it, I thought to myself. Tegan was sitting on the ottoman, flipping through an old book, a really old-looking book, which caught my attention. Hey, Tegan, what is that? I asked, walking over to her. Oh, this. This is book my mother has given to me and Milo. She explained as she closed it and held it up for me to see. I took the book and flipped through it for a second before I started to realize what it was. 
Tegan, is this a book about monsters? I asked. Yes, uh, it belonged to my mother, she answered. Um, does it say anything about vampires? Yes, but nothing you have not been told already, I think, she told me. What, what about whatever the hell's wrong with me? But no, that is what I actually was looking for, but I am afraid there is no... Hey, does anyone see Joanna? Trey interrupted. I haven't seen her all day. <sighs> Milo hacked from across the room, spewing his drink everywhere. What the hell's wrong with you? I asked him as he coughed. What do you know? Uh, no, nothing, he answered nervously, still choking a little. Bullshit. I can tell when you're lying. What the hell's been going on between you two? I asked again, but he didn't answer. He just sat there looking nervous as me, Trey and Tegan kept staring at him until he finally broke. Oh, look, she wouldn't listen, okay? He shouted suddenly. She wouldn't listen to what? Trey questioned. Milo, what have you been hiding? I interrogated. Oh, fuck, here goes. I heard him sigh to himself. She asked me to turn her into a werewolf. You could have heard a fly fart in that room for about 30 seconds after that. It was just a ringing silence as everyone in the room stood there, eyes wide, mouth open, trying to process what he'd said. Then he finally continued. Well, when you and Tegan were in Alabama, she came to me and she said, well, she had something to ask me, but I had to promise not to tell anyone. And so I did, but then she asked me to make her a werewolf. I didn't even ask why. She told me that she knew what had to happen to be one, but... I had to explain to her that it's more complicated than that, and that even if I could, it'd be wrong. She wasn't happy about any of it. She got mad. She thought I was lying to her, and it just kind of escalated from there. Once he was done, everyone slowly turned to look at Trey, nervously waiting for his reaction. I was half expecting him to call Milo a liar, but he didn't, surprisingly enough. Okay, so why can't I find her now? He asked Milo. Well, I honestly don't have a clue, Milo answered, shrugging his shoulders at the question. Oh, great. We're about to fight a small army of vampires. Now my sketchy girlfriend wants to go on sabbatical, Trey shouted. What the hell's going on here? Gay Jake yelled, coming in to see what was going on. Are you all fight? Oh, shit, he shouted, almost tripping over Hep's metal tripod as it scurried in front of him. Are you all fighting again? He asked, scooting the thing out of his way with his foot before it scuttled off in the direction of the front door. What is that critter up to now? Oh, you're not going to believe this, but Joanna... I started to say, but I was cut off by the doorbell ringing. Who the fuck? We all stood in silence, trying to figure out who it could be. Well, since everyone knew to go to the back door and knock, nobody ever rang the bell at Gay Jake's house so I finally worked up my courage and eased my way over to the door. Please don't be a Jehovah's Witness. Please don't be a Jehovah's Witness. Oh, you have got to be shitting me, I whispered to myself once I opened the door. The last person on earth I expected to see on the other side of that door was the fucking morning bitch, the goddamn vampire from Walmart. Shit, what the hell? I screamed, getting ready to dart back into the house and grab one of the weapons. No, no, calm down, she pleaded. I come in peace. What's going on? Milo shouted from inside. There's a fucking vampire on the front porch. What? Bullshit. It's 2.30, Milo yelled back. There's sun all over the place out there. Okay, well, I'm looking right at the goddamn thing. I screamed back, keeping my eyes on her the whole time. How do you keep showing up in the middle of the day? Sunblock, sweetie. Lots of sunblock. Now, can we talk? She answered. Well, it's come to my attention, by the way, of a mutual acquaintance that not only have you all acquired a collection of orichalcum weapons, but that you have a couple of real-life werewolves on your side. Yeah, so... Why would you come here if you already knew that? 
I asked, suddenly realizing where Joanna had probably gone. Because I am here to bury the hatchet, to cut a deal, she explained. What? Why? This whole ordeal has become tedious and chasing you kids around is hurting our revenue, the woman answered. You bunch have all become taxing. I mean, why would we? I mean, you guys killed Dex, I screamed, getting ready to go for the weapons again, noticing the tripod thing had now positioned itself between the woman and everyone else. <clears throat> Correction, one of us killed him, and then you killed that guy, right? I, look, that's not the... Same thing. How do you figure? She asked, interrupting me. Well, I... Look, it's just as... I tried to respond. Hmm, well, here's the situation. You guys can go ahead with your little plan, but it might not have occurred to you. It's very likely that, at the very least, some more of you will die. We're just trying to take the path of least resistance here. We'll leave you all alone, and in return, you drop this little scheme of yours and agree to not interfere in any vampire shit. That little friend of yours I had the uh, tussle with in the van that day already caused our operation a whole heap of trouble. Had to move our lab all the way out into the middle of nowhere because of her. But word is, she ain't around right now, so you might want to take our offer to heart. I... <laughs> I'll have to ask everyone else. Hey, is that you, Margaret? Oh my god, if that's you, please help. Mark's voice begged from the garage. I take it that's Mark I hear back there. It's going to be hard to explain that once everything is said and done, if you don't take the deal, sweetheart. We can keep in quiet about this whole uh, misunderstanding, but if you insist on keeping this hissy fit of yours going, well, I'll think about it, the lady said. I'm, uh gonna go um hold a powwow and talk this over with everyone just i don't know wait here i told her closing the door behind me as i walked back inside okay so um here's the deal i'm gonna take this mace and go beat her to death with it i told them picking up the club and getting ready to march back outside no 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 half of them shouted trying to grab a hold of me holy hell she's strong Grab her legs before she does something stupid, Gay Jake screamed, both arms wrapped around my neck, trying to drag me down. What the hell's going on down there? Jasmine and Leslie asked on their way down the stairs. So, after a few seconds of summing up the situation for them, the group was now trying to hold me and Leslie down. And after a few minutes of that, everything calmed down and conversation ensued. Hey, um, I really think you guys should consider it. Milo finally said. No, that wasn't the original plan, but she's right. We've already lost someone. And even with me and Tegan at Full Wolf, I'm starting to think we can't guarantee you'll all make it out in one piece. This might be the lesser of two evils. By then, it was me and Leslie on one side and everyone else on the other. It was safe to say it was because we'd both been holding on to the idea of bashing in as many vampire heads as possible and neither of us wanted to admit that they were making a lot of sense at the time. All I'm saying is that this seems like the best chance for the rest of you guys coming out alive, he added. Uh -uh. I hate to be a naggy Nancy, but you all do know that sunscreen doesn't last forever, the woman's voice called from behind the door. The offer leaves with me, she hummed. Oh god, I fucking hate her, I sighed to myself. One goddamn second, I screamed back at her before running my hands through my hair, trying to concentrate. Oh, fuck it. Fine, I yelled, storming off towards the garage, causing Mark to squeal like a kindergartner as I slammed the door open. Oh, Christ, what do you want now? Get up, I told him, snatching the bike lock off the post and yanking him off the ground by the back of his shirt. Move. Here, to take him and fuck off, I said to the lady, shoving Mark out onto the front porch. Oh, good to hear that you've all come to your senses, the lady said, wrapping her arm around Mark and leading him away. I didn't tell him a thing, I heard Mark say as he left. Bullshit, 
He told us everything we wanted to know. I shouted after them. God, I don't trust that bitch as far as I can throw her. I said to everyone as soon as the door closed behind me. Look, I get it that it isn't sitting well, but it really is the best option right now. Milo told me when he saw the pissy look on my face. So, um, if that's really it, what do we do now? I asked. So I guess I'm single now, right? We will turn to look at Trey. What? He asked. Well, I'm just saying. My girlfriend kind of sold us out, so I don't think it's going to work out. We all stood there in total silence for a while, trying to process this unexpected turn of events. Then Jasmine finally broke the quiet when she said, Is everything just supposed to go back to normal now? Well, can it? I mean, I guess this is kind of normal for Milo and Tegan, but what about us? She asked. Yeah, that's a uh, good point, Gay Jake said. I mean, we still don't even know what kind of ghoul you are now, he said, gesturing my way. Hey, did you just call me a ghoul? Well, he is right, though. Leslie interrupted. We do still need to figure out exactly what's going on with you. I, um, might have an idea, Milo said, taking out his phone and making a call. Who are you calling? Leslie asked. Oh, hello, yeah, um, yeah, it's me again. He spoke into the phone before setting it to speaker. What do y'all need now? Hep's voice asked. Yeah, I, uh, it's me. I said, speaking into the receiver. Oh, hey, he suddenly shouted. Haven't eaten anyone yet, have you? <sighs> no, but actually, I think we were wondering if you might be able to send us in the direction of someone who might be able to help us figure this out, Milo answered for me. There was a long silence on the other end, but then he finally spoke. Oh, I'm probably going to get my ass chewed out for telling you all this, but I think I can help. There's a fella out at California Ways who knows all about the sciencey stuff to do with the supernatural. I make some special tools and instruments for his research every now and then, so I'm going to give you his address. The, wait, what? So, um, we're going to have to go all the way to California? I asked. Oh, fine. God, you know, kids complain a lot. Call that number I gave you all last time and tell them I told you to call again. Tell him I said to give you directions to the nearest entrance and passage. So, he gave us the place to go and we wrote it down. But when it was time to make the next call, everyone got real quiet for some reason. What's wrong? I asked when I noticed. Okay, whatever, I said, dialing the number Milo had given me and setting it to speak it. Worst hotel. What the hell do you want? Shit, it would be him again, Milo mumbled to himself. He's the guy that told us how to help you out when you were all crazy and stuff, he whispered to me. He's a dick. Hey, Leslie, it's us again. Shit, we heard him say from the other end. Then we heard another voice in the distance. Is that them? The voice shouted. Give me that. Hello? Yeah, sorry, uh... I was hoping we'd hear from you guys again. See, Leslie here isn't exactly qualified to give the advice on the, uh, on the subject you were asking about. And we were starting to think you might have gotten into a worse situation because of it. We wanted to call you back as soon as we found out, but oh, the call log got deleted and we lost your number. We're really sorry. Oh, my name's Travis, by the way. How can we help? Wait, you sound familiar, I said suspiciously once I heard his voice. Wait, hold on. Hep's house, right? Travis asked. Yeah, that's it, I yelled. I, uh... I'm guessing you're the one with the problem, huh? Travis asked. Yeah, actually, Hep just told us to call for, um, directions and passage, whatever that means, I told him. Um, for what exactly? He told us there's someone in California who can help us, I answered, which caused a long pause from Travis. Is it an L.A. address? He finally asked. Yeah, it is actually. Why? Oh, boy. I'm just going to let you figure it out for yourselves. You think Hep's a character? You just wait, 
he said with a chuckle, before giving us the directions to the nearest entrance and hanging up. Once we got what we were after, we were back in the same state of figuring out what to do next. We were all pretty much aimlessly wandering around now that the Prime Directive had shifted so dramatically. Oh, there you are, Jasmine said when she found me sitting out near the place where they'd had Dex's funeral. What are you thinking about? She asked, sitting down beside me. This doesn't feel right, I said plainly. I don't like it. It feels worse than when we thought we were about to throw down with a bunch of butt-sucking constants. I mean, <laughs> are you okay? You're still fresh off your whole spell, she asked. Yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, maybe I'll just need yeah, something feet. What? What, are you saying you're hungry? She asked, and I just nodded my head a few times instead of trying to talk again. <laughs> okay, come on. Let's get you some food, weirdo. Uh, just seems like it was all for nothing. I complained in the kitchen, pounding my head against the table. Yeah, I know, but it's probably better that way. It's not like we're actual monster hunters or something, Leslie admitted. Maybe we should just be happy we can stop worrying about it. Oh, there are vampires out there, doping people and eating them. Doesn't that bother anyone else? I growled giving my head one last hard thump on the wood of the table. Well, I mean, uh, there isn't actually much we can do if they're everywhere. I mean, it's not like we all have super strength or crazy ninja skills. Trey spoke up. Actually, the more I think about it, the worse and worse our original idea sounds by comparison. Dex died and more of us probably would have too. What were we even... <sighs> I groaned before knocking my chair back and storming up. Hey, you better be glad that didn't break nothing, Missy, Gay Jake yelled from behind me. A few minutes later, Milo came up to my room, where I'd sequestered myself after stamping out of the kitchen. He knocked on the door a few times before cautiously opening it and easing his way in, probably expecting me to throw something at him. Uh, if it makes you feel any better, I'm not too thrilled about it either, but at least you might be able to figure out what happened to you when I... Sorry. He stopped himself when he saw me get agitated, remembering that it was half his fault I ended up like this. After thinking for a second, I just flopped back in the bed and said, I just want to sleep in my own room, in my apartment with my stuff, and not have to worry about anything. Whoa. Holy shit. Jesus, what? Milo cried out at my sudden outburst. I just realized something. That vampire skank said something that Lita was the reason they had to move their lab out into the woods. Where we ran into those two guys and you had to save us, I explained as Leslie walked in. Hey, what's going on? That bitch Lita caused all this, I screamed into her face as I jumped off the bed, re-explaining my realization. Well, wait, then... Wouldn't it be that Hab guy's fault for making her the weapon to do it with? She asked. What? No. Oh, right. Uh, we never actually told you that we ended up being sent somewhere else. The guy we were supposed to see was trying to leave when we got there and... I stopped as the memory of that man sent an icy chill down my spine. And, um, yeah, he sent us to Hab. But before we left, me and Tegan found something. Oh, shit, did we find something. I said, running over to the bag I still hadn't got around to unpacking and rifling around for the flash drive. Look at this, I shouted, pushing Jerry's journal into Milo and Leslie's faces. We never checked to see what was on it, I added, pulling out my laptop and opening the screen. Once it started up, I went to push the flash drive in, but as soon as I did, the goddamn battery died. Oh, Jasmine, Jasmine! What? She yelled back from downstairs. Where's my stupid laptop charger? Wherever you left it. Oh, you two, help me find the charger. I ordered Milo and Leslie. But after about 30 minutes of looking, we actually forgot why we were looking for it when Tegan and Gay Jake got into a drinking contest that resulted in a broken lamp and an impromptu strip tease from Gay Jake. Yeah, none of us were very happy about it either. So, um, 
What are you two going to do now? I asked Milo and Tegan in Gay Jake's driveway the next day. Well, Gay Jake said we can stay here for a few more days if we want before we head back home. Milo answered. He enjoys the company. Okay then. I'll kind of miss you guys, I guess. I said, giving him and Tegan hugs before getting into the car with Jasmine. Trey and Leslie had already left earlier that morning to their own homes, and I was anxious to get back to mine too. Well, see you around. Then Milo took out his phone, unlocked it, pointed at me and said, No, you won't. Then flashed the son of a bitch thing in my eyes. Oh God, was the Men in Black reference really worth blinding me? I yelled. <laughs> totally. Well, I'll try and miss you, I told him, rubbing my eyes as we pulled out. Bye, Tegan, I shouted, leaning out the window. I'll definitely miss you most of all. Well, I guess Stephen's still at work, I said when we opened the door to my apartment and all the lights were off. It felt almost weird to be back there, especially with the place being so dark and quiet after everything we'd been through at Gay Jake's. You want me to stay for a while? Jasmine asked. Nah, it's okay. You probably have things you need to take care of back at your place, I told her, opening the door to my bedroom and tossing my bag inside. Then I looked around and realized that the last time I was here was the night Milo had randomly shown up out of nowhere. Tink, 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 tink. Well, I ended up with custody of the tripod. Oh, hey, Jasmine, do me a favor, I said to her, looking down at the thing. I have a feeling that take the little guy with you, at least just for tonight. It made me feel better. Why? she asked now looking down at it herself as it scuttled around the small bedroom. Because you don't have whatever I have, I told her, grabbing it mid-scuttle and handing it to her. You keep her safe, understand? I said to it. A few minutes later, Jasmine had left, and I was finally alone in the apartment. A couple of days later, as I laid on my bed gazing up at the ceiling, I'd finally started to feel like things were actually settling down for real when I heard the front door open as Stephen walked in. Oh, hey, you're finally back. Where were you? My words were cut short by a loud pop and a sharp pain in my chest. Hey, what, what was the... I tried to say as my vision faded away. I woke up with a splitting headache and my hands bound behind my back. The next thing I noticed was I was sitting in a chair... Panicking, I looked around the apartment trying to figure out what was happening. Stephen, what the actual fuck? I screamed. Jesus, I forgot how loud you are, he said, jamming a sock into my mouth mid yell. I started to gag when I realized by the crusty texture what kind of sock it was, but I couldn't spit it out no matter how hard I tried. Ah, she should be here soon, so I guess I have time to fill in some blanks for you. Short answer. They made me a deal. I sell you out. They give me eternal youth and immortality. And, well, I kind of hate you, so it wasn't really a hard decision. Now don't look at me like that. You can't think that you aren't one of the most unbearable people on earth. With your stupid movie references and your shitty thrift store clothes and your I was pimped out as a minor by my adult girlfriend sob story. Boo-hoo. Other people have problems, too. You're loud and mean and selfish. And you always get your way and you wouldn't go out with... Well, just fuck you. He shouted in my face after stopping himself. Well, uh, <clears throat> doesn't matter anyway. The lady's gonna be here before too long. She gave me this tranquilizer gun and a bunch of cuffs and said to make sure you're alive when she gets it. He explained as he tossed the gun on the couch. That's four sets of real handcuffs, he said, when he noticed me trying to break free. Well, by then he was standing between the window and me when it started to slide open and a figure crawled through. Mm, sounds like she's here, Stephen said with a crooked smirk. But it disappeared when he saw my look of terror switch to a muffled, ear-to-ear -ear smile. What the fuck are you so happy about? 
he tried to ask as he turned to see the seven foot tall monster rise off the floor to tower over him. The Margaret lady's horrified head in its hand like a ghoulish basketball. Oh, my God, Stephen wheezed as Milo loomed over his lanky, trembling frame, a vicious snarl running across his snout. Then suddenly Milo reached out and wrapped his other hand around Stephen's neck before he even had time to scream and began to squeeze until his body went limp. Once Stephen was out cold, Milo leaned down and used one of his claws to scratch the floorboards. I had a feeling too. Well, there goes the deposit, I thought to myself before remembering what was in my mouth and began to panic mumbling violently and desperately trying to get Milo to get it out before he did anything else. Oh God, handcuffs now. Now, now. I need to get up, I'm about to fucking... Oh, too late. I tried to warn him before I threw up all over the floor in front of me, my hands still fastened to the chair behind my back. Water, 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 please. I pleaded to him. So he dropped the severed head on the floor and awkwardly fumbled through the cabinets for a cup, his claws accidentally knocking things around, making it even harder for him. But finally he got some water in one of the larger cups and ran it back over to me in the chair before attempting to carefully pour it into my mouth. Oh, thanks, I told him after, swishing it around for a few seconds and spitting it out onto the pukey floor. That was almost the grossest thing that's ever happened to me. I said through my heavy breathing. Can you help me out of these without tearing my arms off? I asked him, rattling the chains of the cups. Then he walked behind me and, after looking for a few seconds, carefully reached down and slowly broke each chain apart one by one until my hands were loose. Thank you, I yelled at him as I jumped out of the chair, running across the room and punting the still conscious vampire woman's head into the far wall as hard as I could. Fucking bitch. I screamed as my foot made contact with her temple, launching her across the room. Damn, I think I just broke my toe. I groaned as I limped into my room to get my mace. Hey, uh, I just had a thought. I said on my way back out, mace in hand. Why the hell didn't we just get Hep to make you and Tegan some kind of claw attachments or something and just let you two have at it? I asked him. He just shrugged, reaching out to grab the mace from me. But when he touched the end with the oracle sum on it, the thick, black fur started to fall off his hand near where he touched it. As soon as he noticed, he snatched his hand away, letting the hair slowly return and fill the fresh bald spot. Whoa, so this stuff like neutralizes supernatural powers or something, I thought out loud. But Milo just shrugged again. Okay, so now what? I asked unceremoniously whacking the severed head like a rotten watermelon. Then my phone started to ring. Oh, you okay? Trey barked from the other end, causing my ear to ring. Yeah, Jesus, why? Joanna just tried to kill me in my apartment, he shouted again. What? Well, I guess that kind of makes a little sense. Stephen just... <laughs> Never mind, everything's going to shit. Have you heard from anyone else? I asked him. Nah, I called you right after I knocked Joanna's crazy ass out. I figured they'd probably be coming at you more than anyone else. Oh, please don't say that word right now. I begged him as I felt a wave of heat wash across my face. What? Why not? Oh, never mind. Well, you were right, but Milo's here with me right now. Big Milo, so I'm probably pretty safe. So we need to call everyone else and check on... Hold on. Uh, Jasmine's calling. Hello? There's a fucking vampire nailed to my wall. She screamed as soon as I answered the call. Well, slow down. What? I asked her over a freak out. One of those things just burst into my bedroom. And then that tripod thingy came out of nowhere and pinned it to the wall by its head. It's not very happy about it though, she explained. Um, different words, please. What are you talking about? She asked. Nothing. I'll try to explain later, but you probably won't kiss me again for a while, so... Anyway, 
Get your vampire knife and jab it in its heart or its head really deep. And that should do it, I instructed. You want me to kill it? She yelped. Yes, sweetie. That's why you have a vampire killing knife in the first place. Head or heart? I said before switching back to Trey. Jasmine got one too, but it seems to be mostly handled. I'll call Gay Jake. You call Leslie and see if she's okay. I told him before hanging up and calling Gay Jake. He didn't answer. I yelled into the phone at Trey as I tore down the road in Stephen's car. Milo awkwardly folded into the back seat. Oh God, oh God, oh God. I chanted to myself as my heart pounded into my chest, thinking about what I might find at his house when I got there. Milo, what the hell am I looking at? I asked as we sat in the car at the end of the driveway. The lights illuminated the scene in front of us. After a few seconds, I was pretty sure we were looking at Gay Jake, sitting crisscross on the pavement of his driveway, eating a bowl of what I assumed was SpaghettiOs next to his Wrangler that was parked on top of a violently struggling vampire's body. Hmm. Vampire. Got it. Jake said through a mouthful of SpaghettiOs, pointing at the chaos with his spoon. Fucker came running up on me as I was taking the trash out. Please, not that word, I mumbled, almost dry heaving. Oh, looks like Milo got to you in time, he said, seeing him clumsily wiggling himself out to the back of the car. Tegan's probably at Leslie's place, keeping an eye on her by now. You knew? I asked him, trying to sort out what was going on. Well, yeah, and oh, and honey, you should have seen those two before they changed. They looked like sweaty Eric Carpens. I couldn't breathe, I was laughing so hard. He giggled as I heard Milo growling from over my shoulder in frustration. God, every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in. I mumbled to myself thinking about how we hadn't even been away for three days before we were already back at Gay Jake's house. Well, Milo said he figured out they might try to wait a few days and let you think that they really were going to let everything slide like they said that they were, then get you when you'd had your guard down. He didn't see the double betrayal coming, though, he explained. Oh, God. Other word, I gagged. Oh, sweetie... He didn't. Oh, that's just awful, Gay Jake said after I explained why my stomach was turning flips. Are you okay? I kind of wish he just killed me, I said, a hint of nausea in my voice. Got his ass in the trunk, though. Me and Milo handcuffed his junk to his ankle with an extra set of cuffs we found in his car before we closed the trunk, so kind of curious to see how that's going for him right now. That sounds like something you'd do. We heard Joanna's voice yell out as Trey pushed her out of his car, her hands taped together. Oh, you can totally eat her if you want to. I whispered to Milo before she got any closer. Our secret, I added, causing him to make that wheezing laugh sound again. What are we supposed to do with those two anyway? Gay Jake asked. How's your appetite? I whispered up to Milo again. Then, after thinking for a few seconds, I had an idea. Pulling out the knife Hep gave me, I walked over to the trapped vampire struggling under Gay Jake's car. On my way, I could hear Leslie pull up with a wolfed-out Tegan in the back. Then I took the knife and stuck it deep into the vampire's neck. Hey, Teague, do me a favor and pop the trunk of the car and make sure Stephen doesn't hop away. So she lumbered over to Stephen's car and as soon as I heard her claws rake across the metal and hit the latch, it was followed by a confused, Aru? And she tilted her head, trying to figure out what she was looking at. Oh, um, can you uncuff his junk for me and bring him over here? And Milo, drag Joanna's ass over here, please, I told him, which they both happily complied with. Once they were both together, I wiggled the knife around a few more times before sliding it out to the thing's neck. What are you doing? Stephen and Joanna both asked nervously as I walked towards them. But I didn't say anything. I stabbed Stephen in the leg first, leaving it there for a second as I gave it a few twists. Then I ran the edge across Joanna's face, 
stood back and waited for the show to start. What was that for? She screamed at me, trying to rub the gash on her neck. Well, I just gave you two what you wanted. Get ready. That shit's going to burn like holy hell in about two minutes. I told them as I wiped the blade off on Stephen's shirt before retrieving my mace from the car. Oh, what the... Joanna hissed when the pain started to hit, and Stephen wasn't far behind. Turns out the whole process takes a pretty long, agonizing time to end. After about an hour of watching them roll around on the ground, they finally settled down and went quiet. Good news. You both got exactly what you wanted. Bad news. Sunrise is in about 30 minutes. Better get moving if you don't want a hell of a tan. Or, uh, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, I told them as they came to their senses. Don't you think that was a bit mi- Jasmine started to ask, but the look I gave her said it was nowhere near enough, so she didn't finish the question. Why did you do that? She asked instead. If they don't find cover, they both get toasted, which makes me happy. If they try to come back and try to fuck with us again, we still have weapons that can kill them, and since they'll melt away after a few days when they die, we won't have to worry about the bodies if we do have to kill them, I explained. Well, that actually makes sense in a messed up kind of way, I guess, she conceded. So, who's hungry? Gay Jake said to break the awkward silence. So, at this point, I want you guys to think back to when I mentioned that something else happened way back earlier in this story. This, I guess you could say, is where all that really begins. Well, kind of. You might call this the end of the werewolves or assholes arc. There's still so much story to tell. Because the thing about the paranormal world is, once you're in it, you're pretty much in it, period. The normal world where you don't see werewolves regrowing fingers or vampires trying to suck your face off or crazy autonomous metal things running everywhere, it starts to seem like the dream. You start to ask yourself how things can be so normal for so many people. Then you realize it's just that your normal has changed. You go to work, you pay your bills, you look people in the eye. Then you unplug from the Matrix and go back to reality, where you find out that a werewolf ate your last Pop-Tart. And if you don't drink a literal gallon of liquid human in the next few hours, you're going to flip your shit and eat someone. Well, anyway, I'm about to take you along for the ride as I manage to fall out of the frying pan and into the fire that is the world of the paranormal. Turns out dumbass werewolves and crackhouse vampires were only the beginning of this adventure of ours. So, join me now, won't you? Uh, there we were, sitting at Gage Egg's kitchen table again, with two massive werewolf heads peeking up over the table as we ate a post-vampire fighting breakfast. Ah, oh, shit, I shouted, suddenly jumping up from the table and grabbing my mace. What is it? Leslie shrieked. That vampire still flapping around under Jake's car, I answered, jogging out the back door to bop the partially sizzling monster. What the hell is this? I asked as I walked back inside and found a piece of paper waiting for me on the table. Well, me and Trey had an idea, Leslie said when I picked it up and started to read it. All from an hard private detective agency, I asked. We were just thinking about starting a business, you know, for like helping people with paranormal stuff that they might not be able to go to others for help. I mean, what if there was something like this to help us? She explained. And the name is, um... Yeah, an angel reference. Yeah, she interrupted. I know it's supposed to be wolf, ram, and heart. But, you know, well, copyright. Okay, but I'm just saying we don't know shit about shit about being detectives, I argued. Come on, just one case. We'll see how it goes. Her and Trey both begged. About two days after posting the flyers, we got the first case and it didn't go well. Like, at all. Little girl got accidentally turned into a vampire, but get this. It was the vampire that hired us to find her. And there were two other little hooligan kids that were hiding her and it was just a massive clusterfuck. Uh, it's apparently not bad enough to shut the whole idea down. 
but more on that later. First, we have a trip to California to cover because it's too insane not to mention. Are you going to be okay with just these two? Gay Jake asked as I got into the car with Milo and Tegan. You know how they can get. Yeah, I think so. I'd invite Jasmine, but she still has her job after all this somehow, I answered. So Gomez and Morticia over here will have to do. Okay, well, be careful. You still don't know quite what y'all are getting into, he cautioned. I'll just make sure Trey and Leslie don't screw anything up with the business before I get back. I told him, before we backed out of the driveway and headed for this hotel place. But before we got very far, my phone started to ring. Who is this? Tegan asked when she saw the look on my face when I answered. But I didn't have time to answer her. Leader's back and she's never been so pissed. Gay Jake bellowed into the speaker before I heard the phone being snatched away. What the hell did you do? Leader screamed. There's only a few vampires left. You had two, not one, two freaking werewolves on your side and a literal arsenal of weapons specifically for killing vampires. God, how did you fuck this up so bad? What the fuck is this shit I'm hearing about a vampire girl? No, sir, I whimpered as I ended the call and threw my phone into the back seat. Hey, step on it, please, I asked Tegan, an image of a furious liter barreling down the road at us, dancing in my mind. Go, 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 go much faster. Hey, a voice called out over the jingling bell as we all walked into the building. So, uh, first time at Worst Hotel, I take it. The man with the New York accent from the phone asked us. No, uh, we were actually here a few days ago for something. We're not staying long, I don't think, I answered cautiously. Mm, not long at all, he said back, flipping something hidden behind the counter. You just turn around and walk back out the way you came. You'll be good to go. <sighs> what are you... Oh, check it out, it's California outside now. Milo shouted as he opened the door and peeked out. How the fuck? I mumbled, looking for myself. Okay, well, thanks, I guess. Hey, wait, Amanda, hey, Amanda! I shouted excitedly when I saw the vampire girl we found walking down one of the halls. Oh my god, it's you! She shouted back, running up to meet me. What are you doing here? She asked. We're actually going to see a guy who might be able to figure out what's happening to me, I explained. Travis told us that he might be interested in taking a look at these two since werewolves are so rare. And it might help to have a comparison between me, a vampire, and a werewolf, I added. Oh, okay then. Well, I have to go. I have a class in the library and I'm already late, she said as she hugged me and took off back down the hall. I guess the stupid detective agency isn't such a horrible idea. I thought to myself as she disappeared round the corner. Well, let's go, I guess, I told Milo and Tegan as I pushed them through the door and into California. So, how are we supposing to get to this place? Tegan asked once we were outside. Well, I don't know. <laughs> hey guys, over here, another familiar voice called out from a few yards away. Cherise, what the hell are you doing here? I asked, shocked to run into her right off the bat. Look, I know Travis. Me and his brother work for the same company. Look, long story. Anyway, he called in and asked for a favor. Just so happens I know exactly what you're trying to get to, so hop in, she told us. Wow. Most hotel sure knows how to apologize, I said under my breath as Cherise drove us to our destination once again. So, uh, you said you know where we're going. Who are we going to see? I asked. You mean you don't know? But, nah, -uh, I answered. Oh boy, this is going to be so great. She chirped to herself before going completely silent for the rest of the trip, which made us all a little suspicious. What the hell is this? I asked as we rode up to a gigantic mansion at the end of a long driveway. No, oh, seriously, start talking. I thought we'd be going to a lab of some kind, not something out of a 1930s horror movie. Well, there's a lab in there. Whose? Frankenstein's? 
I asked sarcastically. No, not exactly, she answered with a smirk as we walked towards the entrance guarded by two massive shady looking guys with sunglasses. Hey, Jaris, are these the ones? One of them asked in a thick accent that sounded like it was from Russia or Eastern Europe or something, to which she nodded. Okay, go on in. The doctor's in there somewhere, but we don't know where. You'll have to find him yourself, the other one added. Hey, Teague, Milo whispered after the doors closed behind us. Was there accents? Uh, Romanian, yes, she answered before he could finish. As she spoke, we passed by a room with one of those ridiculously long tables in the middle, and some guy in a red jacket sitting at the far end. This is getting a little weird. I spoke to Charisse's back as she led us along. This way, he's probably in the lounge. That's where I hear he usually hangs out. She diverted as she opened the door to a room at the end of the hall. Ah, oh, hey, there you are, she said after she stuck her head inside and looked around. Come on, guys, he's in here. We all filed in to see a kind of lanky man in ratty clothes with old school sideburns and an old timey hat on the table next to him. Once we were all in, he stood up and walked over, much more energetically than someone who looked like they hadn't slept in several days would be expected to. Then I felt my knees almost buckle as he reached out to shake my hand and introduce himself. Dr. Jekyll, at your service. My next memory is of my trying to find a chair to sit in as the world swirled around me. The sound of Cherise's cackling laughter sounded like I was hearing it while my head was underwater. You're... We're in Dr. Jekyll's house, I croaked as he led us down the stairs into the laboratory. Uh, well, no, it ain't exactly mine. Or at all, but... If you had that much trouble hearing my name, you might want to save that little revelation for until you got yourself back together a bit, he answered in his thick, cockney British accent. Can you just tell me then? Milo asked curiously. So Jekyll leaned down and whispered something into Milo's ear so I couldn't hear. Oh shit, he's here now? Where? Milo suddenly started shouting before bolting full speed back up the stairs. After a few seconds, we started hearing her repeating, He's in here? No. Here, no. Slamming doors as he ran from room to room, trying to find someone. So, uh, I'm supposing we go ahead and take some samples now, shall we? He asked, leading us into the actual lab. All right, just park it right over there, love, he said, pointing to a pretty modern-looking doctor's chair. Uh, it's worth mentioning that I ain't an actual medical doctor, just a PhD, he said as he stuck a syringe into my arm to draw blood. Oh, well, look at that, he said as it filled up. What is it? I asked as he walked over to the counter and put some of it on a piece of glass under a microscope. Right, come here, bird, and take a look at this first, he said, taking another sample out of a locked cabinet and sliding it under the scope. This is vampire blood. It's all gross yellow with a hint of red, I answered. No, look through the scope, you twat. Oh, okay. What am I looking at? I asked. Whoa, never mind. Yeah, now you see these particular kinds of vampire all got something to do with this metallic stuff. It's like a virus, but ain't. Like a parasite, but isn't, he explained. Wait, kinds of vampires, I asked. Oh yeah, there's different varieties. You'll see what I mean momentarily, he said with a chuckle, followed by Milo suddenly shouting from upstairs. Oh my god, it's really you. What the hell's going on up there, I asked myself, looking up at the ceiling of the lab. But anyway... Metallic stuff, you say? Right. Look here, this metal settles inside the cells. These right here is muscle tissue. Now a normal one ought to look like this. And these little line-looking things. Yeah, that's what makes the muscles contract. Now the vampire cells. Well, look close, he told me. So I looked into the scope one more time. 
Looks like the metal stuff replaced them, I said. Ah, right you are. Ah, it gets even more interesting when you look at the mitochondria. They, uh... All of a sudden, my brain shifted into autopilot as my vision glazed over and my mouth started to move on its own. Well, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It spilled from my lips in a monotone voice before I could even stop myself. What the bloody hell? What's that? Dr. Jekyll said with a mild look of alarm and concern. I'm, um... I'm not really sure, I answered, shaking myself out of it. Anyway, mitochondria, he said. If you look at where they ought to be, he added, directing me back to the microscope. Hmm. Looks kind of like there aren't any, I told him. Right, they ain't there. The metal's performing several different functions that the organelles normally would. Now, watch this, he said, grabbing a small brass-looking utensil. Now, let's just dial back the magnification a wee bit. He mumbled to himself before tapping the glass. As soon as the utensil touched the sample, they began to decay almost instantly. What was that? I asked him, looking up from the lens. Horicalcum, he said, holding up the tool. That's almost like gallium and aluminium, but not quite. Once it makes contact, the whole system breaks down in a chain reaction. Oh, that reminds me. It might be a little much, but... Might I ask you for a few samples, my dear? He asked Tegan. A little blood and muscle tissue before and after the transformation should do. I am um, guessing that's okay, she answered. Ah, oh, outstanding. Now, before that, where was I? Ah, oh, right, yeah, your sample, he thought out loud, looking back at me. Here we are, he added, sliding my blood sample under the microscope. Tell me what you see. Well, it's, um, kind of the same, but... Oh, I see. It's just the mitochondria that got replaced, I said. Right, I'm willing to bet if we look at some of your muscle tissue, we'll see some reinforcement, but not enough restructuring to support the extra strength and heal from the stress, he explained. Also, I'm going to need some of that muscle of yours, too. Once he was done taking all his samples, we left the lab and went back upstairs, where things had gone suspiciously quiet. And so we both tried to find Milo while Charisse was still downstairs talking to <laughs> Dr. Jekyll. As we were wandering aimlessly, we rounded a corner and almost ran into a girl about our age with long white hair. Oh, sorry, we almost took you out. I apologized to her. It's okay. I was totally spacing out. You must be friends with that weird guy who's following my dad around like a puppy, she said with a laugh through a soft accent that sounded like Tegan might if her English was less broken. I have a girlfriend, I randomly shouted when I noticed how gorgeous she was. Um, okay. I have a boyfriend, she responded awkwardly. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, weird guy? About yay high, dark hair, dresses like a bootleg pirate. I ask. Yes, that's him, she answered. I think they're in the dining hall right now, she added, pointing back the opposite way. I think my dad is about to lose his shit, so you better hurry, she told us as she strode away with another laugh and a small hop in a step before, well, vanishing into a wall. Well, I'm just going to pretend I didn't see that, I said to Tegan as she turned to look at me in confusion. Let's just go and find Milo before the owner crucifies him or something. We headed the direction the white-haired girl had sent us, until we found the dining room, which had Milo standing next to the table in front of a man who was impatiently running his fingers through his slick black hair. Hey, there you are, he squealed when he saw us round the corner. You're not going to believe who this guy is. Please, I beg of you, do something with this man before I lose my sanity. The man begged in the same accent as Tegan and the other girl as he turned his head to look at us. I already knew who I was looking at before Milo said anything else, but I couldn't make myself speak through the panicked realization. It's fucking Dracula, guys, he said in excitement. Dracula lives in California, and we're in his house. I just stood there, motionless, 
trying to process everything since I'd walked into the house. Werewolves are real, I can handle that. Vampires real, that I can deal with. Little autonomous metal tripods, why not? Dr. Jekyll's a real person who's still alive somehow. Oh, getting a little crazy, but okay. Hot chicks with snow white hair walking through the walls. Maybe I'm going crazy, but let's give them that one too. But Dracula? <sighs> Things had just gone about too far with this one. Please, I have not suffered a headache for 200 years until today. I beg you to help me, he pleaded us again. He has not been silent since he located me. <sighs> oh, right. Milo, leave the man alone for a while, you little goddamn sociopath. I yelled at him grabbing him by the arm and leading him back into the hall. But, but questions, he tried to argue as he made an attempt to slip past me. Well, guess who the other guy is, he added, pointing to the man at the far end of the table wearing a red silk robe of some kind. I don't care. Now, settle the hell down, I scolded. You're going to get us thrown out, stupid, or worse, I said, looking over my shoulder at the distressed Count, who was rubbing his head again. This situation just went from like a 2 to a 10. I need you to calm the fuck down so we don't die. Oh, don't worry about the Count. He's harmless. Well, most of the time, Jekyll said from behind us. Oh, shit me, I yelped, nearly jumping out of my shoes. Did you just call him, him, harmless? Well, yeah, if he ain't got no reason to do you any kind of harm. And he answered with a laugh. Okay, well, maybe except for a few isolated incidents with his daughter's boyfriend. I think he still ain't recovered from the daddy fiasco. Oh, what a show that was, he said to himself, almost cracking up as he thought about it. Anyways, it's going to be a bit before I can look into everything, so you ought to be able to settle in here whilst you wait. Where are you going? I asked as he started to stroll out of the front door. Oh, uh, right, yeah. I've got a community service thing. Teaching some science stuff to the general public. Biology things, mostly. Oh, did you know there's people that think evolution ain't a thing in this day and age? He asked, pausing before shutting the door. Yeah, I live in uh, Tennessee. Like, half the people there don't think it's real. Oh, dear, you poor girl, he said with a look of concern on his face. Oh, maybe this ain't such a waste of my time after all, he added as the door clicked shut. Then I turned to find Milo hopping in place, practically squealing with joy as his eyes darted up and down the mansion, taking it all in. Then, Dracula finally stood up and spoke to the man at the other end of the table. James, I apologize for asking on your first visit in so long, but could you, uh, perhaps... He trailed off, pointing a slender finger at the giddy werewolf bouncing beside me. Of course, Count. Think nothing of it. The man in the red robe answered as he stood, his left hand tucked in his pocket. Boy, you and your lady friends there, follow me if you please, he added, waving us along with his other hand as he joined us in the hallway. As he walked by, I could finally tell how tall he really was, and he was tall his long black hair and curly moustache adding to his outlandish appearance. Hey, uh, who'd you say he was again? I started to ask Milo, but was interrupted when the man spoke again. I imagine you all must be famished. I don't think there's anything too substantial in the kitchen right now, however. He trailed off, pulling a smartphone out of his robe's pocket. Somehow it just didn't feel right watching him use it. Count, Count, I'm ordering some food for our guests. I'm using your account. That old hag still says I don't qualify as paranormal enough to make my own. Ah, oh, the pedantic old witch. Yes, uh, this is fine, thank you, the Count very softly shouted back. Just please uh, do not yell. Oh, right, the man said, poking at the screen. Uh, what sounds good to you all? He asked after a few seconds. 
After discussing for a few minutes, we decided on what we wanted to eat and told him. Apparently that time, Charisse had found us and said she was heading upstairs to take a nap. Well, apparently she was going to be staying there with us until it was time to bring us back to the hotel. I felt kind of bad that she was going through so much trouble for us, but she explained that she actually lived and worked in another part of California, pretty far away from where we were, so it wouldn't make sense for her to leave and then come all the way back. About an hour later, there was a knock at the front door and the tall man got up to answer it. We could hear a little conversation as he retrieved the food. Ah, oh, hey, I uh, didn't know you were back in town. A voice that sounded weirdly similar to the Travis guy from the hotel. Would you like to come in for a minute? The man asked. Nah, I got a billion runs to make. Tonight is just crazy for some reason, so I gotta take off. The voice from outside told him. Oh, here you go, everyone, the tall man exclaimed as he brought the food into the kitchen. Is your, um, your hand metal? I asked, finally getting a good look at his left one. Um, what's that? Oh, right, right. Yeah, silver, he answered, looking down at it. And then Milo whispered into my ear who he was. But I'm not going to say it. You can't make me. I refuse. I just sat there, angrily eating my food in an attempt to repress the absurdity of what I'd just heard. Hey, uh, what crawled up your ass? Milo asked as I crammed several fries into my mouth. What is in her ass? She's going to be okay, yes? Do we need to go to hospital? Tegan asked him, making me giggle against my will. Oh, it's just an expression, sweetie, he groaned, trying to explain right before a white-haired head popped up in the middle of the kitchen table. Jeez, oh, Christ, what the hell? I shrieked as the girl from earlier was practically nose-to-nose -nose with me. Hello again, she chirped, walking through the table and perching herself in a chair beside me while I made an effort to recover from the mild cardiac episode she'd just given me. How the hell do you do that? Milo asked, poking at her shoulder to see if she was solid. Hmm, she said with a shrug. My dad's really good at instantly traveling long distances. And I'm really good at this, she explained, passing her hand through my drink cup as she rested her chin in the other one. Your dad's... Dracula? I asked sheepishly. Uh-huh. One and the same, she replied, giving her hand a few more passes through my drink. Don't, I barked at Milo, jamming my finger in his face as soon as I noticed him getting ready to interrogate the poor girl's ear off. So, um, when do you think the doctor will be back? I asked her. Oh, is he still doing that science thing? She asked in response. Well, that's what he said before he left, I told her. What did he do to get community service anyway? I added. He was goofing around with some chemicals upstairs. An old berry blowtorch blew himself out the window and onto the neighbor's Pomeranian, she said. <laughs> Isn't the closest neighbor to here like 200 yards away? I coughed. Yeah, it was amazing. You should have seen it. He skipped like a stone like three times before he made it to Snuffles, she chuckled. That's actually why we moved his lab into the basement in the first place. Okay, so I guess my next question should probably be, why the hell does the Dr. Jekyll live with the Dracula and his daughter? Uh, daughters, she corrected me, holding up three fingers before a sad look washed over her face and she curled one down, leaving only two. Oh, uh, me and my sister, she said. And it's actually a really sad story. He, uh, she started to explain, but as she did, Jekyll swung the front door open with a crash. Oh, bloody Christ. This can't be done with soon enough, he complained as he crashed his way inside from just out of sight. Oh, shit. It gets like this every time, the silver-handed man said through a mouthful of an arby sandwich. Well, I'll leave you to it, he whispered, sliding his chair out from the table, gathering the remaining sandwich and curly fries up and sneaking down a hall at the opposite end of the kitchen. A few seconds later, Jekyll pokes his head around the corner and started to say something to us before pausing. Hey, everyone... Oh, 
I know you're here, he suddenly shouted into the hall. You're the only one here who eats that roast beef abomination. Well, I reckon we ain't going to be seeing him for a while, a cagey ape. Right, going to be heading down to the lab and get things cracking, he declared, rubbing his hands together and backing out of the room. God, he's really excited about this, the white-haired girl suddenly said. He's always wanted to examine a werewolf. You just never see them. They're so rare. He knows about everything you can think of about most other paranormal things. But pretty much nothing about werewolves, she explained. I forget that so few of us in the world, Deegan spoke up. What? Can I ask you things about him and Dracula, please? Milo suddenly erupted out of nowhere. Uh, sure, she answered nervously. Uh, okay, then. Well, I guess I'm going to go down and see Jekka while he <laughs> bothers you into madness, I said, standing from the table. I will come with. I cannot dealing with him when he gets in such a way, Tegan added, standing up with me. So there's really a science to this stuff? I asked Jekyll once we were inside the lab again. Oh, absolutely, he exclaimed, clapping his hands together. Oh, I never found anything I can't explain. But there's a key to it all, you see. There's these things, these particles, they facilitate the four fundamental forces of the universe. Force carriers, yeah, I know, like bosons, gluons, photons, right? All oh, right, you are, clever little bird. I discovered several more types, though. Call them scions, skinetons, and materions. And the scions facilitate thought interacting with other material, not part of the brain's body. Skinetons are what make things move, and what can make something seem much stronger than it ought to rightfully be. Materions, oh, there are several types of those. Some that are responsible for making a specific substance much more durable and resilient than normally possible and the others are responsible for the seemingly spontaneous creation and annihilation of matter. Our materians are a lot rarer than the first two, though. Thought the second time might have been antimatter when I first observed them, he explained passionately. Well, that's the simple version, at least. So, um, anything paranormal has something to do with these particles? Right on the nose, he answered. I'm getting ready to start snooping through Tegan's transformed DNA right now, Got a suspicion I'm going to turn up something exciting there, he hummed, messing around with some really expensive-looking equipment. But how did you afford all this? I asked him, and he tinkered. Those two blokes upstairs. Got a lot of faith in me and my work. No telling where I'd be if it weren't for the Count. <laughs> Great fellow he is. Don't deserve the bad press, he said. This is just insane, all of it, I mumbled to myself. Do you think you'll be able to figure out what's wrong with me? I asked. Wrong with you? How dare you? He shouted, jumping out of his chair. There ain't nothing right or wrong to do with it. It's a rare and unique event in science. Yeah, but I've been trying to eat people and stuff. I'm really strong, but it wears me out so bad I'm useless for a long time afterward. And these, I yelled, pointing my fingernails up in front of his face, trying to make a point. But it didn't work. Ah, oh, look at that there, he shouted, snatching my hand out of the air. These ain't nothing, vampire. These must be from the werewolf DNA. But it's a type of carbon lattice structure composited with the graphic fibre. Oh, that would probably explain the black coloration and the strength to wear resistance ratio, he pondered out loud to himself, scratching at them with a scalpel. Oh, you two seem happy, Tegan said as we walked our way back upstairs to check on the poor girl we'd left with Milo. Yeah, I guess that's the first time in a while I didn't feel like I was some kind of, I don't know, abomination or something, I told her. I like him too. I feel like I know him somehow, though. It is strange, she said. Yeah, this kind of strange, I guess, but not that much, I admitted. He almost reminds me of, uh, Milo, we both said at the same time as we walked around the corner back into the kitchen to find Milo with the white-haired girl's hand in his uh, face. Oh, this is so cool. Oh, look, guys, I don't even feel it, he shouted at us, pointing to his face. Please help me, the girl mouthed silently once she saw us enter the room. Oh, oh yeah. show them the poof thing, 
he instructed her, at which point she just happily said, Okay, and vanished in a puff of black mist, not to return for the rest of the night. Oh, great, you scared her off. <laughs> me? I screamed back. Over the next couple of days, while me and Tegan waited for Jekyll to finish his analysis, we spent some time in hanging out with Charisse. Milo prowled the halls, hoping to happen across one of the occupants who had been actively hiding from him. But one of those days, when we were all back in the mansion together, we found a note addressed to... Milo. Child, if you can behave yourself, I will grant you ten minutes a day to ask me anything you wish. Dracula, the note said. Milo didn't react the way I thought he would. Instead, he squinted his eyes real narrow, leaning in to look closely at the note. Oh, there's no way, he said to himself. But a second later, he snatched the paper off the dining room door and shoved it into my face. A signature. Look, he barked. What about it? It's the same one, he mumbled before running to the room his duffel bag was in. After a few seconds, he was back holding an old yellow book. Look, he said, opening the cover and turning it so I could see. It's the same. Leaning closer, I looked at the signature on the inside of the cover. Dracula was scrawled across it. I thought, uh, oh, my granddad gave this to me years ago. It's his favorite thing in the world, and mine too. First edition of the original Dracula novel. He always said he got it from the real Dracula. I thought he just meant Bella Lugosi or something. But the signature, it's the same one, he said, holding the signed note up next to it with a shaking hand. And then I heard a sniffle. Hey, you okay? I asked once. I noticed him wiping his eyes on his shirt. My granddad knew all about this stuff, he said to himself, taking the note and the book back to the room. You should go with him, I told Tegan. Once she was gone, a familiar voice spoke from behind me. I remember that guy. My dad only ever signed one of those books, the white-haired girl said, gliding through the wall next to me. Look, my name's Destiny, by the way. So you knew Milo's grandfather, I asked her. Uh-huh. He was funny. He gave me my car, she told me, confusing me a little. Car? I asked. You have a car? Yeah, a pink hearse. You have a pink hearse? I said under my breath as she opened the door to the garage. Yep. It's supposed to be for a movie set that got cancelled halfway through pre production. He knew I liked pink things and creepy things, so he brought it over here and gave it to me. The only condition was I had to get my dad to sign that book for his grandson, she explained. Oh. Small world. <laughs> it really is, she exclaimed. Us paranormal types tend to know each other, so when regular people get involved, it seems like we're everywhere. But there's really not as many of us as it can seem sometimes. Well, kind of like the tr troll market, yes, she finished for me. So, um, you're into movies, I asked her. I saw the first movie, she bragged. Well, um, if you get bored or something... You want to pile up with me and Milo and Tegan and watch some movies while we wait on the mad scientist? I asked her. Tegan never knows what's going on, but Milo's the only one who can quote more lines than I can. You and my boyfriend would love each other, she giggled. He's the only person I know who can quote more lines than I can. Too bad he's been so busy lately, or I'd invite him too. So, um, you're in? Sure, she answered. Just let me know she added as she dropped down through the floor, causing a muffled, oh, bloody Christ, I told you to stow it, from Jekyll. But as I started to walk away, her head popped back up through the floor to say, hmm, now that I think of it, that Tegan girl, she seems really familiar to... After that, she vanished again, leaving me alone to think. God, how the hell would Tegan seem familiar? I thought out loud as I wandered through the mansion until I happened across a door with a sign on it that read, Enter at your own risk. Oh, I don't even want to know, I mumbled as I kept walking, rounding a corner and almost running head first into a tall figure. Ca oh, you, sorry, I was distracted, 
I apologized to the towering man who now had his left arm in a sling. Hey, what happened? I asked. Oh, nothing at all, he answered, rolling up his sleeve to show that most of his arm was made from silver. Just hard on the shoulder sometimes, and needs a rest every now and then, he explained. What's on your mind, lass? he asked, taking his other hand and putting it on my back, leading me into the dining room. Everything, I said, waving my hand around. All of this. My brain hasn't stopped feeling like it's about to overheat for weeks. I keep thinking I'm going to wake up from my dream any second, I told him, as he pulled out a chair for me to sit in. I kind of liked the Victorian gentleman vibe that he had. It made me feel, I don't know, like special or important for a second. Well, you may very well be dreaming, he suggested as he sat down across from me. Have you ever heard of solipsism? he asked. No, I don't think so. It's a branch of philosophy, an extreme one, I'll grant you, but it's the notion that the only thing we can truly know exists is our own self, that if we were to make everything up in our mind or be victim to some elaborate illusion, we wouldn't know the difference, he explained. Do you believe that? I asked him. No, of course not. Bunch of bunk, if you ask me. But there's also epistemology, the study of how we know things. Much more noble field, in my humble opinion. But the problem is, uh, knowing anything for certain, having absolute truth, well, that's very difficult indeed. So one of the things you have to assume is that reality is real. Otherwise, you'll lose your mind before long. So, um, you're not a figment of my imagination, I questioned. Well, I don't seem to be, lass, and I doubt you're a figment of mine, he answered with a soft laugh. Now... <laughs> If you'll excuse me, I have a card game to go to, he said, standing from his chair. Oh, poker? I asked. No, no, I had to put a stop to that. The Count has a perfect poker face. Nobody can ever beat him. We learn to play magic instead, he said, pulling a deck box out of his jacket pocket and giving it a shake. You'll still have to watch him, though. Just because I haven't caught him yet doesn't mean he isn't a damn cheat. He added, opening the door with a sign on it and walking inside. Oh, bullshit. I am dreaming, I said to myself after a few seconds. Then I found myself alone in the house again, so I decided to go bother Jekyll in the lab. Oh, you. Here, here, sit. Ah, look at this. I think I might be onto something, he said once he saw me come down the stairs. What's up? I asked nervously. All right. See, this is what I'm thinking. Been comparing Milo's changed DNA to wolf DNA. Love ain't no wolf DNA to it. I, uh, how? I asked, more loudly than I meant to. Well, I got a hypothesis on the matter. See this little rat-looking bastard here? He asked me, flipping through a book. That's about the last common ancestor we modern humans got with wolves. Not the most majestic of creatures, I know, but follow me on this. He kept going, flipping further through the pages. If you go back far enough in our taxonomy, and I do mean far back, then we run into this strange group, he said as he stopped, turned the book to face me. Those is synapsids. I looked through the various images for a minute before he spoke again. Now stand a few of those up on their back legs, throw a little ape into the mix, you tell me what you get. Well, it had looked just like a werewolf, I said quietly, looking at a particularly dramatic artist rendering of one of them snarling at the reader. So then, uh, what are you suggesting? Well, I'm thinking there's something going on that's dialing back parts of their genetics and reactivating lost traits from ancient human ancestry to get them to that shape. There's some scientists right now working on activating a part of human DNA that would let people regrow whole limbs, so this ain't even that strange, all things considered. But if you're a newly scared villager hundreds of years ago, you ain't gonna know no better. It's gonna look like a scary wolfman to them. I think the name's stuck all this time. He kept explaining enthusiastically. Well, um, what about my deal? I asked. Oh, uh, right, yeah, that's a whole other can of worms. Now look here, so... Uh, so, this is a side view of your muscle cells next to Milo's regular muscle cells and her changed muscle cells. And on the other, 
you've got a diagram of vampire muscle cells. Ah, what do you see? He said, pointing at the pictures. It's a... Mm, I wondered out loud as I looked. Come on then, think about it. He encouraged me. I guess mine kind of looked like they're somewhere in the middle, I asked. Right, you are. Now here's where we get a problem. Ain't like hybrid vigor. Uh, the combined properties of your cells ain't quite compatible. Look here at the werewolf cell compared to the vampire one, he instructed. Um, what am I looking for? Look at the lines crisscrossing back and forth through the cells. Remember them from before? Well, these is what let the cells contract and the muscles do the work. Now the vampires is so strong because this metal replaced these filaments. But when these contract, they cause a lot of excess damage to the muscle fibers. So their healing ability's got to pick up the slack and repair the damage. Now, look at the werewolf one, he told me. The filament thing is completely different, I said, as soon as I looked at it. Yeah, exactly. They are about 20 times the filaments as any other poor normal creature, and they connect just as strongly as the surrounding cells, he cooed cheerfully. So, um, that means what? It means that uh, when you get a fully changed werewolf, they're unimaginably strong for their size. Physically speaking, they're damn near perfect, he explained with the same cheerful energy. Now, your issue is that your muscle cells have a familiar filament density as a werewolf, you don't got the metallic filaments the vampires got, and they don't connect to each other as well, and you have a pretty human capacity to heal. You're too strong for your own bloody good, he said bluntly, his tone finally changing. Oh, well, um, I guess that explains a lot, doesn't it? I mumbled grimly. Yeah, love, I'm afraid you ain't exactly superhero material. Ah, oh, here you both are. Tegan suddenly said from behind me. I am thinking you may be down here. Have you finding anything out? Um, yeah, a lot actually, I answered. Ooh, this is a lot of cleavage you got there, I added when I noticed a very open blouse she had changed into, the silver charm on her necklace swinging distractingly low. So, I mean, I like your necklace, I croaked, shaking my head to get my shit together. Oh, you like? She asked, holding it up in front of my face. Yeah, I told her. Jeez, it's still warm, I thought to myself. Yeah, it's like the symbol of Dr. Manhattan's head, I said, once I'd actually taken a closer look at it. I think it's supposed to be a symbol for something. Hey, Dr. Jekyll, do you know what the symbol that's a big dot with another little dot and a ring around it means? I asked him, while he was digging through some things on one of the tables behind me. Yeah, that's a symbol for hydrogen, he said suspiciously. Why? he asked, having apparently not listened to the conversation up to that point. That's on Tegan's necklace, I said over my shoulder, after which there was a loud bang followed by a bunch of junk falling off the table. Necklace, he stuttered. Silver? he asked nervously, walking up to Tegan from behind me. Yeah. Why? I tried to ask, but he went straight past me. How old are you? He asked Tegan, holding the charm close to his face. Early twenties? He added even more nervously, squinting his eyes at her. Yes, this is right. This was a gift from... Your mother, he interrupted her. By then my eyes were as wide as a satellite dish as I began to see where this was leading. They were darting back and forth from one of them to the other, as my jaw slowly hung lower and lower. Holy fuck, this would make the best episode of Mori in history, I whispered to myself. How do you know this? Tegan asked him, but he didn't answer. You're still stronger than normal when you haven't changed, aren't you? Jekyll asked instead. Yes, but how again do you know these things? She asked once more, more desperately this time. Please... Tell me, she added, her voice starting to quiver a little as she spoke. And you've, um, never met your father, he began to ask, but Tegan shouted and stopped him. No, I have never met him. Now, how do you know? Teague, I 
think he's your dad, I interrupted her as tears started to well up in her eyes. Once I said that, she wheeled around and ran back up the stairs, leaving me in the lab. Jekyll and I looking at each other like we'd just seen a ghost or something. What the hell is up with this goddamn place? I asked myself as he slid his back down the wall, running his fingers through his hair. What next? I thought as I heard Tegan's steps as she ran across the floor above us. <sighs> what did you do? Milo scolded me, storming out of the room as I ran after Tegan. Me? I didn't do anything. Why do you just assume I'm always behind it whenever someone's crying? I asked back defensively. Because you're mean. Now you go in there and fix whatever you did. Look, I think we just found out who her dad is, I said, lowering my tone so she couldn't hear me. Wait, what? Did Jekyll do a paternity test or something? He asked. Well, um, not exactly, I mumbled under my breath. What the hell is going on? Jerry asked, whipping around the corner in the hallway. God, you're... A... <laughs> what? What did I miss? I think Jekyll is Tegan's dad, I admitted, watching Milo's eyes widen and jaw drop just like mine did. Therese just had a twisted look of bewilderment on her face as she tried to process what I'd said. Ah, uh, Jekyll. Jekyll? Oh, right, everyone... House meeting, Cherise yelled through the mansion halls. Now. I don't know how to deal with this kind of thing, I whispered to Milo as Cherise stomped her way down towards Jekyll's lab. Yeah, me neither, he responded, looking over his shoulder at Tegan, who now had her head buried in her pillow. Wow, this is so awkward, Destiny leaned over and whispered to me as we all sat in a circle in the lounge watching Charisse pace back and forth like a caged lioness, her prosthetic leg occasionally creaking softly from underneath her shorts as she stepped. So, what do you got to say for yourself? She finally asked Jekyll, who tried to stand before speaking. Well, I... Oh, yeah. Who put you in, Chuck? Set. Ah, oh, yes, Mum. Bloody moody sideborg, he said, dropping back into his seat with a sigh. Well, to start, not exactly dad material, am I? I was just there trying to research the conditions that led to how the Count turned out how he is. I just happened to meet a gypsy woman. We were having fun. But when she told me she was pregnant, I panicked, left the necklace and a note. I think the formula I took that caused my longevity might have had some kind of effect on her. That's why she's so strong without changing. I don't care about the biology, Jackal. Cherry sparked at him. You'd be a deadbeat dad. Why, well, that's not fair, he said, jumping to his feet again. I said sit. Yes, Mum, well, look, I'm a degenerate scientist. What more do you want from me? He asked her. But before anyone could say anything else, Tegan stood up and left the room, leaving us sitting there in an awkward silence. Jesus, you're all useless, Destiny suddenly said, jumping up from her spot next to me. The emotional dexterity of a caterpillar, I swear to God, she complained as she strolled through the wall to follow Tegan. Um, yeah, I'm going to let her take care of it, I said, standing up to leave as well. I'm going to do, well, I don't know, watch a movie or something while you guys just sort your shit out. So, um, guess I'm like your uh, son-in-law, I heard Milo say more happily than he should have as I left the room. I was laying on the bed in the room, I claimed, and I just started watching my movie when I heard the door squeak. I spun around, ready to chew out whoever was at to try and drag me back down into the drama, until I saw who'd opened the door. Oh, hi, uh, Mr. Uh, Count, I choked, jumping up out of bed and, for whatever reason, standing to attention. Calm down, child. I was just seeking a quiet place to lurk for a while. My home has not been so uproarious for some time, he said, waving me back down. What is this film you are watching? he asked, pointing to the screen of my laptop. Oh, um, yeah. it's called Dracula, Dead and Loving It, I answered, my cheeks flushing red in embarrassment. It's a comedy, spoofing the 90s Bram Stoker's Dracula, I think, I explained shyly. Oh, uh, 
ha ha, he laughed, apparently seeing something on the screen he found funny. I like this. Uh, it does not appear as gruesome as some of the other stories bearing my name. May I uh, sit with you for a while? <laughs> you mean you, the actual Dracula, sit and watch a Dracula movie with me? Yeah, absolutely, I answered excitedly as I scooted over on the bed. Who is this man with the white hair? He asked as he sat. Well, oh, that's, um, Leslie Nielsen. He's a comedic guard, I told him. He's one of the funniest people to ever live. Ah, oh, this makes me happy to be portrayed by such a good man, he said as I grabbed my phone to text Jasmine that I was watching a Dracula movie with Dracula. But as I did, the Jerry's Journal flash drive fell out of my bag. Oh, yeah, I still haven't checked this out, I told myself stashing it on the nightstand next to me. Oh, Dracula with Dracula comes first, though. Do you see what you've done? Destiny growled, barging through the door. Poor girl's in there crying her eyes out right now. Why does everyone keep blaming me for this? Oh, shit, I shouted back. I didn't do anything. Oh, hey, is this dead and loving it? I've been trying to get him to watch this for years. How'd you pull that off? She asked me taking a few more steps inside the room. Well, I was just on when he walked in. He likes Leslie Nielsen, I told her, as she sat down on the bed next to us. I think I'm going to stay in here for a while. It's like Baghdad out there right now. I tried to smooth things over, but... Jeez, she said as she scooted into position, her dad too enthralled with the movie to be bothered with anything else. Well, this isn't strange, I thought to myself. This is such a charming motion picture, the Count said, standing from the bed once the credits rolled. Thank you, child. This made me happy, he added, putting his hand on my shoulder before leaving the room, imitating the Dracula character playfully as he left. Once he was gone, I turned towards the unconscious girl sprawled out across my bed. I wonder if that's her natural hair, I thought to myself, as I stared at the pearly white strands flowing from her head. I leaned in to get a closer look, wondering how she got that brilliant sheen. Oh, lucky ass. Probably another perk of being Dracula's damn daughter, I whispered. Then, as I squinted my eyes a few inches away from it, I felt something shift next to me. I slowly turned my head and felt my blood freeze in my veins as my eyes met hers. Blood red and wide in a manic glare, her teeth bared flashing several sets of needle-sharp fangs. You look delicious, she hissed through her twisted smile as I shrieked and fell backwards off the bed. Oh my god, what the fuck? <laughs> I got you good, she murmured, pulling the covers up past her shoulders and rolling over in the bed to face the wall. Why does every single supernatural thing I meet want to scare the hell out of me? I complained as I picked myself up off the floor. Well, I almost fell again as I put my hand on the nightstand to lift myself up. Something slipped, nearly causing me to lose my balance. Yeah, the flash drive, I thought, picking it up and walking back over to the laptop. Time to finally solve this mystery, I said to myself, wiggling it into the port. Once the computer had scanned it, I opened the drive to find several video thumbnails, five of them and four plain old Word documents. I clicked on one of the documents first, hoping it would contextualize the videos. It looked like a diary of some kind. Uh, I guess this really is a journal after all, I thought as I started to read it. Turns out the man's name was Jerome. These were just a few specific entries selected out of many others. Something about the guy receiving a gift from his neighbor who's not known for being especially generous. He seemed really happy about it since the guy made it himself, and the things he makes are really, really expensive. Then I thought back to where exactly we found the flash drive, in the man's driveway. The one who was originally supposed to make our weapons for us. Hmm, is that the guy he's talking about? The scary one, I said softly, turning to look over my shoulder as destiny shifted again. Weird that I'm sitting in Dracula's house and he never gave me so much as a single willy, but that guy just speaking to me almost made me cry. I thought, realizing there was probably more to that man than I'd originally figured. A chill running down my back as I remembered his piercing blue eyes glaring down at me in his driveway. 
Once I'd read the first Word document, I clicked on the first video. My eyes widened when I realized the videos looked like they were made with cameras hidden in the man's home. It looked like they'd already been cut and edited together as well. The first one started with the man, I assumed to be Jerome, reading some kind of letter beside an open box. Once he was done with the letter, he reached into it and pulled something out, like a sword or something. It was almost solid black, except for something gold-looking near the handle. It was really weird-looking, the blade all bent in the shape of an S. I almost didn't like looking at it for very long, but there was something wrong with it. But that did confirm my suspicion that it was the guy who we were supposed to get our weapons from. After a few minutes of nothing happening, I hit fast forward for a while, until the camera switched to a shot of a garage, noticing he had a wife, a son and a young daughter along the way. A few seconds later, the Jerome guy walked into the dark room, holding the sword from earlier, and proceeded just to sit there with it for literally hours. Okay, this is getting weird, I said under my breath. Hmm, what's weird? Destiny asked with a yawn as she sat up in the bed and crawled towards me to peek over my shoulder. What are you watching, huh? This thing me and Tegan found in some creepy guy's yard, I answered. I'm just now looking at what's on it. Ooh, invading privacy. You may have my attention, she said, sitting down beside me. So once she was in place, I examined the situation up to that point before I hit play again. Then we sat and watched the Jerome guy for the rest of the video. Once it ended, we read the next Word document, which was a lot different than the first one. He kept talking about having extremely dark, invasive thoughts, and that he felt sick all day, which got even worse once he was home. That pattern repeated until the fourth video, which is where things started to take a grim turn. This time, when he went into the garage, the guy just started slicing his leg open over and over again. By the time blood started pooling at his feet, he got up and walked out. Then the camera switched to the bedroom, where the man's wife was sleeping. Oh no, Destiny gasped as we watched him standing there, more blood flowing from his leg and onto the carpet. He isn't going to... She trailed off, though. I didn't say anything. I was frozen in place, hoping nothing else would happen. I breathed a sigh of relief when nothing did. And then I remembered there was one more video. I don't think I can watch this one, Destiny said as I placed the cursor over the thumbnail. Oh, you can leave if you want. I told her, my hand shaking as I summoned up the will to click the play button. But she didn't leave, so I hit play and the video started. It started at night in the bedroom again as Jerome suddenly woke up and got out of bed. Then he immediately went straight for his office in the sword. He wasn't moving around like in the other videos though. Everything was a lot faster and more deliberate. Once he left the office, he went directly to the teenage son's room Without warning, he raised the sword and swung it down into his son's face. Oh my god! We both gasped, covering our mouth in shock, still watching as he proceeded to chop him into pieces. No, no, I said, realizing the worst was likely about to happen, but not being able to look away. Once he was done, he turned and made his way to his own bedroom. That time, he started by chopping his wife's lower legs off, waking her up in the process. He went on to do the same to her as his son, which apparently woke the daughter up. Oh, please, no, I whimpered. What? Destiny asked tearfully, having already covered her eyes with her hands. It's the little girl, I said with a quivering voice, as the girl walked into frame and the deranged Jerome noticed her. Destiny had just barely peeked through her fingers as the two separate halves of the daughter hit the floor. Vomit had already begun to spew through my fingers, trying to hold it in as I ran to the bathroom. Guys, guys, shut up and get up here. Something's come up, something bad. I heard Destiny call to everyone, bringing the racket in the house to a dead stop as I heaved into the toilet. Well, the two of us waited outside the room while everyone else watched the video. Therese was the first to walk out in a state not much better than I was. I don't feel good, she said to us, her chin doing that quivering thing it does when you're trying not to throw up, making me start to think I just have a weak stomach or something. <sighs> me neither, I told her, resting my back against the wall. 
I guess supernatural science camp's over her, I asked. Yeah, probably. She'll probably take this to the guys at the hotel, Cherise suggested. Jekyll said he noticed something weird in the video. What? Yeah, that thing had horror calcium on it. None of it, Dr. Jekyll said as he left the room, wiping sweat off his forehead with a handkerchief. How could you tell? Destiny asked. Uh, you see the static interference whenever that thing was on camera? The metal has a property that causes localized static when it's recorded, he explained, pulling out his phone and the small gold-colored tool from his lab. Right, watch this, he said, turning the phone's camera on so we could see the screen. Then he held the tool in front of it, and when he did, the area around the tool really did have a grainy static all around it. Yeah, the sword had the camera going crazy from much farther away, means it had to be about 20 to 30 times as much as in your vampire weapons. That's almost as much as those blokes at the hotel have in those fancy bars they carry around with them. So, um, that means... It ought not be your problem. You should take this drive to them and let them handle it. Their metal, their guy, their problem, he told us. But you're right. I've got all I need to keep running tests. You lot don't need to stay around here. You've dealt with it enough lately. Plus, they got a whole army of people that can throw hands like you can't imagine. Yeah, they can take care of it without you holding their hand. Before long, we were all back down in the lounge, but everyone was silent. Until the Count woke up. How do such troubles always find their way to my home? He complained. Oh, misery loves company, Dad. The woman I hadn't seen yet said as she walked into the lounge with us. What trouble now? Uh, she cheats her cards as bad as you do, Count. The tall man said, walking in behind her. What's all this? he asked, seeing the grim expressions on all around the room. And so we explained the situation to him, got him up to speed. But I wasn't expecting his reaction to be so passionate. But once he heard the location of the man we thought to be the culprit, he became enraged. I cannot sit by, not under the circumstances, he roared. I always knew that bastard was up to something foul. Good God, man, why not? Jekyll asked. Ain't even been a year yet since you retired and you're already trying to dig up the hatchet. For heaven's sake, why when you ought to be playing cards and spending time with the missus? Yeah, I'm kind of wondering why too, I added. Because this is an extremely personal matter, he said, turning in my direction as he towered over me. My name is Captain James Cravenock, and the man you met, the one behind all of this, his name is Ash Cravenock, my older brother. To be continued, Well, my dear friends, there you have it. It's been a long time coming. My extreme apologies for that. It's just one of those that's so good. I just thought again to myself, by the time this is over, there'll be nothing left to read and I'll feel really sad. And I just kept postponing and postponing, but no more. There it is. To be continued, well, if you want it to be, please let the author know. I'll pass on the messages to him. This is definitely not over yet from the sound of it, but that's the end of this huge mega story. Anyway, <laughs> Finally, I've done it. Finally, finally, finally. Okay, so back again soon. Exhausted after this one. Till the next time, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well... If you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.